Section 17 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2 by Charles F. Horne. Section 17 Tecumseh by James A. Green. It would be a difficult matter for a well read American to recall the names of more than four or five notable Indians, leaving, of course, contemporaneous red men out of the question. The list might comprise Pocahontas, best known probably for something she did not do, Pohatan, that vague and shadowy Virginian chief. King Philip, who had a war named after him and so succeeded in having his name embalmed in history. Pontiac, whose great conspiracy Parkman has made immortal. And Tecumseh. But of them all, Tecumseh is easily foremost. He was a man who, had he been born to great position among civilised nations, would have stamped his name and fame upon the world. He was not a mere savage of the ordinary type, bloodthirsty, brutal beyond description, going upon one aimless raid after another to glut his passion for rapine and murder. These savage traits were not his, though all the good qualities of the Indian he possessed in double measure. He was fearless, he was untiring, and when once started toward an end, he knew no rest until he had accomplished his design. He had a primitive dignity of thought and expression that marked him as a great orator. At the famous council at Vincennes, when Tecumseh had finished his speech and was about to sit down with his braves, the interpreter, pointing to General W. H. Harrison, said, Your father wishes you to take a chair. But the ordinary courtesy of calling the white governor the father of the red men was repugnant to Tecumseh, and with lofty mien and unpremeditated eloquence, he declined the proffered seat. No, he exclaimed, the sun is my father, the earth is my mother, and I will rest on her bosom. And he sat down on Mother Earth with his assembled warriors this act and fiery speech more than ever binding them to his fortunes. Tecumseh was in reality the first of the great Ohio men. He was a Shawnee Indian, and his tribe in the middle of the 18th century had emigrated from Florida to what is now the state of Ohio, Tecumseh being born in what is now Clark County, near the present city of Springfield, in an Indian town bore the name of Piquet. This must not be confounded with the present Ohio town of Piquet, which is in another county altogether, the birthplace of Tecumseh now being the site of a straggling village bearing the name West Boston. In his boyhood there was nothing unusual. He grew up in the stirring times when Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton and the other hardy Kentucky pioneers, Long Knives the Indians called them, were leading their forces into the West. It was a time when the Indians were constantly fighting. They did not live in Kentucky, but they regarded the fertile woods and prairies south of the Ohio River as their hunting grounds, and they attacked with savage cruelty all the whites that dared to encroach upon this territory. The whites, in turn, crossed the Ohio in reprisal, burnt the Indian towns, tomahawked women and children, destroyed cornfields, and were as unrelenting and barbarous in their revenge as their savage foes. Tecumseh was born about 1776, and in 1780 the village of Pique was attacked by a party of 1,000 Kentuckians, who, after a fierce battle, drove out the Indians and destroyed the place. It was amid such scenes that the Indian boy grew to manhood. In that wild time, war was the only science and butchery the only trade that an Indian could follow. 
One of the favourite Indian pursuits of the day was the capture of parties of emigrants and traders who came floating down the Ohio in canoes or broadhorns. For miles the Indians would secretly follow such a party and then, when their opportunity came, would strike their deadly blow. When a boy of 17, Tecumseh was in a party making an attack on some boats near the present site of Maysville, Kentucky. The boats were captured and all the people in them slaughtered on the spot except one person, who was spared and later burnt alive. The horror of the spectacle so impressed Tecumseh that he and then and there said he would never again be guilty of such cruelty. And the vigorous manner in which he protested against it so moved his companions that they agreed with him to not repeat the act. This resolution to come say never altered. Time and time again he protected women and children from his infuriated followers. At the Battle of Fort Meigs, a party of Americans was captured by the British and Indians. Though they had surrendered as prisoners of war, yet the savages were firing into them promiscuously or selecting such as those to tomahawk in cold blood. This dreadful scene was interrupted by Tecumseh, who came spurring up and springing from his horse to the ground, dashed aside two Indians who were about to murder an American, threatening to slay anyone who would dare to injure another prisoner. Turning to the British general, Proctor, he asked why such a massacre had been permitted. Sir, said Proctor, your Indians cannot be commanded. Be gone, was the angry reply of the outrage to come say. You are unfit to command. Go, put on petticoats. This was only one incident of many showing how far he was above the ordinary Indian in magnanimity of character. At the already mentioned Vincennes conference, Tecumseh agreed with General William Henry Harrison, his unrelenting foe, and who judged him as harshly as any of the frontiersmen who feared and hated him, that in case of any outbreak of hostilities, the women and children on both sides were to be protected and respected. Certain it is that General Harrison would have made no such agreement had he not believed that his adversary would keep it. Tecumseh defends the whites at Fort Meigs. To understand the life and work of Tecumseh, it is necessary to look into the history of his times. His career was embraced between the period of the Revolution and our Second War with Great Britain. The destiny of the Great West was not then assured. Ohio and Kentucky were frontier states vastly farther from the seat of government than is the most remote of our western outposts today. They could be reached only by a toilsome journey over the Alleghenies and a trip down the Ohio. A journey today to the Yellowstone or to the regions beyond the Black Hills does not mean in the way of time, danger or adventure one-tenth what a journey to Fort Washington, Cincinnati meant in 1800. Indiana was a territory, and the territorial governor, first of the Northwest and then of Indiana, was William Henry Harrison, a born fighter, a palaverer, and who, in the difficult position which he occupied in dealing with unruly settlers on the one hand and turbulent Indians on the other hand, displayed singular tact and ability. He was eminently the right man in the right place. But in spite of the claims the United States made of the West, the country was but little known, nor was its real importance even suspected. That the Mississippi Valley would one day be peopled by millions and be the greatest, wealthiest and most productive part of the country was not thought of even by the most sanguine of Americans. The eastern states in those days had affairs enough of their own on hand, and the western frontier was not regarded as essentially important. The national idea, the nation with a big N, as recent humorous newspaper writers have put it, had not been evolved. It was difficult for even a man of the persuasive powers of General Harrison to induce the general government to furnish half enough troops to adequately guard the outposts. If there was serious work to do, the settlers had to do it themselves. 
There was little grumbling over this state of affairs, however, as the Kentuckians and Westerners generally had been brought up to do their own fighting and not to wait for the government at Washington to do it for them. In those days, British agents were actively at work among the Northern Indians to keep them in a state of disaffection toward the United States. Meanwhile, the Indians were in the midst of the great tragedy that has been enacted since the days of Columbus. They were the victims of traders who sold them firewater and for poor and cheap weapons demanded furs whose value was out of all proportion to that given in return. Many of their women married white renegades who corrupted the morals of the tribes. They were being dispossessed of the finest homes and best hunting grounds in America, for the buffalo was then found in Kentucky in great herds and their position was thoroughly unhappy. They had then, and happily this is not wholly the case at present, no rights that a white man was bound to respect. But the Indians were still many and the settlers were few. To a great leader, who of course could not take into account the mighty force behind the Anglo-Saxon ranks that first marched over the Alleghenies, it would still seem practical to band the red men together in a vast confederation and drive the invaders back again beyond the Ohio and the mountains. This was Tecumseh's splendid plan. This was the design to which he devoted his life and which he pursued with such ardour and genius as to do what an Indian had never before accomplished. Pontiac, it is true, at the siege of Detroit, gathered a number of tribes under his leadership, but he never dreamed of a continental confederacy, as did Tecumseh. In this vast design, he was materially aided by his brother, best known by the name of the Prophet, who, while lacking in judgment, was nonetheless a man of extraordinary force of character. He proclaimed that he had received power from the Great Spirit to confound the enemies of the Indians, stay the march of disease and death, and that he was the Messiah to lead his people to new and greater things. But as conditions to success, the Indians must stop drinking firewater. They must cease intermarrying with the whites or trading with them, and they must hold all things as the property of all. They must return to their original dress and manners and forget that they had ever seen or known the pale faces. The fame and influence of the prophet spread with almost miraculous rapidity and young men and warriors came from afar in crowds to receive inspiration from him. Tecumseh, with rare ability, turned this influence to advance his own plans and, of course, this constant stream of visitors to his brother enabled the chief to spread his racial idea far and wide. One of the things that Tecumseh maintained was that the Indians held their land in common, that no one tribe owned this or that territory, but that the Great Spirit had given it equally to all. This, he said at the Conference of Vincennes, but General Harnison ridiculed the idea and stated that if the Great Spirit had intended to make one nation of the Indians, he would not have put different languages into their heads, but would have taught them all to speak alike. Tecumseh bitterly replied that no one tribe had the right to give away what was the joint property of all, and not until the United States agreed to cease purchasing lands from the Indians and restored the lands recently bought would peace be possible. Pointing to the moon that had risen on the council, Governor Harrison said that the moon would sooner fall to earth and the United States would give up anything fairly acquired. Then, said Tecumseh, I suppose that you and I will have to fight it out. But these councils ended in nothing except a manly and impressive statement by Tecumseh of his position and a strong and terribly just indictment of the whites for their treatment of the Indians. Tecumseh was constantly on the move, now on the lakes, now on the Wabash, then on the Mississippi or the plains to the westward, then on the Ohio or the hills that rolled to the south from it. Everywhere the Indians received him graciously. But an accident destroyed his plans and one defeat dashed his confederation to pieces. 
During his absence, Governor Harrison, alarmed at the gathering of warriors at the Prophet's town of Tipi Canoe on the Wabash River in Indiana, marched against it. There was no necessity for a battle. It might easily have been avoided. Toward the close of day, the Americans reached Tipi Canoe. The Indians disclaimed any hostile ideas and it was settled that the terms of peace were to be arranged the next day. That night, however, the Indians treacherously attacked the Americans. The conflict was fierce and bloody. The Indian braves were animated by the promises of the Prophet, who declared that they would be victorious and that he had rendered the bullets of the white men of no avail. During the battle, he stood on a neighbouring hill and chanted a war song to further fill his warriors with courage and enthusiasm. But though the red men fought gallantly, they were doomed to defeat. They were scattered up and down the Wabash, their town was burnt, and the power of the Western Indians was, by this one blow, shattered. So complete was the victory, and so far reaching in its effects, that General Harrison at once became the popular idol, and the glorification of the Battle of Tippecanoe a generation later carried him into the presidential chair. It was this battle that gave the West to the Whites. As for Tecumseh, he returned suddenly from the West to find that despite his commands, the Prophet had permitted a battle. In his rage and disappointment, he took his brother, now fallen and disgraced, by the hair and shook him. But no longer was it possible to hold his tribes together. The victory of the United States at Tippecanoe took the ardour for battle and resistance quite out of them. There were hundreds of them, however, who in the War of 1812, which broke out immediately, followed Tecumseh into the British service, in which he was commissioned as a Major General. In that service, he was doomed to continued disaster. The English commander, General Proctor, was incompetent and in all the qualities of real manhood, the inferior of his savage ally. After the Battle of Pushing Bay on Lake Erie, he started to retreat. Tecumseh protested and was induced to go on only by the promise that winter supplies would be delivered a few miles up the Thames. It was on this stream that Proctor finally determined to make a stand. But at the outset of the action, he, coward-like, retreated with his redcoats, leaving the Indians to bear the brunt of the battle. Tecumseh had gone into the fight saying that he would be killed, and his prediction was verified. But how he died, no one can say with certainty. No less than four Americans claim the honour of having killed him. Among the slain, in that time of fierce pursuit and confusion, his body was not even identified. But there it was, on the banks of that quiet Canadian stream, some 35 miles from Detroit, that the greatest Indian in statecraft, diplomacy, devotion to his people, and indignity of thought and intellectual gifts, found his unmarked grave. No one yet has written a biography of him that does full justice to his great abilities and lofty character. But his name is the most familiar of all Indian names, and he is the only Indian after whom Western fathers and mothers have ever named their sons. The late General of the United States Army, William Tecumseh Sherman, bore his name, as have hundreds of other boys born in Ohio, Kentucky, and the great states that roll westward from them. End of section 17 Read by Julie Jackson, Staffordshire, England, 1st of June, 2021. Section 18 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. 
horn. James Lawrence, 1781 to 1813. Captain James Lawrence was one of that band of chivalrous spirits who, concentrating all their life in the work, with insufficient means, in the face of powerful enemies, raised our infant navy in an instant, as it were, to an honored rank in the world. The force and energy of the free national development were felt in the spontaneous movement that placed so many ardent, courageous spirits at the service of the country. These men, Barry, Barney, Decatur, Bainbridge, Perry, Summers, and the rest, the list is a long one, were volunteers in the cause, fighting more for glory than for pay. Such spirits were not to be hired. Theirs was no mercenary service. It was limited by no prudential considerations. They went forth singly or united, the commissioned champions of the nation, with their lives in their hands, ready to sacrifice themselves in that cause. Punctilious on all points of honor, they sought but one reward, victory. There was but one thing for them to do, to conquer, and, failing that, to die. Of these fiery-souled heroes who carried their country in their hearts, the men of courtesy and courage, of equal humanity and bravery, true sons of chivalry, Lawrence will ever be ranked among the noblest. He was born October 1, 1781, at Burlington, on the banks of the Delaware in New Jersey. His father, John Lawrence, was an eminent counselor at law at that place. The death of his mother, shortly after his birth, threw the change of the child upon his elder sisters, by whom he was tenderly cared for. His disposition answered to this gentle culture. The boy was dutiful and affectionate, amiable in disposition, and agreeable in manners. Such a soil is peculiarly favorable to the growth of the manly virtues where nature has assisted by her generous physical gifts. The bravest men have often been the gentlest. It is the union of the two conditions which, as in Sir Philip Sidney, makes the perfect warrior. Young Lawrence early showed a liking for the sea, and would have led a life on the waters from the age of twelve, had not his father firmly turned his attention to books and education. It was his intention to prepare him for his own profession, the law, and his desire that he should enjoy the usual preparatory finished education. This was, however, prevented by his pecuniary misfortunes, and the youth passed from his primary school at once to the law office of his brother, John Lawrence, then residing at Woodbury. He spent two years in this situation, between thirteen and fifteen, or thereabout, vainly endeavoring to reconcile his humors to the onerous duties of the unwelcome position. The death of his father left him, in a measure, free to follow his own inclinations, and his brother, perceiving his strong bent for the sea, placed him under the care of a Mr. Griscom at Burlington to study navigation, evidently with a view to enter the naval service of the country, for we find him, after a brief three months' instruction, in possession of a midshipman's warrant. This was dated September 4, 1798, the year when Congress seriously directed its attention to the protection of our commerce, then so wantonly pillaged by the two great belligerents of Europe, by the creation of a distinct navy department, and the enlargement of our naval force. The movement was specially directed to the French aggressions on the Atlantic and in the Mediterranean. Indeed, in all but the name, War existed with France. It was called a quasi-war. Lawrence's first service was a cruise to the West Indies in the Ganges, a 24-gun ship then commanded by Captain Tingey. He showed in this and other voyages such aptitude for his duties that he was made an acting lieutenant by his commander previous to his receiving his commission from government. In 1802, he was appointed first lieutenant in the Enterprise of 12 guns, one of the fleet of Commodore Morris, sent to the Mediterranean to prosecute the war with Tripoli. He particularly distinguished himself in that service by his adventures with Lieutenant David Porter of the New York in an attack in open day on certain coasters or feluccas laden with wheat which took refuge in Old Tripoli, where they were defended by a land force. The attack was made in boats at close quarters under a heavy fire of the enemy. Lawrence had a second opportunity of distinguishing himself in this war 
in an action likely to be better remembered by the public, the glorious adventure of Decatur, in the destruction of the wrecked and captured Philadelphia in the harbor of Tripoli in February 1804. Lawrence was the first lieutenant of that officer in this brilliant adventure, and shared its full dangers and glories. Lawrence was also engaged in the Enterprise, in Preble's bombardment of Tripoli the same year. He returned in the winter to the United States with that Commodore in the John Adams. In the following spring of 1805, Lawrence successfully carried across the Atlantic one of the fleet of gunboats, number six, of which he was commander, destined for service in the Mediterranean. It was a small vessel mounting two guns, not at all adapted for ocean navigation. The voyage was looked upon as a marvel. When near the western islands, Mr. Cooper, in his naval history, tells he fell in with the British frigate Lapwing, 28, Captain Upton, which ran for him, under the impression that the gunboat was some wrecked mariners on a raft, there being a great show of canvas and apparently no hull. After the war with Tripoli was ended, Lawrence returned to the United States, and in the interval, when the war with England, after the affair with the Leopard and Chesapeake, was daily becoming more imminent, we find him, in 1808, appointed first lieutenant of the Constitution. About the same time, he married Miss Montedever, the daughter of a respectable merchant of New York. He was on duty in the Vixen, Wasp, and Argus, and, at the commencement of the War of 1812, was promoted to the command of the Hornet. While in this last vessel, he sailed with Bainbridge, who had the flagship Constitution, on a cruise along the coast of South America, and, having occasion to look in at the port of San Salvador, found there the British sloop of war Bon Citoyen, of 18 guns, ready to sail for England with a large amount of specie. Lawrence, whose ship mounted an equal number of guns, was exceedingly anxious to engage with this vessel. He sent a challenge to its commander, Captain Green, through the American consul, inviting him to come out and pledging his honor that neither the Constitution nor any other American vessel should interfere, which Commodore Bainbridge seconded by promising to be out of the way or at least non-combatant. The English captain, however, declined. It was an unhappy precedent which Lawrence thus established, injurious to the service and destined to act fatally against himself in the end, when from the challenger he became the challenged. The Constitution, meanwhile, sailed away to close the year with her brilliant engagement with the Java, leaving the Hornet engaged in the blockade of the Bon Situan. Eighteen days since the departure of the flagship had passed, while her consort was thus engaged, waiting till her expected prize should issue from the harbor, when the Hornet was robbed of her chances on victory by the arrival of His Majesty's 74, the Montague. Escape now became the policy of Lawrence, who luckily managed to get from the harbor in safety and turned his course to the northward along the coast. While cruising in this direction, after capturing a small English brig, he fell in with, on February 24, 1813, off the mouth of the Demera, two brigs of war, with one of which, the Peacock, Captain Peak, he speedily became engaged. The American vessel on this occasion had somewhat the advantage in armament, in the words of Lawrence's dispatch, which gives a modest and forcible account of the affair, after mentioning his attempt to get at the first vessel, he discovered at anchor off the bar, he says, at half past three p.m., I discovered another sail on my weather quarter, edging down for us. At twenty minutes past four, she hoisted English colors, at which time we discovered her to be a large man-of-war brig, beat to quarters and cleared ship for action, kept close by the wind, in order, if possible, to get the weather gauge. At ten minutes past five, finding I could weather the enemy, I hoisted American colors and tacked. At twenty minutes past five, in passing each other, exchanged broadsides within half pistol shot. Observing the enemy in the act of wearing, I bore up, received his starboard broadside, ran him close on board on the starboard quarter, and kept up such a heavy and well-directed fire that in less than fifteen minutes be surrendered, being literally cut to pieces and hoisted an ensign union down from his forerigging as a signal of distress. The hull of the peacock was so riddled that she sank, while every exertion was made by her captors to save her 
by throwing over her guns and stopping the shot holes. Nine of her crew went down with her, and three of the Hornet's men. Captain Peake was found dead on board. The loss of the Hornet was trifling compared with that of her adversary, but one man killed and four wounded or injured, one of whom afterward died. This superiority is attributed by Cooper, who sums up the testimony to the superior gunnery and rapid handling of the Hornet. This victory brought Lawrence a harvest of honors, public and private. Before he sailed, he had felt called upon to protest to the Secretary of the Navy against what he thought an injustice done him in the promotion of a younger officer to a captaincy, while he remained simply lieutenant commander. He now found that the promotion had been conferred upon him in his absence, and was offered the command of the Constitution. He would have been pleased to sail in this vessel, but, much to his annoyance, immediately after receiving the appointment, was ordered to the Chesapeake, then lying at Boston. Captain Lawrence took the command of the Chesapeake at Boston toward the end of May 1813. The Shannon frigate, Captain Broke, a superior vessel of the British Navy, had been for some time off the port, and her commander, assured of his strength, was desirous of a conflict. You will feel it as a compliment, he wrote, if I say that the result of our meeting may be the most grateful service I can render to my country, and I doubt not that you, equally confident of success, will feel convinced that it is only by triumphs in equal combats that your little navy can now hope to console your country for the loss of that trade it can no longer protect. It would be complimenting the valor of Lawrence at the expense of his judgment if we were to pronounce him ardent for the fight with the circumstances under which it took place. In fact, as Mr. Cooper states, he went into the engagement with strong reluctance on account of the undisciplined state of his crew to whom he was personally unknown. The challenging vessel, on the contrary, carried a picked crew with every advantage of discipline and equipment. The presumption, of course, is that he was fully prepared. The armament of the two vessels was about equal, mounting 49 guns each. At noon then, on June 1st, Lawrence weighed anchor and left his station in the bay to proceed to sea with a southwesterly breeze. The Shannon was in sight, and the two ships stood off the shore till about half past four in the afternoon when the Chesapeake fired a gun, which was the signal for a series of maneuvers, bringing the vessels within range of each other about a quarter before six. The Shannon hove to, and the Chesapeake bore down toward her. It was Lawrence's intention to bring his ship fairly alongside of the enemy for a full discharge of his battery. He consequently first received the enemy's fire from the cabin guns, as, the wind having freshened, his ship came up to measure her length with her antagonist, which lay with her head to the southeast. Then the Chesapeake poured in her full fire, inflicting considerable damage, which was repeated in the successive discharges for several minutes. In this commencement of the action, it was considered that the Shannon received most injury, particularly in her hull. Unhappily, the Chesapeake in turn lost the command of her sails. The ship was consequently brought up into the wind and fell aboard of the enemy, with her mizzen rigging foul of the Shannon's forechains. This accident exposed the Chesapeake to a raking fire, which swept her deck, and, as she was already deprived of the services of the officers who had fallen in the first discharges, her guns in turn were deserted by the men. Captain Lawrence had already received a wound in the leg. His first lieutenant, Ludlow, was wounded. The sailing master was killed, and other important officers were mortally wounded. As the ships became entangled, Lawrence gave orders to summon the boarders, who were ready below, but unhappily, the negro whose duty it was to call them up by his bugle was too much frightened to sound a note. A verbal message was sent, and before it could be executed, Lawrence was a second time struck, receiving a grape shot in his body. The deck was thus left with no officer above the rank of a midshipman. The men of the Shannon now poured in and gained possession of the vessel. As Lawrence was borne below, mortally wounded, his dying thoughts were of his command, uttering his order not to strike the flag of his ship or some equivalent expression, which is handed down in the popular phrase, don't give up the ship. He lingered and died of his wounds on board on June 6th. The Chesapeake was carried into Halifax 
and there the remains of our gallant captain were borne from the frigate with military honors, with every mark of respect which a generous enemy could pay to a fallen hero. End of section 18. Section 19 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Stephen Decatur. By Edward S. Ellis, A.M., 1779-1820. Stephen Decatur was born on the eastern shore of Maryland, Worcester County, January 5, 1779. The family was of French extraction in the paternal line and of Irish on the maternal side. The grandfather was a native of La Rochelle in France and married a lady of Newport, Rhode Island, where Stephen, the son of the Commodore, was born. When a very young man, he removed to Philadelphia and married the daughter of an Irish gentleman named Pine. Decatur was bred to the sea and commanded a merchantman out of the port of Philadelphia until appointed to the sloop of war Delaware. Upon the completion of the frigate Philadelphia, the command of it was given to him. The elder Decatur had one daughter and three sons. The daughter was twice married, her first husband having been killed in a duel. The sons were Stephen, James, and John P., all of whom grew to manhood. The boys were educated at the old Philadelphia Academy in 4th Street. Admiral Charles Stewart attended the same school and was an intimate friend of Decatur through life. Many of the incidents of this sketch were received by the writer from Stewart, who fully appreciated the manliness, courage, and nobility of the sailor, now accepted as the foremost type of heroes and founders of the American Navy. Decatur was a born fighter, said Stewart. I never knew a boy so found of about as he. I sat near him at school and have known weeks to pass without a single day in which he did not arrange a contest with one of the boys. We generally adjourned to the Quaker burying ground opposite and had it out among the tombs. Decatur despised meanness of every description and rarely was beaten in a fight. When only 15, he half killed a partially intoxicated man who insulted his mother and refused to apologize. He never knew when he was whipped. He would hang on like a bulldog. I was a few months older than he, but we were appointed midshipmen in the same year, 1798. Our intimacy was never broken by the slightest incident. Upon entering the Navy in March of the year named, Decatur joined the frigate United States under the command of Commodore Barry, who had obtained the warrant for him. He served with Barry until promoted to a lieutenancy. The United States needed repairs, and not wishing to stay in port, Decatur applied for orders to join the brig Norfolk, then bound to the Spanish Main. After one cruise, he returned again to port and resumed his station on the United States, where he stayed until the naval troubles with France terminated. He was next ordered to the Essex and sailed with Commodore Dale's squadron to the Mediterranean. Returning home once more, he was appointed to the New York, one of the second squadron under the command of Commodore Morris. When he again came back, he was ordered to command the Argus, to proceed with her to join Commodore Preble's squadron in the Mediterranean, and on his arrival there, to reassign the Argus to Lieutenant Hull and take charge of the schooner Enterprise, then commanded by that officer. The exchange being made, Decatur sailed to Syracuse, where the squadron was to rendezvous. There he learned of the disaster to the Philadelphia, that frigate, as the reader will recall, ran aground while blockading Tripoli, with which country we were at war, and was captured by the Turks. Commodore Bainbridge and his crew of more than 300, among whom were Porter, Jones, and Biddle, were made prisoners and immured in a gloomy dungeon. Decatur quickly formed a plan for capturing or destroying the frigate. Preble, to whom the proposal was submitted, refused at first to give his consent, but his impetuous lieutenant won him over and was allowed to lead the expedition. Decatur selected the catch Intrepid, which he had captured a few weeks before, and manned her with 70 volunteers, chiefly his own crew. 
He sailed from Syracuse February 3, 1804, accompanied by the United States brig Siren. Lieutenant Stewart, who was to aid with his boats and to receive the crew of the catch, should it be found expedient to use her as a fire ship. The weather was so tempestuous that it required 15 days to reach the harbor of Tripoli. It was arranged by Decatur and Stewart that the catch would enter the harbor about 10 o'clock that night, attended by the boats of the Siren. A change of wind threw the siren six or eight miles away from the Intrepid, and, fearing to wait for the boats, Decatur decided to adventure alone into the harbor, which he did about eight o'clock. The Philadelphia lay within one-half gunshot of the Brashaw's castle and of the principal battery. Two of the enemy cruisers were only a couple of cable lengths away from the starboard quarter, and their gunboats were within one-half gunshot of the starboard bow. All of the guns of the frigate were mounted and loaded. Although it was only three miles from the entrance of the harbor to the frigate, the wind was so light that the Intrepid did not get within hail until 11 o'clock. At the distance of 200 yards, the frigate hailed the catch and ordered her to anchor under the threat of being fired into. Decatur's Maltese pilot, by his direction, replied that they had lost their anchor in a gale of wind off the coast and were unable to do as commanded. When within 50 yards, Decatur sent a small boat with a rope to make fast to the frigate's forechains. This was done, and the Americans began warping the catch alongside. Not until that moment did the Tripolitians suspect the character of the Intrepid. They were thrown into confusion, during which the two vessels came together. Decatur was the first to leap aboard, followed immediately by midshipman Charles Morris. A minute passed before their companions could join them, but the Turks were too terrified to sweep the daring officers from the deck, as they might have done in the twinkling of an eye. As soon as Decatur could form a line equal to that of the enemy, the charge was made. Twenty of the Turks were killed, many jumped overboard, and the rest scurried into the main deck, whither they were pursued and driven into the hold. The Americans had hardly gained possession of the frigate when a number of launches were seen hurrying about the harbor. Decatur decided that the best defense could be made by staying on the frigate, and he was prepared to receive their attack. Meanwhile, the enemy had opened fire from the batteries and the castle and from two corsairs lying near. As the launches did not approach, the lieutenant ordered the ship to be set on fire in several places. The flames spread so fast that it was with the utmost difficulty the Americans were able to reach the catch. At that critical moment, a propitious breeze sprang up and carried the Intrepid out of the harbor. She had not lost a man, only four being wounded. For this exploit, Decatur was promoted to the rank of post captain, there being no intermediate grade. The honor was specially gratifying since the promotion was made with the consent of every officer over whose head he was raised. It should be stated that in that time the rank of captain was the highest in the Navy. A commodore was simply the senior officer of a squadron and might be a master, commandant, a lieutenant, or a midshipman. It was decided some weeks later to make an attack on Tripoli. The King of Naples loaned six gunboats and two Lombards to Commodore Preble. These were formed in two divisions, Decatur commanding one and Lieutenant Somers the other. The squadron which sailed from Syracuse included the frigate Constitution, the brig Siren, the schooners Nautilus and Vixen, and the gunboats. Adverse winds deferred the attack for several days. Finally, upon the morning of August 3rd, the weather being favorable, the signal was given from the Commodore's vessel to prepare for action. This signal to open the bombardment was made at 9 o'clock. The gunboats were cast off and advanced in a line ahead, led by Decatur and covered by the frigate Constitution and the brigs and schooners. The enemy's gunboats were moored along the harbor under the batteries and within musket shot. Their sails had been taken from them, and they were ordered to sink rather than abandon their position. They were aided and covered by a brig of 16 and a schooner of 10 guns. Before entering into close action, Decatur went alongside each of the boats and directed them to unship their bowsprits and follow him, as it was his intention to board the enemy's boats. Lieutenant James Decatur commanded one of the boats belonging to Commodore Preble's division, but being farther to the windward than the rest of his division, he joined and took orders from his brother. 
When Captain Decatur in the leading boat came within range of the batteries, they and the gunboats opened fire. He returned it and pushed his way among the boats. At this juncture, Commodore Preble, fearing the results of Decatur's rashness, ordered the signal to be made for retreat. This command brought to light the singular fact that in making out the signals before going into battle, no one had thought of that which ordered a retreat. It was impossible, therefore, to recall the daring Decatur. The enemy's gunboats contained 40 men each and ours the same. Decatur had 27 Americans and 13 Neapolitans. On boarding the enemy, the latter held back, but our countrymen charged eagerly forward. Ten minutes sufficed to clear the deck. Eight of the Turks plunged into the hold. Some fell while fighting, and others leaped into the sea. Only three of the Americans were wounded. As Decatur was about to withdraw with his prize, his brother's boat came under the stern. The men called to him that they had engaged and captured one of the enemy, but her commander, after surrendering, had treacherously shot Lieutenant James Decatur, pushed off while the crew were recovering the body, and was at that moment making all haste for the harbor. Decatur was infuriated on hearing this and resolved that the miscreant should not escape. With his single boat, he pressed with all possible speed within the enemy's line and running aside the offending boat, bounded over the gunwale, followed by 11 Americans, all that were left to him. Then followed the most desperate hand-to-hand fight conceivable, the issue being in doubt for 20 minutes. There have been many accounts of Decatur's exploit on this Tripolitian gunboat, with considerable variation as to the particulars. That which follows is the story as it was told to me by Admiral Stewart, who received it from Decatur himself immediately after the fight. Decatur presented the weapon, called an espatoon, to Stuart, and I naturally examined it with great interest. The handle was of ivory and the blade perhaps eight or ten inches long, being very narrow and curved like a scimitar. It had no edge, was sharply pointed, and evidently made for thrusting. Nothing could stay the fury of Decatur. He immediately identified the commander by his immense size and gorgeous uniform. He eagerly sought out the American, and they instantly came together in the fight to the death. Decatur had a cutlass and the Turk a pike. The latter inflicted a slight wound on Decatur's breast, and in parrying the stroke, his sword broke off at the hilt. Flinging the weapon aside, the American sprang like a tiger at his antagonist. The two fell to the deck, Decatur under and flat on his back. The Turk had the weapon I have described in the front of his sash and attempted to withdraw it to give the finishing thrust. Decatur flung his legs over his back and with one arm held his enemy so tight against his body that he could not force his hand between. In this position, Decatur, with his free arm, drew a pistol from near his hip, reached over the back of the Turk, and fired downward, directly toward himself. It was just like Decatur, said Stuart. The chances were ten to one that the bullet would pass through both their bodies, but luckily it met bone and the huge barbarian rolled off dead. The two were half smothered by others fighting and tumbling over them, and it was with the utmost difficulty that Decatur freed himself from them and rose to his feet. While this fierce struggle was going on, a Turk fought his way forward and aimed a fearful blow at Decatur, who was not aware of his danger. Reuben Jones, an American sailor, so desperately wounded that he could not use his arms, flung himself between them and received the blow on his skull, which was fractured. It is a pleasure to record, however, that the brave fellow finally recovered and lived many years on a pension from his government. Decatur succeeded in withdrawing with both prizes, and the next day was honored with the highest commendation in general orders from Commodore Preble. When the latter was superseded in command of the squadron, he gave the command of the Constitution to Decatur, who had some time before received his commission. From that ship, he was removed to the Congress, returning home on her on the conclusion of peace with Tripoli. Decatur was next employed as superintendent of gunboats and, March 6, 1806, was married to Miss Susan Wheeler of Norfolk, the only child of wealthy and cultured parents. The union was a most happy one, though no children were born to the couple. 
In the month of June 1807, the British frigate Leopard, while cruising off the coast of Virginia, poured several broadsides into the American frigate Chesapeake, commanded by Captain James Barron. England, as it will be remembered, insisted on the, quote, right of search, end quote, and the British Captain Humphreys claimed that the American had several English deserters on board. The Chesapeake had three men killed and 18 wounded, and, being unprepared for action, struck her colors. Captain Barron was court-martialed and sentenced to five years' suspension without pay from the service for what was deemed a cowardly act on his part. Commodore Decatur succeeded him in command of the ship, being transferred to the United States when she was again put in commission. October 25, 1812, in latitude 29 degrees north, longitude 29 degrees 30 minutes west, Decatur fell in with the British ship Macedonian of 49 carriage guns, the odd one shifting. This frigate was the largest of her class, two years old, four months out of dock, and reputed one of the best sailors in the English service. Taking advantage of the wind, the enemy fought at her own distance. The battle lasted one hour and 50 minutes. The United States poured such an incessant fire into the Macedonian that the shouts of her crew were plainly heard. She lost her mizzenmast, fore and main topsails, and main yard, and was much damaged in the hull. Her official list was 36 killed and 48 wounded, that of the Americans being 5 killed and 7 wounded. Decatur could have continued his cruise, but was obliged to accompany his crippled prize into port, where she was equipped as an American frigate. The young officer, as may be supposed, was hailed by the country as its foremost naval hero. Congress and several of the states voted him valuable testimonies for his gallantry. Decatur's Conflict with the Algerine at Tripoli the following year, Decatur attempted to gain the open sea from New York through the Long Island Sound with the Macedonian and Hornet. A British squadron of superior force, however, compelled him to run into the Thames River in Connecticut, and he lay off New London for months, unable to get to sea. He was naturally impatient at being thus cooped up and bitterly complained that traitors on shore, by means of blue lights, warned the enemy whenever at night he prepared to break out of his imprisonment. He sent a challenge to Commander Sir Thomas Hardy of the blockading squadron, offering to fight two of the British frigates with two of his own, but the offer was declined, and Decatur's frigates were afterwards dismantled. Returning to New York, he assumed command of a squadron bound for the East Indies and put to sea in the President. January 14, 1815, through the blunder of his pilot, his ship heavily grounded while going out. The next morning, Decatur discovered the British squadron in pursuit, consisting of the Majestic Razi, the Endymion, Tenedos, and Pomona frigates, and a brig. Of these, the Endymion was the fleetest. After drawing her away from the rest, Decatur turned and attacked her. She was crippled and her battery silenced when the American resumed her flight. By this time, however, the other ships had come up and opened fire. Escape was impossible and Decatur surrendered to the British squadron. Returning to the United States under parole, he was dispatched to the Mediterranean on the conclusion of peace to punish the Algerine pirates that were preying upon our commerce. He did his work thoroughly and well, compelling the day to sign the most humiliating treaty ever made with a Christian nation. He obtained similar redress at Tunis and Tripoli. Decatur was subsequently created Navy Commissioner and made his residence in Washington at Calorama, formerly occupied by Joel Benton. Commodore Barron's suspension began February 8, 1808, he resorted to the merchant service and was abroad when war was declared. His suspension terminated about eight months afterward, sometime after which he reported himself to the Navy Department by letter for duty, the war continuing two years after his becoming available for command. He did not return to the United States until the close of 1818. He declared that he had used every effort to reach home before, during hostilities, but was prevented. 
A court presided over by Captain Charles Stewart afterward declared its judgment that such an effort had not been made by Barron. The latter felt resentful towards Decatur and called him to account for certain expressions he had been told were used by him reflecting upon his conduct as an officer. When appealed to, Decatur, as Navy commissioner, declared that he held no personal enmity towards Barron. He deemed it unjust to others of the Navy that his request to be restored to command should be granted. Barron opened a sharp correspondence with Decatur, which continued nearly a year. Mutual friends, or rather enemies, fanned the trouble between them, which ended in a challenge from Barron, which was promptly accepted by Decatur. The duel took place at Blandensburg on the morning of March 22, 1820. Commodore Bainbridge was Decatur's second, and Captain Jesse D. Elliott served Barron in a similar capacity. Decatur chivalrously surrendered his right to name the distance, which Barron made the shortest possible, eight paces, on account of his defective eyesight. Decatur was without a superior as a pistol shot, and, declaring that he did not wish the life of his antagonist, he said he would only wound him in the hip. At the word two, both fired so exactly together that only one report was heard. Barron was struck in the right hip, as Decatur intended, and sank to the ground. Decatur stood erect a moment and was seen to turn pale, compress his lips, and press his hand against his side. Then he fell, the ball having passed through his abdomen. I am mortally wounded, he said, and wish that it had been in the defense of my country. His attendants helped him to his feet and started slowly towards the waiting carriage. His pain was so great that after a few paces, he sank exhausted near where Baron was stretched on the ground. While the two thus lay near each other, waiting to be carried off, they shook hands and each freely forgave the other. Decatur was lifted into the carriage, which reached Washington at half past ten. He would not allow himself to be carried into his home until his wife and two nieces were sent to the upper floor where they could not see the dreadful sight. Wishing to save the distracted ones from the grief of witnessing his suffering, he refused them permission to enter the room where he lay. The news caused consternation and sorrow in Washington, where no man was more honored and loved than he. He thanked his friends for their sympathy, told them he had not long to live, signing his will. I am a dying man, said he, and only regret that my wound was not received on the quarter deck in the service of my country. When the surgeons proposed to probe for the bullet, he said it was not worthwhile as it had done all the harm it could. He remarked that he did not believe it possible for a person to suffer so much pain and yet live, but not once did he utter a groan. His agony was beyond description and did not cease until half past ten when he died. It seemed as if the whole male population of Washington and the adjacent county were present at the funeral, besides most of the officers of the government, members of Congress, and resident foreign ministers. The National Intelligentsia, in an extra, said, A hero has fallen, Commodore Stephen Decatur, one of the first officers of our Navy, the pride of his country, the gallant and noble-hearted gentleman, is no more. He expired a few minutes ago of the mortal wound received in the duel this morning. Mourn, Columbia, for one of thy brightest stars is set, a sun without fear and without reproach, in the fullness of his fame, in the prime of his usefulness, has descended into the tomb. End of Section 19。Section 20 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Oliver Hazard Perry. 1785 to 1819. Oliver Hazard Perry was born in Rhode Island, August 23, 1785. 
the late Commodore McKenzie of the Navy, who possessed what we may term a fine biographical facility, has traced in his interesting narrative the life of Perry, with fond minuteness, the early incidents of the boy's career. The chief characteristics, he tells us, were an uncommon share of beauty, a sweetness and gentleness of disposition which corroborated the expression of his countenance, and a perfect disregard of danger, amounting to apparent unconsciousness. This biographer gives some curious anecdotes of his school days. Suffice it to say that the family removing to Newport about this time, Perry found good opportunities of education at that place and availed himself of them in a manly spirit. He was especially instructed in mathematics and their application to navigation and nautical astronomy. As proof of the boy's ingeniousness and the interest he excited in intelligent observers, it is related that Count Rochambeau, the son of the General of the Revolution, then residing at Newport, was particularly attracted to him, and that Bishop Seabury, on his visitation, marked him as a boy of religious feeling. These traits which shape the man we shall find them reappearing in the maturity of Perry's life, in his worth, humanity, and refinement. The boy was but 13 when his father, in 1798, was called into the naval service of his country in the spirited effort made by President Adams to resist the aggressions of France upon the ocean. He took the command of a small frigate built under his direction in Rhode Island, named the General Green, and carried with him to see his son Oliver as a midshipman at the express solicitation of the youth. The General Green was actively employed in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, giving all its officers abundant opportunity for practice in the infant service. The French war flurry after a while blew over as the directory, the mainspring of these aggressions, lost power. Peace was patched up, and Jefferson shortly after inaugurated an unwholesome Pacific policy by a sweeping reduction of the Navy, as if it were not small enough already. In this mutilating operation, the elder Perry was dropped, the younger one fortunately retained. The Navy, however, was soon revived by the demands of the nation to resist the iniquitous and insulting depredations upon life and property inflicted by the Barbary powers. The United States had borne far too patiently with these injuries, though she had the honor of being in advance of the old powers of Europe in resisting them. The Mediterranean became the scene of many a chivalrous exploit of our early officers, a score of whom, headed by Preble, Bainbridge, Decatur, Somers, and others of that stamp of fiery and indomitable valor, gained immortal laurels by their deeds of daring in conflict with the infidel. The young Perry served as midshipman in the frigate Adams, which sailed from Newport in 1802 to join Commodore Morris's command at Gibraltar. His ship was for some time employed in blockading a Tripolitian at that port, a tedious but instructive service in maneuvering, at the close of which Perry, in consequence of his accomplishments, was promoted by his captain to the duties of a lieutenant. The frigate was then employed as a convoy, making the tour of the northern ports. This gave Perry an opportunity to study scenes of the old world, which can never lose their influence in the formation of a man of education and refinement. In 1809, Perry got to sea in command of an armed schooner, the Revenge, which was employed on the Coast Service. While on the southern coast, he had an opportunity to gain distinction, which he did not fail to avail himself of, in cutting out a stolen American vessel from under the guns of a British ship in the Spanish waters off Florida. Conveying his prize off the coast, he was threatened by his majesty ship Gore, of double his force, when having, as Mackenzie says, no idea of being leopardized, he put his little schooner in readiness for boarding at a moment's notice a spirited resolution of great bravery, which he would no doubt have carried out had the British vessel insisted upon overhauling the revenge. While engaged in cruising off Connecticut and Rhode Island in the beginning of 1811, he unfortunately lost his vessel through the error of the pilot on the Watch Hill Reef opposite Fisher's Island as he was sailing from Newport to New London. 
every seaman-like effort was made to save the vessel, and when all was unavailing, Perry showed equal skill and resolution in landing the crew in a heavy January swell with a violent wind. He was himself the last to leave the vessel. He was not merely acquitted of neglect, but his conduct was extolled by a court of inquiry. He was, of course, thrown temporarily out of command by the loss of his vessel, an interval of repose which he hastened to turn to account by forming a matrimonial alliance with Miss Elizabeth Champlin Mason of an influential family at Newport, to whom he had become engaged several years before, on his arrival from the Mediterranean. The wedding took place in May 1811, affording him ample opportunity for the honeymoon, previous to the actual outbreak of the war impending with England. This event found him at Newport with the rank of Master Commandant in charge of the flotilla of gunboats keeping watch in the harbor. It was a service not altogether adapted to satisfy the ambitious spirit of a young officer, but it was important in itself and became, in Perry's hands, a step to further eminence. His course at this time illustrates a valuable truth that no honorable employment is profitless to a man of genius. He will in some way turn it to account. Constructing gunboats and recruiting men in port were services not calculated to make any great blaze in a dispatch, but they conducted Perry to his glorious bulletins of victory and the resounding praises of the nation. He saw a new field of military operations opening on the lakes, and his experienced eye must have seen as well the certain difficulties as the possible honors of the situation. It was not the post which an officer with the claims of Perry would have sought, while brilliant victories were being won in the eye of the world on the vast theater of the ocean. Others, however, were before him on that element. Despairing of a command at sea, he offered himself to Commodore Chauncey, who had recently been placed at the head of the Lake Service. His character was understood by this officer and the proffer accepted. The necessary communications were made to the government and in the middle of February in 1813, he was ordered to join Chauncey at Sackett's Harbor with the picked men of his Newport flotilla. He lost no time in reporting himself at the appointed spot. His destination was Lake Erie, where he was to supervise the construction of two vessels to be employed in the next campaign, and he was anxious to get to work. But Chauncey, who felt the need of his aid, detained him for a while on Lake Ontario. He, however, toward the end of March, reached Erie, where the vessels were building. His experience in constructing gunboats at Newport was now of avail to him. He put the defense of the works, which had been greatly neglected, in a state of efficiency and set himself to the collection of supplies, workmen, and an armament. No easy order in that day and in that place in the wilderness. For such, as compared with our own time, it then was. The labors of Perry in this work of preparation were, in fact, of the most arduous character. They should not be forgotten as a heavy item to his credit in the sum total of his victory. Three gunboats and two brigs were launched and equipped in May. It was at this time that he received advices that Chauncey was about to make an attack on the British post of Fort George at the mouth of the Niagara River. He had been promised a share in this adventure and hastened to the scene. The incidents of this journey show the spirit of the man. In his own words, in a letter describing this passage of his life, on the evening of May 23rd, I received information about sunset that Commodore Chauncey would, in a day or two, arrive at Niagara, when an attack would be made on Fort George. He had previously promised me the command of the seamen and marines that might land from the fleet. Without hesitation, I determined to join him. I left Erie about dark in a small, four-oared open boat. The night was squally and very dark. After encountering headwinds and many difficulties, I arrived at Buffalo on the evening of the 24th, refreshed and remained there until daylight. I then passed the whole of the British lines in my boat, within musket shot. Passing Strawberry Island, several people on our side of the river hailed and beckoned me on shore. On landing, they pointed out about 40 men on the end of Grand Island, who doubtless were placed there to intercept boats. In a few moments, I should have been in their hands. I then proceeded with more caution. As we arrived at Schlosser, it rained violently. 
no horse could be procured. I determined to push forward on foot, walked about two miles and a half, when the rain fell in such torrents I was obliged to take shelter in a house at hand. The sailors, whom I had left with the boat, hearing of public horses on the commons, determined to catch one for me. They found an old passing one which could not run away, and brought him in, rigged a rope from the boat into a bridle, and borrowed a saddle without either stirrup, girth, or crupper. Thus accoutred, they pursued me, and found me at the house where I had stopped. The rain ceasing, I mounted, my legs hung down the sides of the horse, and I was obliged to steady the saddle by holding by the mane. In this style, I entered the camp. It was raining again most violently. Colonel Porter, being the first to discover me, insisted upon taking my horse, as I had some distance to ride to the other end of the camp, off which the Madison lay. Having thus reached headquarters, arrangements were rapidly made, and the landing of the troops assigned to Perry. In the ignorance or inexperience of some of the officers, there was considerable confusion in directing the boats in the river, which was remedied by Perry's vigilance and decision. He was everywhere in the midst of danger, guiding and directing. The unexpected attack of the British was met by his energy, the landing effected, and the object of the expedition accomplished. This victory opened the port of Black Rock, where several American vessels were collected, which Perry undertook to get into Lake Erie against the strong current of the river, a feat which was accomplished with extraordinary fatigue, so that he returned to his station at Erie with a respectable addition of five vessels to his own newly launched little fleet in that harbor. The American force was composed of the brigs Lawrence and Niagara, of 20 guns each, and seven smaller vessels, numbering in all 54 guns. Captain Barclay, commander of the British forces on the lake, had the Detroit, of 19 guns, the Queen Charlotte, Lady Provost, and three other vessels, numbering altogether 63 guns. The range of the enemy's guns gave them advantage at a distance when the corresponding American fire was ineffectual. The Americans, too, were under a disadvantage in the enfeebled state of the crews by the general illness which prevailed among them. The British force had undoubtedly the superiority in trained men as compared with Perry's extemporized miscellaneous command and untried junior officers. The latter proved, however, to be of the right material. On the morning of the engagement, the American fleet was among the islands off Malden at Putten Bay, when the British force bore up. There was some difficulty at first in clearing the islands, and the nature of the wind seemed likely to throw Perry upon the defensive, when a southeast breeze springing up enabled him to bear down upon the enemy. This was at ten o'clock on a fine autumnal morning. Perry arranged his vessels in line, taking the lead in his flagship, the Lawrence, on which he now raised the signal for action a blue flag inscribed in large white letters with the words of the dying Lawrence, don't give up the ship. He accompanied this movement with an appeal to his men. My brave lads, this flag contains the last words of Captain Lawrence. Shall I hoist it? Aye, aye, sir, was the willing response. In this way, he cheered the men in the awful pause. A dead silence of an hour and a half preceded the action, for in the light breeze the vessels were long in overcoming the intermediate distance of several miles. Perry, who knew the perils of the day, prepared his papers as if for death. He leaded the public documents in readiness to be cast overboard, and, a touching trait of these moments, gave a hurried perusal to his wife's letters, and tore them to pieces lest they should be read by the enemy. The awful silence is suddenly broken by a bugle sounding on board the Detroit and the cheers of the British seamen. A shot from that vessel fell short of its mark. The Lawrence bears on to meet the fire, accompanied by the other vessels of the command in appointed order, each destined for its appropriate antagonist. At noon, the British fire from the superior long guns was telling fearfully on the American force when Perry made all sail for close quarters, bringing the Lawrence within reach of the Detroit. He maintained a steady, well-directed fire from his carronades, assisted by the Scorpion and Ariel. 
The destruction on the deck of the Lawrence was fearful. Out of 100 well men, says Mackenzie, who had gone into action, 22 were killed and 61 wounded. We shall not insult the humanity of the reader by the details of this fearful carnage. It has probably never been exceeded in the terrors of the dying deck in naval warfare. In the midst of this storm of conflict, Perry, finding his ship getting disabled and seeing the Niagara uninjured at a safe distance, resolved to change his flag to that vessel. He had half a mile to traverse, exposed to the fire of the enemy in an open boat. Nothing deterred with the exclamation, If a victory is to be gained, I'll gain it. He made the passage, part of the time standing as a target for the hostile guns. Fifteen minutes were passed exposed to this plunging fire, which splintered the oars and covered the boat with spray. The Lawrence, stripped of her officers and men, was compelled to surrender. Perry instantly bore up to the Detroit, the guns of which were plied resolutely when she became entangled with her consort, the Queen Charlotte, and the Niagara poured a deadly fire into both vessels. This cannonade decided the battle in seven minutes when the enemy surrendered. The American loss in this engagement was 27 killed and 96 wounded. That of the British, 41 killed and 94 wounded. Gallant actions were performed and noble men fell on both sides. It was every way a splendid victor, placing the genius of Perry and his magnanimous, spirited conduct throughout in the highest rank of naval exertion. The memorable letters, brief, at once eloquent and modest, which he wrote that afternoon announcing his victory, are too characteristic to be omitted in any personal account of the man. Addressing General Harrison, he writes, Dear General, we have met the enemy, and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Yours, with very great respect and esteem, O. H. Perry. The other was to the Secretary of the Navy. Sir, it has pleased the Almighty to give to the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force under my command, after a sharp conflict. I have the honor to be, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, O. H. Perry. In consonance with this simple eloquence, the mark of a mastermind was his chivalrous care of his wounded and conduct towards his prisoners. The victory having been gained and the lake thus cleared of the foe, Perry was enabled to act in concert with General Harrison in driving the British from Michigan, and when his fleet was of no avail to follow them in their rapid flight, he joined that officer's land expedition and was present, acting as his aide at the Battle of the Thames. The appearance of the brave Commodore, writes Harrison in his official report, cheered and animated every heart. Perry also gained the gratitude of the Moravians, in whose district the contest took place, by his care in relieving the inevitable evils of war. He met everywhere on his homeward route with complimentary toasts and resolutions, gathering volume as he reached his native state, where he was received at Newport with military and civic honors. The city of New York paid him a grateful attention in a request communicated by DeWitt Clinton, then mayor, to sit for his portrait for the Civic Gallery. The portrait was painted by Jarvis, representing him in the act of boarding the Niagara, and is preserved in the City Hall. He was created an honorary member of the Cincinnati. Congress voted him a medal and money. He was dined and feasted, and blazed the comet of the season. Perry's next service was in August 1814, in command of the Java 44, a frigate recently built at Baltimore. He was, however, not able to get to sea in consequence of the blockade by the enemy. On the conclusion of peace, he sailed in this vessel to join Commodore Shaw's squadron in the Mediterranean. In 1819, he sailed as Commodore in command of the John Adams for the West Indies, bound for the state of Venezuela to carry on an armed negotiation for the protection of American commerce from aggressions in that quarter. 
Arriving at the mouth of the Orinoco, he shifted his flag to the Nunsuch and ascended the river to the capital, Angostura, where he remained 20 days transacting his business in the height of the yellow fever season. His vessel had hardly left the river on her way to Trinidad when he was attacked. For nearly a week he suffered the progress of the terrible disease on board the small schooner under a tropical sun when he reached the station whither he had sent his flagship, the Adams. But he reached port only to die at sea within a mile of the anchorage on August 23, 1819, when he had just completed his 34th year. Such and so early was the fate of the gallant Perry. His remains were interred from the John Adams at Port Spain with every attention by the English governor. Subsequently, they were brought home in a national vessel by the order of Congress and reinterred at the public expense in the cemetery at Newport. The country also provided for the support of his family. If ever America produced a man whom the nation delighted to honor, it was Perry. End of section 20. Section number 21 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kenzie Tartaglioni. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Sam Houston by Amelia E. Barr, 1793-1863 Footnote, copyright 1894 by Selmar Hess. End of footnote. The builders of the American Commonwealth were all great and individual men, but the most grandly picturesque, the most heroic figure among them is that of General Sam Houston. Neither modern history nor the scrolls of ancient Greece or Rome can furnish a tale of glory more thrilling and stirring than the epic Sam Houston wrote with sword and pen as a conqueror of tyranny and a liberator of men. His life is a romance, and even his antecedents have the grandeur and glamour of military glory, for his ancestors, as sons of old Gaul, had drawn their long swords in every battle for Scottish liberty, and his own father died while on military duty in the Alleghenies. He had also a mother worthy of the son she bore, a grand, brave woman who put the musket into his boyish hands with the words, My doors are ever open to the brave, Sam, but are eternally closed to cowards. This was in the year 1813, when there was promise of a war with England, and Sam was not then twenty years old, a tall, slender, wonderfully handsome youth, with the air and manner of a prince. But nothing of this bearing was due to schools or schoolmasters. He was not of any man's molding, although he had been educated for his future in a noble manner. For to escape the drudgery of measuring tape and molasses, he fled to the Indians when but a lad, and was adopted by their chief, and with the young braves he learned to run and leap and hunt and ride, and find his way through pathless woods with all their skill. This was his practical education. He had only one book for mental enlargement, but this was the Pope's translation of the Iliad. He read and reread this volume till he could recite it from beginning to end, till the words were living and the spectral heroes were his friends and companions. So that when he joined General Jackson's battalion, he had the heart of a Greek demigod and the physical skill and prowess of a Cherokee Indian chief. He made a glorious record in this war, and being severely wounded, both by arrows and gunshot, he returned to his home to be nursed by his mother. When he was able to rise again, peace was assured, and he resolved to become a lawyer. He was told that eighteen months' hard study would be necessary but in six months he passed a searching examination and was admitted to the bar of Tennessee with a clap. Then, honor after honor came as naturally to him as a tree bears fruit or flower, first adjutant general of the state with the rank of colonel, then district attorney, major general, 
member of Congress, governor of the state of Tennessee. All these places and honors were awarded him by large majorities during a period of nine years. Indeed, between A.D. 1818 and 1827, the records of Tennessee read like some political romance of which the handsome and beloved Sam Houston was the hero. This was his second school. He was learning during these years those great principles of government which enabled him afterward to legislate so wisely for the land he conquered. And as soon as he was ready for his destiny, an event happened which drove him back again to the wilderness. Concerning this event, no human being has the right to speak authoritatively. It was an affair strictly between himself and his bride of hardly three months. But whatever occurred shattered his life to pieces. He separated from his wife, resigned his office as governor, and in the presence of a vast and sorrowing multitude, bid adieu to all his friends and honors, and set his face resolutely to his Indian father, who was then king of the Cherokees in Arkansas. He began, in fact, his journey to Texas, the theater of the great work for which his previous life had been a preparation. The thought of Texas was not a new one to him. No man had watched the hitherto futile efforts of that glorious land for freedom with greater interest. And there is little doubt that Andrew Jackson was a sharer in all Houston's Texan enthusiasms, and that he also quietly encouraged and aided the efforts for its Americanization. Indeed, at that day, Texas was a name full of romance and mystery. Throughout the South and West, up the great highway of the Mississippi, on the busy streets of New York, and among the silent hills of New England, men spoke of the charmed city of San Antonio as Europeans in the 18th century spoke of Delhi and Agra and the Great Mogul. French traders went there with fancy goods from New Orleans, and Spanish dons from the wealthy cities of central Mexico came there to buy. From the villages of Connecticut, from the woods of Tennessee, and the lagoons of the Mississippi, Adventurous Americans entered the Spanish-Texan territory at Nacogdoches, going through the land buying horses and lending their stout hearts and ready rifles to every effort for freedom which the Texans made. For though the Americans were few in number and much scattered, they were like the salt in a pottage, and men caught fire in the idea of freedom from them. Texas was at this time a territory of the Empire of Mexico, and Mexico was making constant, though as yet ineffectual, efforts to become independent. Twenty years before Houston entered Texas, a number of Americans joined the priest Hildago in his struggle to make Mexico free. They were all shot, but this did not hinder McGee and Bernardo, with 1,200 Americans, raising the standard of liberty two years later. This party took San Antonio, and the fame of their deeds brought young Americans by hundreds to their aid. Though they received no money, the love of freedom and the love of adventure being their motive and their reward. But these brave paladins were soon followed by men who bought land and made homes, and in 1821 Austin, with the sanction of the Spanish Viceroy, introduced 300 families who received every reasonable guarantee from the Spanish government. They were scarcely settled ere there was another Mexican revolt against Spain. This time, the Mexicans under Santa Anna achieved the independence of their country, and a Mexican republic was formed, with a constitution so liberal that it was gladly accepted by the American colonists. But its promises were fallacious. For ten years, Santa Anna was engaged in fighting for his own supremacy, and when he had subdued all opposition, he had forgotten the traditions of freedom for which he first drew his sword and assumed the authority of a dictator. In the meantime, the American element had been steadily increasing, and Santa Anna was, not unnaturally, afraid of its growing strength and influence. In order to weaken it, he substituted for the Constitution under whose guarantee they had settled military and priestly laws of the most oppressive kind, and the complaints and reprisals at length reached such a pitch that all Americans were ordered to deliver up their arms to the Mexican authorities. It was simply in order to disarm them in the midst of their enemies. Now the rifle is to the frontier American a third limb, and in Texas it was also necessary for the supply of food for the family, and vital for their protection from the Indians. The answer to this demand was a notice to Santa Anna, posted on the very walls of the Alamo Fortress. If you want our arms, take them. Ten thousand Americans. 
This was a virtual declaration of war, but the American Texans were by no means unprepared for the idea, nor yet for its translation into practice. Austin, who had been sent with a remonstrance to Santa Ana, was in the dungeons of the Inquisition in Mexico, but Houston, Lamar, Burleson, Burnett, Bowie, Crockett, Sherman, and many another name able to fire an army were on the ground. Besides which, the sympathy of the whole land was with their little band of heroes. For the idea of Texas had been carried in the American heart for two generations. As far back as 1819, President Adams had wanted Texas, and Henry Clay would have voted three millions for it. Van Buren told Poinsett to offer five millions. Jackson added an additional half million for the Rio Grande Territory. But Jackson had more faith in Houston and the American settlers in Texas than in money. His brave old heart was on fire for the wrongs and cruelties inflicted by Santa Ana on his countrymen, and he was inclined to make Mexico give Texas as an atonement for the insults offered them. There is little doubt that the defiance posted on the walls of the Alamo thrilled him with a similar defiance, and that he instinctively put his hand on the spot where he had been used to wear his sword. The first step of the American Texans was to set a civil government in motion. Declarations and manifestos had to be made, and loans raised, in order to maintain an army in the field. There were many fine fighters, but Houston was the only statesman, and to him the arduous duty naturally fell. In the meantime, Lamar and Burleson, with 200 picked men, attacked the Alamo Fortress. It was defended by General Koss with 1,000 men and 48 cannon, but on the afternoon of the third day's fighting surrendered to the Americans. This was the first act in the drama, for as soon as the news reached Mexico, Santa Ana, with a large army of subjugation, was on the road to Texas. The Alamo was taken by the Americans during the first day of December 1835. On March 2, 1836, Texas was declared by the convention assembled at the settlement of Washington to be an independent republic, and 55 out of 56 votes elected Houston commander-in-chief. Houston immediately set out for the Alamo, but when he reached Gonzales, he heard that every man in it had died fighting, and that Santa Anna had made a huge hecatomb of their bodies and burned them to ashes. Houston immediately sent an express to Fannin, who was defending Goliad, to blow up the fortress of Goliad and unite with him on the Guadalupe. Fannin did not obey orders. He wrote to Houston that he had named the place Fort Defiance and was resolved to defend it. This decision distressed Houston, for Fannin's men were of the finest material, young men from Georgia and Alabama, fired with the idea of freedom and the spread of Americanism, or perhaps with the fanaticism of religious liberty of conscience. After reading Fannin's letter, Houston turned to Major Hockley and said, as he pointed to the little band of men around him, Those men are the last hope of Texas. With them, we must achieve our independence or perish in the attempt. He immediately sent wagons into all the surrounding country to gather the women and the children, for he anticipated the atrocities which would mark every mile of Santa Ana's progress through the country, and he was determined that these helpless non-combatants should be placed in comparative safety in the eastern settlements. Then commenced one of the grandest and most pathetic retreats history has any record of. Encumbered by hundreds of women and children in every condition of helplessness, the bravery, tenderness, and patience of these American soldiers is as much beyond credence as it is beyond praise. The whole weeping, weary company were to guard and to forage for. Yet, the men were never too weary to help mothers still more exhausted or to carry some child whose swollen feet could no longer bear its weight. On this terrible march, many children were lost, many died, and many were born and the whole company suffered from deprivations of every kind. On March 23rd, Houston wrote to General Rusk, Before my God, I have found the darkest hours of my life. For forty-eight hours I have neither eaten nor slept. And just at this time came the news that Fannin with five hundred men had been massacred, after fighting until their ammunition gave out and surrendering as prisoners of war under favorable terms of capitulation. This news was answered by a passionate demand for vengeance, and Houston, gathering his men around him, spoke words which inspired them with an unconquerable courage. His large, bright face, serious but hopeful, seemed to sun the camp 
and his voice, loud as a trumpet with a silver tone, set every heart to its loftiest key. They live too long, he cried, who outlive freedom, and I promise you a full cup of vengeance. But in words not to be gainsaid, he told them they must put their women and children in safety first of all. Then he explained the advantages they were gaining by every mile they made the enemy follow them. How the low Brazos land, the unfordable streams, the morasses, and the pathless woods were weakening, separating, and confusing the three great bodies of Mexicans behind. He declared the freedom of Texas to be sure and certain, and bid them prepare to achieve it. When they arrived at Harrisburg, they found Santa Anna had burned the place. It was evident then that the day and the hour was at hand. Houston transported the 200 families he had in charge across the Buffalo Bayou, which was 20 feet deep in the very home of alligators. He then destroyed the only bridge across the dangerous stream and wrote the following letter now in the archives of the Texas Republic. This morning, we are in preparation to meet Santa Anna. We will only be about 700 to march, besides the camp guard, but we go to conquest. The troops are in fine spirits, and now is the time for action. I leave the results in the hands of an all-wise God, and I rely confidently in his providence. Sam Houston Both armies were on the field of San Jacinto, and Santa Anna had with him nearly 2,000 men against the 700 with General Houston. Houston advanced the attack at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with the war cry of Remember the Alamo. It was taken up by 700 men with such a shout of vengeance as mortal ears never heard before. With it on their lips, they advanced close to the Mexican lines while a storm of bullets went over their heads. Houston and his horse were both wounded, but both being of the finest metal, they pressed on regardless of their wounds. The Americans did not answer the volley until they could pour their lead into the bosoms of their foes. They never thought of reloading, but clubbing their rifles until they broke. They then flung them away and fired their pistols into the very eyes of the Mexicans. When nothing else remained, they drew their bowie knives and cut their way through the walls of living flesh. Nothing comparable to that charge for freedom was ever made. Men said afterward that the unseen battalions, the mighty dead as well as the mighty living, won the battle. Poor Fannin, exclaimed General Sherman. He has been blamed for disobeying orders, but I think he obeyed orders today. Men fought like spirits, impetuous, invincible, as if they had cast off flesh and blood. The battle began at three o'clock in the afternoon of April 21st, 1836, and after the Americans reached the Mexican line, it lasted just 18 minutes. At four o'clock, the whole Mexican army was flying, and the pursuit and slaughter continued until dark. It was a military miracle, for the American loss was only eight killed and 17 wounded. Of the Mexicans, 630 were left dead on the field. Multitudes perished in the bayou and morass, and there were nearly 800 prisoners. Only seven men are known to have escaped either death or capture. Santa Anna was found hiding in coarse clothing, and Houston had the greatest difficulty to save his life. For Houston knew that the lives of all the Americans in Mexico were in danger, besides which he was needed to secure the peace and independence of Texas. It required Houston's influence, however, to convince men whose fathers and brothers and sons had been brutally massacred at Goliad and the Alamo that their private vengeance must give way to the public good. Just about the time that the Battle of San Jacinto was fought, President Jackson was one day found by Mr. Buchanan studying earnestly the map of Texas. He was tracing Houston's plan of retreat, of which he had doubtless received information. In putting his finger upon San Jacinto, he said, Here is the place. If Sam Houston is worth one bobby, he will make a stand here and give them a fight. A few days after this declaration, news was received in Washington that the fight had been given and won on that very spot. The annexation of Texas was now publicly, as it had long been privately, the hope and goal of the government, and for this end Jackson, says Mr. Parton, displayed an energy and pugnacity seldom exhibited before or since by a politician in his 77th year. But failure was a word not in Jackson's vocabulary. He annexed Texas, and dying as the measure was accomplished, talked only in his last moments of Texas and Houston. Houston was elected president of the new republic by acclamation, and he served the state two terms in this capacity. 
Both were marked by the finest statesmanship. And during them, the Texans suffered little from the ferocious Apache, Comanche, and other Indian tribes. For Houston fearlessly slept in their camps and treated them as brethren, and his Indian talks have an Asianic poetry about them. Thus, he writes to the Indian chief Linney, The Red Brothers know that my words to them have never been forgotten by me. They have never been swallowed up in darkness, nor has the light of the sun consumed them. Truth cannot perish, but the words of a liar are as nothing. Talk to all the Red Men, and tell them to make peace. War cannot make them happy. It has lasted too long. Let it now be ended and cease forever, etc., etc. After the annexation of Texas, Houston represented the state for three terms in the United States Senate, but in 1859 he failed of re-election because he refused to go with the South on the fatal subject of secession. Yet so great was the confidence of the people in his honor and ability that they elected him governor of Texas in the same year, and he entered on the office in December 1859. The election of Mr. Lincoln in 1860 precipitated events, and though Houston used all his mighty personal influence and all his charmful, potent eloquence to keep Texas in the Union, he failed, and was deposed from the governorship on his refusal to sign the Ordinance of Secession. Then he calmly withdrew from the scene, and there are many living who remember his pathetic parting words. I have seen, he said, the statesmen and patriots of my youth gathered to their fathers, and the government which they had reared rent in twain, and none like them are now left to reunite it again. I stand almost the last of a race who learned from them the lessons of human freedom. These events inflicted a mortal wound upon his great spirit, and when he heard the roar of the cannon announcing the secession of Texas, he turned to his wife and said, My heart is broken. The words were only too true. For two years he lingered a sad and solemn old man, mourning for the woes of his country and for the defection of his eldest son Sam, who had joined the Confederates and been taken prisoner by the Northern Army. He was also suffering from the wounds received both in the War of 1812 and also at San Jacinto, and it was evident that he had come to the close of his life. He himself looked forward to the event without fear and with a wise and well-grounded hope. On March 2, 1863, Houston was 70, and in response to an ovation in his own city of Houston, he made a short, broken little speech. It was his last public effort, and from it he went back home to Huntsville to die. His last days were spent in incessant and heartbroken prayers for his country and for his family. And on July 26, 1863, three weeks after the fall of Vicksburg, he breathed his last to the words, Texas, Texas. So honestly and unselfishly had this great man lived that he died in poverty, needing many comforts. This hero, who by his valor and statesmanship had increased the territory of the United States by more than 800,000 square miles, or about the equivalent of the 13 original states. But the splendor of his name is not to be touched by such an accident as poverty. To the people of Texas, Houston will ever be a beloved memory, and on the roll of fame he shines forth the noblest and most princely, the most picturesque and chivalrous character in American history. End of section 21. Read by Kenzie Tartaglioni. Section 22 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Winfield Scott, by the Honorable Theodore Roosevelt, 1786 to 1866. Winfield Scott was born at Petersburg, Virginia, on June 13, 1786. His father was a gallant revolutionary soldier, his mother one of the well-known Virginia family of Masons. He attended the schools in his neighborhood and graduated at the then famous College of William and Mary, and upon graduation began his career as a lawyer. All his tastes were military, however, and in 1807 he joined a volunteer organization to watch the coasts, which were menaced by the British frigates. 
there being then a great excitement over the Leopold and Chesapeake affair. When this flurry subsided, he went down to practice in South Carolina. Soon after his arrival there was another alarm of war, and back went Scott post-haste for Washington, again abandoning his law, with the hope of getting a commission in the army. Yet again, in 1808, the chances of war once more retiring to the background, he tried his fortune at the bar, this time in Virginia. Alarms of war were frequent during the next four years, however, and Scott rigidly confined his practice as a lawyer to the intervals when it was not deemed possible that there could be danger from abroad. In 1808, he was made a captain of light artillery and was sent with his company to New Orleans. Scott was always frank in announcing his utter contempt for Jefferson's foreign policy as president and his abhorrence of the men whom Jefferson got into the army at this period. West Point had only just started. Its few graduates did well in the War of 1812, but most of the other officers of the army were men appointed by political influence at the time, or else old officers who, in their youth, had had some experience in the Revolutionary War, but were disabled by age, drunkenness, and long lack of acquaintance with military matters. Among the officers themselves there were savage factions, and Scott got into one or two scrapes in consequence of his advocacy of one of the parties. In May 1812, the long-delayed hostilities were evidently close at hand, and Scott left New Orleans for Washington. In September, Scott, now made a lieutenant colonel, reached Niagara, only to share in the humiliating though petty defeats with which the land war opened on our northern frontier. His first serious affair was at the abortive effort to stomp the heights of Queenstown. When Van Rensselaer, who had led the attack, was wounded so as to be unable to take further part, Scott himself assumed the command. At this time, about a fourth of the American militia had crossed and were attacked by slightly superior numbers of British regulars and Indians. Their remaining companions, utterly undisciplined and with no leaders, were struck by panic cowardice and refused to cross to the assistance of their fellows. Scott behaved with distinguished personal bravery, rallying his raw troops and leading them in a charge with the bayonet, always a favorite weapon with him. Nevertheless, his forces soon fell into disorder and were driven over the cliffs to the edge of the water, where, from lack of boats, most of the men were made prisoners. Scott among the number. Much difficulty was experienced by the British officers in preventing the Indians from massacring the prisoners. Scott was a man of gigantic proportions. This fact, and the reckless courage with which he had fought, had attracted the attention of the Indians. Some of them came into the room where he was confined and attempted to murder him, and only his great strength and quickness enabled him to beat them off until he was rescued by a British officer. Soon after his capture he was exchanged, and promoted to the rank of colonel. He joined the American armies as chief of staff to the major general commanding, and being about the only man in the army who had any knowledge of tactical manuals and military treatises generally, he was kept busy from morning till night in organizing the staff service, drilling the officers, and the like. These duties, however, did not interfere with his leading and commanding his troops in battle. He led the advance guard in the successful assault on Fort George in May 1813, took part in a number of skirmishes, and served with the gallantry in Wilkinson's unsuccessful campaign. Early in the spring of 1814, a camp of instruction for officers and men was formed, with Scott in command, near Buffalo. Up to this time, the imbecility of the administration, and of the people whom the administration represented, in not preparing for the war, had been well matched by the supineness with which they carried it on. During the eighteen months that had elapsed since the beginning of the contest, only the Navy, built by the Federalists when in power fifteen years before, had saved the country from complete disgrace, the armies generally being utterly inadequate in number, and moreover models of all that troops ought not to be. Even in 1814, this remained true of the forces entrusted with the defense of the capital itself. But on the northern frontier, Scott, and his immediate superior, Brown, by laborious work, succeeded in turning the inefficient mob of the first two campaigns into as admirable a weapon of offense and defense as ever was handled by a general officer. 
in July, the little army of skeleton regiments, thus carefully drilled, was ready for the invasion of Canada. On July 5th, the fight at Chippewa took place. The battle was practically between Scott's wing of Brown's army and Ryle's British troops, the numbers being almost exactly equal. There was very little maneuvering. After a tolerably heavy artillery fire and some skirmishes between the light troops and Indians on each side, in the woods, the British regulars and Scott's American regulars advanced against each other in line across the plain, occasionally halting to fire. It was noticed that the fire of the Americans was the more deadly. Their line was thinner and more extended than that of the British. When within sixty or seventy paces of one another the two sides charged, there was a clash of bayonets. Then the thinner American line, outflanking the more solid British column, closed in at the extremities, and the British broke and fled immediately. This was not only a needed victory for the Americans, but was also the first occasion for a generation that British regulars had been faced in the open, on equal terms, with a bayonet, and defeated. At this very time, the British had just brought to a close the terrible war with the French in the peninsula. Their troops had been pitted successfully against the best marshals and the best troops of what was undoubtedly the foremost military power of continental Europe. And now, the American regulars, trained by Scott and under his leadership, performed a feat which no French general and no French troops had ever been able to place to the credit of their nation. Three weeks later, the British and American forces again came together at the bloody Battle of Lundy's Lane. The most desperate fighting on this occasion took place during the night, the Americans and British charging in turn with the bayonet, and the artillery of both sides being captured and recaptured again and again. The Americans were somewhat inferior in numbers to the British, and the slaughter was very great, considering the number of men engaged, amounting to nearly a third of the total of both forces. In the end, the fight ceased from exhaustion, the armies drawing off from one another and leaving the field of battle untenanted. But the result was virtually a victory for the British, for the next day they advanced, and the Americans retired to Fort Erie. Scott, who had exposed himself with the reckless personal courage he always showed when under fire, was dismounted and badly injured by the rebound of a cannonball in the early part of the battle, and about midnight, just before the close of the actual fighting, received a musket ball in the body, which disabled him. Scott did not recover from his wound in time to take part in the remaining scenes of the war. After its close, he went abroad, visiting London and Paris, and being very well received, returning in 1816, and again taking up his duties in the army. He indulged himself in the luxury of a sharp quarrel with Andrew Jackson, a luxury which any man could easily obtain, by the way, but which was too much for any man not possessing Scott's abundant capacity to take care of himself in any conflict. He interested himself greatly in improving the tactics of the army, and went out to take command of the Black Hawk War, where he had no opportunity to distinguish himself. At the time of the nullification outbreak in South Carolina, he was appointed to see to the interests of the United States in Charleston, where he acquitted himself with equal tact and resolution. He commanded in the Seminole War, but again had no opportunity to distinguish himself, and in the winter of 1837-38 was stationed on the northern frontier, where he succeeded in preventing invasions of Canada by American sympathizers with a then existing Canadian rebellion. Soon after this, he superintended the removal of the Cherokees from Georgia, doing everything in his power for the Indians, who, in defiance of the pledged faith of the United States, were being driven out of that state. For the next few years, Scott was comparatively inactive. He had a great taste for politics and could not forbear meddling with them, although he was at the time general-in-chief of the army. He was a very sincere Union man and was an outspoken Whig, though with a strong latent leaning to the Know-Nothing Party, for he distrusted both foreigners and Catholics. He would not own slaves, and disbelieved in slavery. But he also utterly disapproved of the actions of the political abolitionists of the day. He was not only a very ambitious, but a very vain man, and at times his desire for civic honors led him to try for success in fields where he did not show to such advantage as on the field of battle. 
When the Mexican War broke out, the president, Polk, whom Scott detested, was reluctant to see Scott given a chance to make a record, in view of his being a pronounced Whig, and of the probability that a successful general, if nominated on the Whig ticket, would sweep the country. However, toward the end of 1846, it became impossible longer to pass by Scott's demands for active service. And, moreover, the administration felt the less reluctance, inasmuch as Taylor, another Whig, had achieved much credit by his victories along the Rio Grande. Accordingly, Scott was dispatched with a fine army to attack Mexico from the seaboard of the Gulf and to penetrate to the capital of the country. Early in March of 1847, he landed near the city of Veracruz with 12,000 men. Trenches were opened, a bombardment begun, and the castle of San Juan de Aloa surrendered on the 27th. 5,000 prisoners and 400 pieces of artillery falling to the victors. Scott lost in all but 64 men killed and wounded. As soon after this victory as he could gather horses and mules, the army started for the interior, and on April 18th encountered the Mexican army, about the same in numbers as Scott's, under Santa Anna, strongly posted at Cerro Gordo. Scott made his plans with great skill, and the battle is remarkable because of the closeness with which the methods and results of the actual attacks followed the outline which Scott gave of what he wished accomplished in his general orders of the day previous. The Americans attacked with resolution. In places, the Mexicans defended themselves well, but in other places, where the troops were raw, they gave way very quickly, and, as a result, the whole force was speedily routed and driven in headlong flight, with great loss of artillery and prisoners. Scott pushed closely after them, but almost immediately was halted by the necessity of discharging 4,000 volunteers whose terms of service had expired. After waiting in vain for reinforcements, the Americans again marched forward, and halted some time at Puebla, where the long-looked-for additional troops finally arrived in August. The army had suffered a good deal from sickness, and Scott was anxious to bring it into contact with the enemy as soon as possible. Accordingly, he pushed straight for Mexico. The Mexican armies, numerically about equal in strength to his own, occupied very strong positions, from which they were driven only by desperate fighting at Contreras, San Antonio, and Buena Vista, the Americans losing 1,000 men killed and wounded, but capturing 3,000 of their adversaries and 37 pieces of artillery. An armistice followed, but the negotiations came to nothing, and in September hostilities were resumed. The strong outworks of Molino del Rey and Chapultepec were stormed with great loss to the Americans, for they were places of formidable strength. The Mexicans defended themselves well, and the assailants were few in numbers. The bravery of the victors under these circumstances showed that Scott had not forgotten the art which enabled him to turn the raw troops of 1812 into men who, alone among the troops of civilized nations, could meet the British infantry in the open on equal terms. The city of Mexico fell immediately after the storming of Chapultepec, and Scott marched in. There was no further fighting of consequence, although bands of guerrillas and brigands of all kinds had to be dispersed. Scott treated them with proper severity. The campaign ended unhappily for Scott in one way, for he became embroiled with the administration and some of its partisans among the high officers of the army, the intrigues which caused this embroilment being instigated chiefly by democratic jealousy of the Whig general. However, he was thanked by Congress. This was the end of Scott's active service. He again plunged into political life, and in 1852 ran for the presidency on the Whig ticket, but was hopelessly defeated. He continued general-in-chief of the army until 1861, when he retired from the command. He was too old to take the field and do his part toward the suppression of the rebellion, but he remained staunchly loyal to the flag upon which his victories had conferred such glory, and to which he himself had owed so much. Even when his state seceded, it did not affect him, or cause him to waver in his allegiance to the country for which he had so often drawn his sword. He died May 29, 1866. Scott had many little vanities and peculiarities of temper and disposition, at which it is easy to laugh, 
but these are all of small moment in estimating the man's character and the worth of his service. He was a fearless, honest, loyal, and simple-hearted soldier, who served the nation with entire fidelity and devotion. He was very successful in battle, and not only his crowning achievement against Mexico, but the way in which he trained and led his troops in the Canadian campaign against the British show him to have possessed military abilities of a high order. His name will always stand well up on the list of American worthies. End of section 22. Section 23 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Ulysses Simpson Grant, 1822-1885, by Oliver Optic. Napoleon I was a genius. General Grant was not. But the earnest, persistent, and determined efforts of men only moderately endowed by nature with intellectual gifts sometimes surpass what is accomplished by the spasmodic flashes of those born to be conquerors. So far as the successful career of the most prominent hero of the War of the Rebellion may be used to point a moral, it forcibly emphasizes the results of energy, perseverance, and a determination to succeed in spite of all obstacles. As a military strategist, he was doubtless surpassed by others who were engaged in the giant struggle with him, but he accomplished, by adding to his soldierly abilities, his personal attributes, which seem not to have been within the power of any other of the able commanders associated with him in the mighty conflict. It is not claimed that General Grant was born into the world with brilliant or even superior intellectual powers, and his greatness was in the combination of his individual qualities and the fact, like Wellington, he was rich in saving common sense. He was a soldier in the most comprehensive sense. If he did not overtop his colleagues in a knowledge of the science of war, he was at least their equal. The career of its greatest hero, illustrates the manner in which the loyal nation gave to posterity a victorious union. Grant was born in humble circumstances, at Point Pleasant, a village on the Ohio River, and there were no accidents of family to gild or cloud his coming into the world. He was descended from Puritan stock, and one of his ancestors, a captain in the old French war, was killed in battle. The general's grandfather served through the Revolutionary War. His father was a tanner in Ohio, but his son was not inclined to follow that occupation, though he was willing to do so if his father insisted upon it until he was of age, but not a day longer. He stated his preferences in regard to his future employment, desiring to be a farmer, a trader on the river, or to obtain an education. The first was not practical, and the second was not regarded as very reputable. His father wrote to the representative of his district in Congress, who obtained for the young man a nomination to the Military Academy at West Point. All the education the young candidate for military honors had was only such as he had obtained at the district school, and the examination for admission was considered a very trying ordeal though it included only the branches taught in the common schools. He brushed up his studies, and he was always cool and self-possessed. He did not fail from embarrassment, as many do on such occasions, but was passed and admitted. Of the class of 87, only 39 were graduated. In rank, Grant was the 21st, indicating above the average ability. As a cadet, he was popular with his comrades. He was honest, fair, and square, and was especially careful of the rights of others. The horse had been a favorite with him from his early childhood, and at the academy he was distinguished as a bold and fearless rider. He was sober and rather dignified in his manner. The name given to him by his parents was Hiram Ulysses, 
but the congressman had made a mistake in presenting the nomination, and at West Point he was known as Ulysses Sidney. Failing to correct the error, he accepted the initial S, but made it stand for Simpson, after his mother. The first name was suggested by an elderly female relative, who appears to have read the Odyssey and appreciated its hero. The initials of his name, as it finally stood, had a national significance, which the newspapers were not tardy in using at the time of his first decided victory. He was graduated in 1843 and appointed Brevet Second Lieutenant in the 4th Regiment of Infantry. The engineers and the cavalry are considered more desirable arms of the service than the infantry, and the best scholars at the military academy are assigned to them. Grant's rank placed him in the latter. His regiment was sent to Jefferson Barracks, St. Louis. Frederick T. Dent, his classmate, was in the same command and resided in the vicinity. He was invited to the house of the Dents, where he made the acquaintance of Miss Julia T. Dent, who became his wife five years later. In 1845, the events which led to the Mexican War assumed form, and Grant's regiment was ordered to Corpus Christi, where he was commissioned as a full second lieutenant. His post was situated at the mouth of the Rio Nueces, between which and the Rio Grande was a triangular section of territory claimed by both governments, and this was the nominal subject of dispute between the United States and Mexico. General Taylor, commanding about 4,000 troops, was ordered to move his force to the Rio Grande, on which the Mexicans had concentrated an army. A body of United States dragoons, commanded by Captain Thornton, was surprised by an overwhelming force of the enemy, and all of them killed, wounded, or captured. This event fired the blood of the soldiers, as well as the people of the country, and Taylor crossed the river with the main body of his little army. The Mexican generals declared that the advance of Taylor into the disputed territory was an act of war, and active hostilities had commenced. While the general was hastening to reinforce one of the forts attacked, he came upon the Mexicans drawn up in order of battle at Palo Alto. In action, most with artillery, followed, and the enemy were defeated and driven from the field. It was the first battle fought in 31 years with any foe other than Indians by American soldiers. Grant was in that first conflict of half a century, as he was in the last ones. The Mexicans had fled from this first considerable battle of the war to Resaca de la Palma, where they had established themselves in a strong position. Taylor attacked them the next day, and though their force was triple that of their assailants, they were again defeated and rooted. The Mexicans fought with dogged courage. However, they may be judged from the events of the war. Three months later, General Taylor marched upon Monterey with an army reinforced to 6,000 men. It was strongly fortified, but the city was captured after a hard-fought battle. In the midst of the conflict in the town, while the Mexicans were disputing its possession from the windows of the strongly constructed houses, the ammunition of the brigade to which Grant was attached was exhausted, and it became necessary to send for a fresh supply. It was a service of extreme peril, and a volunteer was called for to perform it. Grant was a bold rider and he promptly offered himself to execute the dangerous mission. Mounting a very spirited horse, he resorted to the Indian fashion of hanging at the side of his steed so that the body of the animal protected him against the shots from the windows, and he passed safely through the street. With a sufficient escort, he succeeded in conveying a load of ammunition to the point where it was needed. Soon after the Battle of Monterey, Grant's regiment was sent to Veracruz to reinforce the larger army that was to march under General Scott to the halls of the Montezumas. Lieutenant Grant, as a careful, substantial, and energetic officer, was selected for the important position of quartermaster of the 4th Regiment. The army proceeded on its uninterrupted career of victory till the capital of Mexico was in its possession. The heights of the Cerro Gordo were stormed and carried, and Grant, as usual, was in the thickest of the fight. The first considerable obstacle after the capture of Veracruz having been removed, the army proceeded on its march to the city of Mexico, 
occupying Jalapa and Castle Perot on the way. But at Pueblo, the forces were so reduced by sickness, death, and the expiration of enlistments as to compel a halt. For three months, General Scott was compelled to wait for reinforcements. But when he could muster 11,000 effective men, a very small number for the conquest of a country, he resumed his march, and in August arrived in the vicinity of the capital. Outside of the causeways leading to the city were the strongholds of Chapultepec and Churubusco, and batteries mounting a hundred guns. Chapultepec was a fortification 150 feet above the average level of the ground, a front of 900 feet bristled with cannon. Behind it was a mill called El Molino del Rey, fortified and garrisoned, which defined the approach to the castle. The capture of this work was assigned to General Worth, to whose command the 4th Regiment belonged. The assault was a desperate one, for it was the last ditch of the Mexicans. But it was carried, though the assailing force lost one-fourth of its number in the assault. Second Lieutenant Grant behaved with distinguished gallantry, is the official report of his conduct. Though custom and precedence of the service permitted the quartermaster to remain at a safe distance from actual fighting in charge of the baggage trains, Grant never availed himself of this immunity from personal peril, but retained his place with the regiment. When the strong places which defended the city fell, Scott and his army marched into the capital. The Mexican forces fled, and the United States flag floated over the hulls of the Montezumas. The country was conquered, and the war was ended. Grant had been engaged in all the battles near the Rio Grande, and in most of them from Veracruz to the city of Mexico and he had won the brevet rank of captain for his gallantry. After the ratification of the Treaty of Peace, by which California was acquired, the army evacuated Mexico, and Captain Grant was sent to New York with his regiment. Its companies were separated and sent to various military stations. After serving at Detroit and Sackett's Harbor, the 4th Infantry was sent to Oregon in 1851, the discovery of gold in California having attracted an immense immigration to the shores of the Pacific. The battalion of which Grant's company was a part was stationed at Fort Dallas and had some experience in Indian warfare. In 1848, he had been married to Miss Dent, but in the wilds of Oregon, he was separated from his family. There was nothing there to satisfy his reasonable ambition, no hope of rising in his profession, and he became discontented. In 1853, he was commissioned as a full captain, but this did not reconcile him to his situation, and he resigned his position in the army to enter upon an untried life as a civilian. Grant was now 32 years of age. He had a wife and two children, and it was necessary for him to provide for their support. His first choice of an occupation was that of a farmer, and he went back to that in the present emergency. His wife owned a farm about nine miles from St. Louis, and Grant located himself there. He built a house upon it of hoon logs, working upon it with his own hands. He was not a gentleman farmer in any sense, for he drove one of his teams with wood to the city. He wore an old felt hat, a seedy blouse, and tucked his trousers legs into the tops of his boots. His habits were very simple and the lack of means compelled him to live on the most economical scale. The retired captain was not successful as a farmer, but he was known as an honest, upright man, faithful in all his obligations. In his need of a remunerative occupation, he applied for the position of city engineer in St. Louis, but he failed to obtain it. As a real estate agent, and as a collector, he was equally unsuccessful, and his fortunes were at a very low ebb. He obtained a place in the custom house, but at the end of the two months, the death of the collector compelled him to retire. But while fortune seemed to have completely deserted him, subjecting him to the fate of thousands of others in the struggle to live and care for his family, it was more propitious to his father, who was in a comparatively easy circumstance, and had established himself in the leather business in Galena, Illinois. It seemed to be incumbent upon him to do something for the relief of his eldest son, and in 1860, the ex-captain became a member of the firm of Grant and Sons. This was the position in which the opening of the War of the Rebellion found him. 
For years, the military spirit of the North had been repressed and discouraged. Sober and dignified people regarded the soldier as unnecessary, and military parades were looked upon as childish and classed in the category of circus shows. But suddenly, when the cannon of the rebellion began to resound in the South, the people were awakened from their dream of security, and the profession of arms, which had been disparaged and had almost fallen into disrepute, became in the highest degree honorable, for the safety of the nation depended upon it. Millions were ready to fight for the Union, but there were very few trained officers to organize and command those who were eager to uplift the flag and save the nation. Except here and there, one who had served in the Mexican or Indian Wars, there was not a soldier in the land who had any experience of actual warfare. To Galena came the intelligence that Fort Sumter had been barded, and with it the proclamation of President Lincoln calling for 75,000 volunteers. Grant was profoundly moved by the situation of the country, and without seeking for or thinking of the honors and emoluments that might be reaped, he patriotically desired to serve his country in the present terrible emergency. The nation had educated him for military service, and though he had fought with honor through one war, he did not regard the debt as paid. He was a soldier, but he did not boast of what he had done or even claimed the rank in the gathering armies to which his experience entitled him. In less than a week, he was drilling a company in Galena, whose members wished to make him their captain. But another citizen wanted the place, and he declined it. He consented to go to Springfield, the capital of the state, with the company. On the way he met the Honorable Elihu B. Washburn, and by him was presented to Governor Yates, who, however, did not appear to be greatly impressed, and did not take much notice of him. Then Grant wrote to the adjutant general of the army at Washington, stating that he had been educated at West Point at the public expense, and considered it his duty to tender his services to the government. He did not apply for the commission of a brigadier general, but was willing to serve in any capacity where he might be needed. No response came to this modest offer, and Grant visited Cincinnati, where George B. McClellan, who had been appointed Major General of Volunteers by the Governor of Ohio, was organizing the forces. Both had served in Worth's Brigade in Mexico, and Grant thought his former friend might tender him a position on his staff. Though he called upon him several times, he failed to meet him and returned to Springfield. While he was waiting at the Capitol, Governor Yates sent for him and asked him if he knew how many men belonged in a company. How many companies in a regiment? and similar questions concerning details which were very perplexing to a civilian. Grant assured him that he was a graduate of West Point, had served eleven years in the regular army, and knew all about such matters. This reply helped the governor out of his embarrassment, and the soldier was invited to take a seat in the State House and act as adjutant general. One who knew Grant better than the others suggested to the governor that he should appoint him to the command of a regiment, The advice was acted upon, and the patriotic seeker for military employment was appointed colonel of the 21st Regiment of Illinois Infantry. Grant promptly accepted the commission and hastened to Mattoon, where the regiment was encamped, and assumed the command. His command was a body of three months' troops, composed of excellent material, but in rather a demoralized condition when the colonel assumed command, for the men were American citizens— jealous of their rights as such, and military discipline was new and strange to them. Grant marched them into Caseyville, where he drilled them for four weeks, and transformed them from a mob of independent citizens into one of the best disciplined bodies of troops in the country, which became noted for its orderly and excellent bearing. The change was effected so skillfully that no man believed he had sacrificed his citizenship. The strong will of the colonel, dignified by the genuine principle of patriotism, overcame the prevailing idea of equality, and his command was a unit. The men were proud of the leadership of a regular army officer, and admired him to such a degree that they re-enlisted for three years. When Colonel Grant was at Caseyville, it was reported that Quincy, on the Mississippi, was menaced by rebel guerrillas from Missouri, and he was ordered to the exposed point. In the absence of transportation, he marched his regiment 120 miles of the distance. 
From this point, his command was sent into Missouri, where the discipline and the morals of the body were improved by quiet and judicious measures. Guarding railroads was the service in which the regiment was employed, and when serving with other commands, Grant was the acting brigadier general, though he was ranked by all the other colonels. In July of the opening year of the war, Grant became a brigadier general of volunteers. The appointment was obtained by Mr. Washburn, who had befriended him before. The Western Department was at this time under the command of General Fremont. Grant's district was a part of Missouri, with Western Kentucky and Tennessee, and he established his headquarters at Cairo, a point of the utmost military importance as a depot of supplies and a gunboat rendezvous. Kentucky had proclaimed a suspicious neutrality, and near Cairo, on the other side of the river, were the three termini of a railroad from the south. A Confederate force seized two of them, and Grant hastened to secure Paducah, the third. The enemy hurriedly retired as he landed his force, and Grant issued a temperate and judicious proclamation, for he was on the soil of the enemy. He had acted without orders from his superior, and returning to Cairo after an absence of less than a day, he found Fremont's order, already executed, awaiting him. He also took possession of Smithland, at the mouth of the Cumberland River. With a force of 3,100 men, General Grant made an incursion into Missouri to break up a rebel camp at Belmont, where he fought his first battle in the rebellion. He had accomplished his purpose, when the enemy was reinforced from Columbus on the other side of the river, and though he brought off his command in safety, he narrowly escaped capture himself. Fremont was superseded by Halleck, and for the next two months, Grant was employed in organizing and drilling his troops. Columbus, with 140 cannon and full of men and material, closed the Mississippi. The Confederate line of defense against the invasion of the South extended from this point across the country, including Fort Henry on the Tennessee and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland, the latter mounting 40 guns, with quarters for 20,000 soldiers. Grant was studying this line of defense, devising a plan to break through it. By order of General Halleck, he had sent out a reconnaissance in force under General Smith, who reported to him that the capture of Fort Henry was practicable. Grant forwarded this report to the commander of the department and asked for permission to attack it. This was refused, in sharp and curt terms. A written application, earnestly seconded by Commodore Foote, who had brought the gunboat service up to a state of efficiency in the West, secured the desired order. With 17,000 men, in connection with seven gunboats under the command of the Commodore, Grant started upon his mission the day after he received the order. Fort Henry was captured, though the army was not engaged. The main body of the Confederate force escaped to Fort Donelson. The capture of Fort Henry cheered the army and the people. Grant telegraphed the result of the attack to Halleck and announced his intention to proceed against Fort Donelson. Leaving 2,500 men to garrison the fort, Grant marched with 15,000 from Fort Henry, while a considerable addition to his force came up the river. The fortification was invested, and after three days of persistent fighting in cold, snow, and hunger, the fort surrendered. The gunboats were severely handled by the water batteries of the enemy, and the Commodore was badly wounded, so that most of the work fell upon the army. It was a brilliant victory, and the loyal nation resounded with the praises of Grant. This was the pointer to the fame he afterward achieved. His reply to the rebel general, I propose to move immediately on your works, was repeated all over the country, and the initials of his name came to mean unconditional surrender the terms he had demanded of the commander of the fort. The strategic line of the Confederates was broken, and new dispositions of their forces became necessary on account of this important victory. Columbus was abandoned, and its men and material sent to Island Number 10. The Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, or Shiloh, as it is called in the South, followed under Grant's command. It was a bloody and hotly contested action, and not as decisive as that of Donelson. The ground was held, and the arrival of Buell with reinforcements caused the Confederates to retire. Sherman had a command in this battle under Grant, 
and the strong friendship between these two great commanders, which subsisted to the end, had its origin about this time. Not such were the relations between Halleck and Grant, for the latter was practically thrown into the shade by the former, but the hero of Fort Donelson continued to do his duty faithfully, making no issue with his superior. At this time he was in command of the Army of the Tennessee. While he remained in this position, the Union Army and Navy had made decided progress in the West and the South, but no real advance was made in the direction of the rebel capital. Then McClellan was removed from his position of General-in-Chief, and Halleck was appointed in his place. Grant seemed to be forgotten for this time, or his operations were overshadowed by those in the East. But he had driven the enemy out of West Tennessee and was turning his attention toward Vicksburg. When he had sufficiently informed himself in regard to the situation, he proposed to the general-in-chief a movement upon Vicksburg, which was really the Gibraltar of the Mississippi, and he was invested with full powers to carry out his own plans. Constantly and earnestly supported by Sherman, he battered against the strong fortress for six months. Various expedients were resorted to for the reduction of the place, without success. With the written protest of four of his ablest generals in his pocket, Grant moved his army to a point four miles below Grand Gulf, fought several battles on his way, and came to the rear of Vicksburg. The Confederate engineers were doubtless as skillful as any in the world, and seemed to be justified in regarding the fortress, with its surrounding batteries, fortifications, swamps, and tangled jungles, as impregnable. Following up his regular siege operations, Grant exercised his indomitable will against those tremendous defenses, and Vicksburg fell. The news of its surrender was spread all over the loyal nation with that of the great victory of Gettysburg. The Confederacy had been cut in two, and a decided turn in the struggle for the Union was clearly indicated. The name of the victorious general was again upon the lips of all the people. Grant himself seemed to be the only man who remained unmoved. President Lincoln sent him an autograph letter acknowledging that Grant was right while he was wrong. Even Halleck was magnanimous enough to send him a very handsome letter of congratulation. The fortunate general had been made a major general of volunteers after his victory at Donelson, and he was now promoted to the rank of major general in the regular army. A new department had been created for Major General Grant, covering nearly all the territory south of the Ohio. He was worn out and sick after the severe exertions of the summer, but when informed that Rosecrans was shut up and closely besieged by Bragg and Chattanooga, he set out for this point with only his personal staff. On the way, he used the telegraph and the mails and suggested, or ordered, such steps as would relieve the place, for the Army of the Cumberland, shut off from supplies, was in desperate straits, sick and famished. Reinforcements were hurried, and the result of his preparations was the decided victory of the Battle of Chattanooga and Missionary Ridge. In this battle, General Sheridan came to his notice for the first time. General Grant was thanked and presented with a gold medal by Congress. He had become the idol of the loyal nation, but he bore his honors very meekly. The grade of lieutenant general was revived and conferred upon him. All the armies of the United States were now under his command. He was called to Washington, and it is not possible even to mention the honors that were showered upon him. In due time he took his place at the head of the Army of the Potomac, and fought some of the most terrible battles of the war. Richmond was his first objective point, and failing in the direct approach to the capital of the Confederacy, he moved upon it from the south. It was a long struggle, but in the end, Richmond fell. At Appomattox Courthouse, Grant received the surrender of General Lee, granting the most magnanimous terms to the defeated army. The other armies of the Confederacy soon followed the example of the Army of Virginia, and the long and terrible conflict of over four years was ended in a victorious Union. As soon as the surrender was effected, General Grant, without any pomp or parade, proceeded to Washington not even taking in Richmond upon his way, and reported in person to President Lincoln. He advised the immediate reduction of the army, sustained at an enormous expense and no longer needed. The war was ended. 
Perhaps no man ever stood higher in the estimation of his country than Grant, and it was inevitable that he should become a candidate for the presidency. He had been a Democrat in politics before the war, but he was elected to the first office in the nation by the people, though the candidate of the Republican Party. He was hardly as successful in this office as he had been in the field, but he carried with him the respect and admiration of the people to the day of his death. He was re-elected to the presidency, and the objections of the people to a third term more than anything else prevented his third nomination. After his return to private life, he visited nearly every country in Europe, and was everywhere honored as no citizen of the Republic had ever been before. In the last years of his life, he engaged in a financial and banking business by which he lost all his property. About the same time, an insidious disease was wearing away his life. He had been approached before to write a history of his military life, to which he would not listen. In his financial strait, he accepted an offer and wrote the book, in two octavo volumes, while suffering from the weakness and pain of his malady. He was doing it for his family, for his own days were numbered, and there was nothing on record more heroic than his struggle to finish this task. Four days after he had finished his literary labor of love, he died of the disease which had been the burden of his last days. He passed away at Mount McGregor, New York, July 23, 1885. The loyal people mourned him as the savior of the nation from disruption, and even those who had been his enemies in war were his friends in death. The whole nation was present in spirit at his obsequies. His remains were interred at Riverside Park, New York, and only await the imposing monument which the metropolis of the nation he saved is to rear above his tomb. His character can never be as prominent as the victories he won for his imperiled country, but his honesty, his unsullied honor, and his self-abnegation entitle him to another crown of glory. End of section 23section 24 of great men and famous women volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org great men and famous women volume 2 by charles f horn william tecumseh sherman by eldridge s brooks 1820 to 1891 Achievement wins applause, and when the steps towards achievement are tinged with mystery, romance, or daring, the applause is irresistible and continuous. So it has come to pass that by the side of Xenophon's masterly retreat of the Ten Thousand, of Cortez's burning his ships at Veracruz, and of Marlborough's bold march through the heart of Germany to the victory at Blenheim, stands Sherman's march to the sea and his Christmas gift of captured Savannah. And yet, this brilliant leader of men had never seen a hostile shot fired until he was 41, and his first battle was the defeat at Bull Run. The march to the sea, upon which Sherman's fame as a soldier so largely rests, was by no means the greatest or most significant of his many achievements. His record as a soldier is filled with examples of his courage, his shrewdness, and his tenacity, while his mingling of gentle ways and grim determination, of restlessness and calm, of forethought, fearlessness, and frankness, make him at once a unique and central figure in the decade of war and reconstruction that forms so important a chapter in the story of the United States of America. William Tecumseh Sherman was born on February 8, 1820, in the town of Lancaster, the county seat of that fair and fertile section known as Fairfield County, in the southern part of the state of Ohio. The busy commonwealth that furnished 300,000 men to the armies of the Union and gave to the Civil War its three greatest generals. For Grant and Sherman were Ohio-born, and Sheridan's boyhood was spent in the same state. But Sherman's ancestors were of stout Puritan stock, dating back almost to the days of the Mayflower. His first American forebearer was a Puritan minister, Reverend John Sherman, 
an emigrant to the Connecticut colony from Essex in England. One of the collateral branches was Roger Sherman, drafter and signer of the Declaration of Independence. The father of the soldier was Judge Sherman of the Ohio Supreme Court. His mother was a Hoyt of New England. William Tecumseh Sherman was the sixth of 11 children, a younger brother being the lad who, later, became Senator John Sherman of Ohio. Judge Sherman, the father of the boys, died in 1829, and William was adopted into the family of Senator Thomas Ewing of Ohio, a resident of Lancaster, and a notable figure in American history, for he was senator and cabinet minister for nearly 40 years. Sherman's training was that of a soldier from boyhood. At 16, he was entered as a cadet at the Military Academy at West Point, from which he graduated in 1840, standing sixth in a class of 42. Engineering was his favorite study, but devotion to his books seems not to have kept him out of mischief. He was not, he himself admitted later, a Sunday school cadet, for his record for behavior being 124 in the Academy Standard, not so very far from the foot. But Grant, it must be remembered, ranked even lower in his behavior record, standing at 149. The 20 years that followed Sherman's graduation from West Point were variously spent. He was commissioned second lieutenant in the 3rd Artillery, July 1, 1840, and ordered to Florida to face the hostile Seminoles. He was promoted to be first lieutenant November 30, 1841, and in 1842 was ordered to Fort Morgan in Alabama. From 1843 to 1846, he was stationed at Fort Moultrie in Charleston Harbor, where the afterward famous Major Robert Anderson was his superior officer, at Bellefontaine, Alabama, and at Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania on recruiting service. When the war with Mexico was declared, Lieutenant Sherman was sent to California, then a debatable land. He reached Monterey Bay by way of the Horn in January 1847 and spent three years in California, returning east as bearer of dispatches to the War Department in 1850. In May 1850, he married Miss Ellen Ewing, daughter of Senator Ewing, then Secretary of the Interior under President Taylor, and in September following, he was commissioned as captain and sent to St. Louis. It was at this time, so Sherman notes in his memoirs, that he felt a great disappointment to think that the war with Mexico was fought to a finish without his having been in it. And he adds, of course, I thought it was the last and only chance in my day, and that my career as a soldier was at an end. It was at an end for a time, for after garrison duty at St. Louis in New Orleans, he resigned from the Army and, in 1853, sought to make his fortune in business. He first went to California as a manager of the San Francisco branch of a St. Louis bank, but the ill success of the enterprise drove him east again in 1857, and he engaged in the banking business in New York City. To this enterprise, however, the famous Panic of 1857 put an early end, and in 1858 he was embarked in the law with an office at Leavenworth, Kansas. This, too, failing to supply sufficient bread and butter, he tried farming in Ohio for a while and then applied for a government position in Washington. Instead of this, however, he secured an appointment as superintendent and professor of engineering in a new military college just started at Alexandria in Louisiana. He entered upon the duties of his position on the 1st of January, 1860, when the mutterings of rebellion were already abroad, and just as he had put the academy into good working order, the war cloud became so black that Sherman, in a manly letter to Governor Moore of Louisiana, declared his intention of maintaining his allegiance to, quote, the old Constitution as long as a fragment of it survives, end quote resigned his office, and returned to Ohio. In April 1861, he accepted the presidency of a St. Louis Street Railway Company. Then Sumter was fired on. The war fever filled the land. Troops were hurried to the front, and Sherman signified to the Secretary of War his desire to serve his country. Quote, 
in the capacity for which I was trained, end quote. On May 14, 1861, he was appointed colonel of the 13th United States Infantry and assigned to inspection duty in Washington under General Scott, the commander-in-chief, and then the real story of his life began. At first, fate seemed to be against him. He was too outspoken and hard-headed to suit the reckless and effusive boasters of those early days of the war, which he insisted would be long and bloody— unless the whole military power of the Republic was put into the field to crush the rebellion before it could grow into a revolution. He was as disgusted as Washington had been in revolutionary times with short-service enlistments and refused point-blank to go to Ohio to enlist, quote, three months men, end quote, saying in his blunt way, quote, you might as well try to put out fire with a squirt gun as expect to put down this rebellion with three months troops, end quote. He was assigned to the command of the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division of McDowell's Army and had his baptism of fire upon the disastrous field of Bull Run, which he has characterized as, quote, one of the best planned and worst fought battles of the war, end quote. That famous skedaddle, as it was the fashion to call it, he frankly admitted in his official report, began among the men of his brigade, and the disorderly retreat speedily became a humiliating rout, which only a few cool-headed officers, such as Colonel Sherman, could check or control. The chagrin over the stampede at Bull Run was so great that the more conscientious Union officers expected to be held responsible for it and duly court-martialed. But to Colonel Sherman's surprise, his superiors saw beyond the demoralization of the moment, and in August 1861, he was made Brigadier General of Volunteers and transferred to the Department of the Cumberland, with headquarters at Louisville, Kentucky. From thenceforth, all his fighting and all his fame was associated with the armies of the West. At once, he saw the desperate condition of affairs in Kentucky, a border state, only to be held for the Union by prompt and decisive measures. He called for reinforcements frequently and emphatically, and when the Secretary of War visited him on a tour of inspection and asked his views of the situation, Sherman paralyzed him by asserting that for the defense of Kentucky, 60,000 men were needed at once and that 200,000 would be necessary there before the war in that state could be ended. This was so out of proportion to the secretary's estimate that Sherman was declared crazy. He was deprived of his command at the front and relegated to a camp of instruction near St. Louis. But so shrewd and correct an observer, so energetic a leader, and so determined a fighter could not long be left in retirement, and in February 1862, General Sherman was ordered to assume command of the forces at Paducah, Kentucky. Desperate fighting soon followed. The Battle of Shiloh, sometimes called Pittsburgh Landing, showed of what stuff the crazy Sherman, as the newspapers had called him, was made. And from Shiloh's bloody field in 1862 to Johnston's surrender at Raleigh in 1865, Sherman's fame rose steadily until it left him one of the three greatest generals of the Civil War and one of the famous commanders of the century. From Shiloh to Raleigh, Sherman stood, in a measure, as Grant's right hand, for even when Grant was hammering away in Virginia, Sherman, by his strategy, shrewdness, and daring in the West, was giving him material support and help. In the three years of fighting, from 1862 to 1865, these events stand prominently out in Sherman's military record. The tenacity with which he held the right of the line at Shiloh, the faithful service he rendered as commander of the left before Vicksburg, his rapid relief of Knoxville, his brilliant capture of Atlanta, his daring and famous march to the sea, and the capture of Savannah, his equally daring march through the Carolinas to the help of Grant, and his final capture of Johnston's army, which was the real close of the war. 
In all these events, the peculiar traits of character that made Sherman so conspicuous a success stood out in bold relief. His coolness in danger, his bravery in action, his daring in devices, his readiness of invention, his electric surprises, his scientific strategy, his ruthlessness in destruction, his courtesy to the conquered, his devotion to his soldiers, his loyalty to his superior in command, his restlessness, his energy, his determination to succeed. These all contributed to the result that made Sherman's army famous the world over and stamped him as the hero of a campaign that, according to military critics, stands alone in the history of modern warfare. His scientific fencing with General Joseph E. Johnston, the Confederate leader, was as masterly as it was effective. He forced his rival from the stand he had taken as warder of the gateways to the South Supply Land, fighting him step by step from Dalton backward to Atlanta and capturing that stronghold of the Confederacy by persistent and desperate fighting. Then, when Atlanta was won, Sherman's ability to cut the Gordian knot as no other man dared was displayed with a special force. Instead of frittering away his precious time by simply holding Atlanta or wasting strength unnecessarily by hunting up a baffled and elusive foe or devoting all his energy to keeping open his long line of communication and supply, he determined to strike a disastrous blow at the Confederacy, swiftly and unexpectedly. Cutting loose from his connection with the West, he would live on the enemy and lay waste the storehouse of the Confederacy. Or, as he expressed it in outlining his plans to General Grant, quote, move through Georgia, smashing things to the sea, end quote. The boldness of this desperate measure at first attracted, as it afterward alarmed, the authorities at Washington. Consent was given and then recalled, but before the recall could reach him, Sherman had acted quickly, fearing the same countermand. Upon receipt of the order consenting to his march, he cut the telegraph wires to the north. Then he burned his bridges, tore up the railroad that connected him with the West, and, with his army reduced to its actual available fighting strength of 60,000 men, with banners streaming, gun barrels glistening in the sun, bands playing, and the men singing lustily, glory, glory, hallelujah, Atlanta was left behind, and Sherman's army set its face eastward and commenced its memorable march to the sea. In two parallel columns, the army of invasion and destruction moved through the fertile land, cutting a swath of desolation 40 miles wide and crippling the Confederacy by dissipating its most cherished resources. For fully a month, the army was practically lost so far as communication with the North was concerned. Then it struck the sea at Savannah, captured that beautiful city, and, in the celebrated dispatch which actually reached President Lincoln on Christmas Eve, General Sherman presented to the president and the country the city of Savannah as a Christmas gift. Savannah taken, the more difficult march northward was determined upon, so as to make a junction with Grant before Richmond and end the war by one final and tremendous stroke. The campaign of the Carolinas, as this northward march was called, was a really greater achievement than the march to the sea, for it was against more formidable natural odds and was done in midwinter. The distance covered from Savannah to Goldsboro in North Carolina was 425 miles. Five large rivers were crossed, three important cities were captured, and the Stars and Stripes were once more flung to the breeze above the ruins of Fort Sumter. And yet, in 50 days from the start, the army reached Goldsboro, in superb order, and concluded what Sherman himself designates as, quote, one of the longest and most important marches ever made by an organized army in a civilized country, end quote. It was a great achievement, but it was without the novelty, the mystery, and the dramatic qualities of the earlier cross-country campaign. And so, 
It has come to pass that the first has been the most famous, and Sherman's march to the sea has gone into history as one of the romances and glories of the War of the Rebellion. The campaign of the Carolinas fitly ended as the march to the sea in victory, and the successes at Averysboro and Burtonville culminated on April 26, 1865, in the surrender near Raleigh of Johnston and the last organized army of the Confederacy. The war was over. Sherman's army marched northward to Washington, where, on May 24, 1865, on the second day of the famous Grand Review, General Sherman and his victorious army marched past the presidential reviewing stand. 65,000 men, says General Sherman, in splendid physique, who had just completed a march of nearly 2,000 miles in a hostile country. Then came the disbandment. Sherman bade his boys goodbye in a ringing farewell order. The men departed to their waiting homes, and the splendid Army of the West was a thing of the past. After the conclusion of the war, General Sherman was, for four years, stationed at St. Louis as commander of the military division of the Mississippi. He was a notable public character with a reputation for bravery that none dare assail and a record as a soldier that made him one of the nation's heroes. He stood next to Grant in position, merit, and popularity. And when, in 1869, General Grant was elected to the presidency, Sherman, who had been named lieutenant general in 1866, was promoted to the vacant post as general of the army with headquarters at Washington. He visited Europe in 1871 to 1872, and both because of his own brilliant record and his official position as head of the American army, he was everywhere received with honor and distinction. Returning home, he wrote his memoirs. They were published in 1875 and stamped him in the opinion of his critics as by far the ablest writer among America's military men. On February 8, 1884, he was placed on the retired list, quote, turned out to grass, end quote, as he expressed it, quote, and told I could spend the rest of my days in peace and retirement, end quote. As an especial mark of the nation's pride in his record, he was, as the order stated, placed upon the retired list of the Army without reduction in his current pay and allowances, and the president in the same order publicly put on record the gratitude of the American people, quote, for the services of incalculable value rendered by General Sherman in the war for the Union, which his great military genius and daring did so much to end, end quote. It was a fitting tribute to the man who had worn the uniform of his country for 40 years, faithful to every trust and equal to every emergency, and who had risen through every grade from a cadetship and a lieutenancy to the proud eminence of General of the Armies of the United States. The 26 years that were his after the close of the great struggle in which he had been one of the central figures were filled with a quiet enjoyment of life and a wide personal popularity. Wherever he went, he was a living hero, welcome and honored as such by the people who owed so much to his wise brain and his unsheathed sword. He could have been President of the United States had he been willing to accept the nomination that was offered him. Instead, he declined with preemptory and characteristic bluntness, and he is, it is believed, the only man who ever did refuse that high office. After his retirement, he made his home first in St. Louis and then in New York, where the last five years of his life were passed and where he speedily became one of the great city's familiar, honored, and notable figures. Here, too, the final call came to him. On February 14, 1891, when he had just passed his 71st birthday, sounded the order, Parade is Dismissed, and Sherman died in his own home in West 71st Street, mourned by an entire nation. He was buried in St. Louis by the side of his wife, who had died in 1890. William Tecumseh Sherman was, in the strictest sense of the word, a soldier. 
His bearing and presence told of camp and uniform. With a military education and military environments, he could not understand and could not calmly brook the cautious conservatism of the civilian, which would often temporize when swift, determined action seemed necessary, and which was often boastful at home and timorous in the field. Able in action, fierce in assault, unerring in judgment, watchful in detail, with a sagacity and foresight that amounted almost to genius and a memory that was marvelous. General Sherman was a great military leader and one who, when the opportunity came, rode straight into fame and reputation. As determined as he was daring, as magnanimous as he was impulsive, as clear-headed as he was energetic, and as gentle-hearted in peace as he was ruthless in war, he was indeed a unique figure in America's history, and, as time goes on, his name will stand as that of one of the great republic's most famous men and most cherished memories. End of section 24「Section 25 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Johnny Wong「Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2 」by Charles F. Horn Philip Henry Sheridan Philip Henry Sheridan 1831 to 1888. Philip Henry Sheridan, Commander in Chief of the United States Army, and the last and most brilliant of the great generals of the North, was born at Albany, New York, March 6, 1831. He had few advantages of early education and training, but in 1848 he obtained a cadetship at West Point. Sheridan's hot blood and impulsive temperament were manifested even in his student days, and a quarrel with a comrade resulted in his suspension for a year. He was consequently unable to graduate in 1852 as he should have done, but in the following year he concluded his studies and was appointed a brevet second lieutenant of infantry. In 1854, he was assigned to the 1st Infantry in Texas, and the same year he received his commission as 2nd Lieutenant of the 4th Infantry. With the latter regiment, he served during the next six years in Washington Territory and Oregon. In the attack upon the Indians at the Cascades, Washington Territory, in April 1856, the United States troops landed under fire and routed and dispersed the enemy at every point. General Scott drew special attention to Sheridan's bravery on this occasion. But it was the great civil war which developed Sheridan's talents, as in the case of many other distinguished officers, and made promotion rapid. The resignation of commanders with southern sympathies and the creation of new regiments secured Sheridan a first lieutenancy in the 4th Infantry in March 1861 and a captaincy in the 13th Infantry in the following May. Yet that memorable year in the history of the United States, quote, brought him little employment and no laurels, close quote. After various minor services, he was commissioned as Colonel of the 2nd Michigan Cavalry on May 25, 1862. He at once engaged with the regiment in Elliott's raid against the railroad, which was destroyed at Boonville. During the month of June, he commanded the 2nd Cavalry Brigade in several skirmishes, and on July 1st gained a brilliant victory at Boonville over a superior cavalry force. His appointment as Brigadier General of Volunteers dated from this action. In the autumn of 1862, Sheridan received the command of the 11th Division of the Army of the Ohio under General Buell. Moving out of Louisville with Buell against Bragg, he took part on October 8th in the stoutly contested Battle of Perryville, where he maneuvered his division with conspicuous skill and effect, holding the key of the northern position 
and using the point to its utmost advantage. At the famous Battle of Murfreesboro, which was one of the bloodiest and most prolonged of the campaign, Sheridan held the key point for several hours in the first day's fighting, quote, displaying superb tactical skill and the greatest gallantry, close quote. After repulsing four desperate assaults, his ammunition unfortunately gave out. He then ordered a bayonet charge and withdrew his lines from the field. But by his obstinate resistance, invaluable time had been gained by his chief, General Rosecrans, to make new dispositions. Sheridan's commission as Major General followed upon these services. From this time, little of interest occurred until September 19th and 20th, 1863, when Sheridan again distinguished himself at the Battle of Chickamauga, rescuing his division from a perilous position. General Thomas was transferred to the command of Rosecrans' besieged army at Chattanooga, and thither General Grant arrived with reinforcements from Vicksburg. Grant was determined to dislodge the southern commander, Bragg, who was posted on Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. Hooker carried Lookout Mountain, and Thomas captured the ridge on November 25th. In the latter operation, Sheridan's division was the first to cross the crest, and it pressed the enemy's rear guard until long after dark, seizing wagons and artillery. By his successful conduct in the West, Sheridan had now thoroughly established his military reputation. Grant, who had now become lieutenant general, established his headquarters in Virginia in March 1864. He was very badly off for an energetic commander of cavalry there and discussed the matter with General Halleck. The latter at once suggested Sheridan, remembering his splendid dash and bravery at Missionary Ridge. Quote, the very man, close quote, exclaimed the laconic Grant. And Sheridan accordingly became commander of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Sheridan's progress during the campaign of 1864 was like a whirlwind. His troops covered the front and flanks of the infantry through the Battle of the Wilderness until May 8th, when the greater part of the force was withdrawn. And next morning, Sheridan started on a raid against the enemy's points of communication with Richmond. Getting within the Confederate lines, he dashed upon the outworks of Richmond itself, where he took 100 prisoners and thence moved to Haxall's Landing, from which point he returned to the Northern Army, having destroyed many miles of railroad track, besides trains and a great quantity of rations, and liberated Union soldiers. This expedition included repulses of the enemy at Beaver Dam and Metal Bridge, and the defeat of the enemy's cavalry at Yellow Tavern, where their best cavalry leader, J.E.B. Stewart, was killed. From May 27th to June 24th, Sheridan was engaged in almost daily engagements and skirmishes, harassing the enemy, and with that good fortune which sometimes attends the most daring soldiers, resisting all attempts to defeat or capture him. The Middle Department and the Department of West Virginia, Washington, and Susquehanna were constituted the, quote, Middle Military Division, close quote, in August 1864, and General Grant put Sheridan in command of the same. He chafed for opportunities of further distinguishing himself and justifying his appointment, but the enemy, under General Early, had been reinforced, and for six weeks Sheridan was kept on the defensive near Harper's Ferry. At length, when Early's forces had been diminished, Sheridan expressed such confidence of success if he were allowed to attack that Grant gave him permission in only two words of instruction, quote, go in, close quote. Sheridan went in, attacking Early with great vigor on September 19th, at the crossing of the Apaquan. After a severe battle, the enemy was routed. Sheridan captured 3,000 prisoners and five guns, and sent early, as he expressed it, quote, whirling through Winchester, close quote. Next day, President Lincoln, on Grant's recommendation, appointed the victorious soldier a brigadier general in the regular army. Taking up the pursuit of early in the Shenandoah Valley, 
Sheridan found him on the 20th, strongly posted on Fisher's Hill, just beyond Strasburg. Quietly moving Crook's command through the wood, he turned the enemy's left on the 22nd and drove him from his stronghold, capturing 16 guns. The losses of Sheridan and those of Early in these two battles were almost precisely equal, being about 5,400 men each. But the northern general had captured many guns and small arms. Sheridan continued the pursuit up the valley, but finding it impracticable to proceed either to Lynchburg or Charlottesville, he returned through the valley, devastating it on his way and rendering it untenable for an enemy's army. By Sheridan's successes, Grant obtained the unobstructed use of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, whereas his defeat would have exposed Maryland and Pennsylvania to invasion. Sheridan's next operations, however, were the most important, as they had become the most renowned in his career. Passing through Strasbourg, he posted his troops on the further bank of Cedar Creek, while he himself, on October 16th, went to Washington in response to a request from Secretary Stanton for consultation. Before the sun rose on the morning of the 19th, Early, who had been reinforced, surprised during a fog at the left of the Union Army and uncovered the position also of the 19th Corps, capturing 24 guns and about 1,400 prisoners. General Wright succeeded in retaining his grasp on the turnpike by moving the 6th Corps to its western side and the cavalry to its eastern, but the whole army in the process had been driven back beyond Middletown. Sheridan was at Winchester at this time, on his return from Washington. Hearing the noise of battle, he dashed up the turnpike with an escort of 20 men, rallying the fugitives on his way, and after a ride of a dozen miles reached the army, where he was received with indescribable enthusiasm. This famous incident gave rise to Buchanan Reed's stirring poem of Sheridan's Ride, now one of the most popular pieces in the repertoires of public readers, both in England and the United States. After the lapse of a few hours spent in preparing his forces, Sheridan ordered an advance, and literally swept the enemy from the field in one of the most overwhelming and decisive engagements of the war. All the lost Union guns were retaken, and 24 Confederate guns and many wagons and stores were captured. Congress passed a vote of thanks to Sheridan and his troops for the, quote, brilliant series of victories in the valley, close quote, and especially the one at Cedar Creek. Sheridan was appointed by the president a major general in the army, quote, for the personal gallantry, military skill, and just confidence in the courage and patriotism of your troops, close quote, as the order expressed it, quote, displayed by you on October 19th, close quote. On February 27th, 1865, Sheridan, with his cavalry, 10,000 strong, moved up the valley, destroying the Virginia Central Railroad, the James River Canal, and immense quantities of supplies, and defeating Early again at Waynesboro. He then made his way toward Grant's army and arrived at the White House on March 19th. In subsequent operations, he acted immediately under General Grant. The final campaign of the war began, and on March 31st, Sheridan was attacked by a heavy force of Lee's infantry under Pickett and Johnson. But on the following day, being reinforced by Warren, he entrapped and completely routed Pickett and Johnson's forces at Five Forks, taking thousands of prisoners. Sheridan displayed great tactical skill and generalship on this occasion, and the decisive battle of Five Forks compelled General Lee to evacuate Petersburg and Richmond. Lee was soon in flight, but Sheridan was speedily on his trail, and far away in the northern van he constantly harassed the enemy. Overtaking the flying army at Sailor's Creek, he captured 16 guns and 400 wagons, and detained the enemy until the 6th Corps could come up, when a combined attack resulted in the capture of more than 6,000 prisoners. 
On April 8th, Sheridan again engaged the Confederates at Appomattox Station. Early on the morning of the 9th, the enemy endeavored to break through, but abandoned the attempt when Sheridan, moving aside, disclosed the infantry behind. Sheridan mounted his men and was about to charge when the white flag betokening surrender was displayed in his front. This brought the war in Virginia to a close, though in Alabama and other districts the conflict continued to a somewhat later period. The Confederate power, however, was broken by the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, which practically ended the Civil War. Sheridan subsequently conducted an expedition into North Carolina. On June 3, 1865, he took command of the Military Division of the Southwest at New Orleans and was appointed to the 5th Military District, Louisiana and Texas, in March 1867. President Johnson being dissatisfied with his administration, relieved him of his appointment during the Reconstruction Troubles in Louisiana and transferred him to the Department of the Missouri. He continued in command until March 4, 1869, when he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General and assigned the command of the Division of the Missouri with headquarters at Chicago. During the Franco-German War of 1870-71, General Sheridan visited Europe and was present as a spectator with the German forces at several celebrated engagements. He was held in high esteem by Prince Bismarck and Count von Molke. After the sanguinary Battle of Gravelot, which Sheridan witnessed, Bismarck returned with the king to pont a mousson and on the evening of the next day, the German chancellor entertained at dinner General Sheridan and his American companions, quote, with whom he talked eagerly in good English, while champagne and porter circulated, close quote. At one point of the Franco-German War, when Bismarck was at Versailles, anxiously desiring a French government with which he could conclude a durable peace, quote, it almost seemed, close quote says Mr. Lowe in his Life of Bismarck, Quote, as if he had no other resource but to pursue the war on the principles laid down by General Sheridan. Close quote. The American soldier had said to the Chancellor, quote, First deal as hard blows at the enemy's soldiers as possible, and then cause so much suffering to the inhabitants of the country that they will long for peace and press their government to make it. Nothing should be left to the people but eyes to see and lament the war, close quote. In 1875, during the political disturbances in Louisiana, General Sheridan was sent to New Orleans, returning to Chicago on quiet being restored. On the retirement of General Sherman in March 1884, he was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the United States. He died August 5, 1888. General Sheridan was the most brilliant cavalry officer whom America has produced. In addition to conspicuous personal bravery, he had an eagle eye for piercing through the designs of an enemy and for detecting at a glance all their weak points. He possessed wonderful energy, remained undepressed in the presence of overwhelming odds, and had a superb confidence in moments of the greatest danger. His career was one of the most romantic and adventurous called forth by the great American civil struggle. End of section 25, read by Johnny Wong, San Bruno, California, April 28, 2021. Section 26 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Phyllis Vincelli. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2 by Charles F. Horn. Section 26. Robert Edmund Lee by General Viscount Wolseley. 1807 to 1870. Robert Lee. 
It is my wish to give a short outline of General Lee's life and to describe him as I saw him in the autumn of 1862, when at the head of proud and victorious troops he smiled at the notion of defeat by any army that could be sent against him. I desire to make known to the reader not only the renowned soldier, whom I believe to have been the greatest of his age, but to give some insight into the character of one whom I have always considered the most perfect man I ever met. As a looker-on, I feel that both parties in the war have so much to be proud of that both can afford to hear what impartial Englishmen, or foreigners, have to say about it. Inflated and bubble reputations were acquired during its progress, few of which will bear the test of time. The idol momentarily set up, often for political reasons, crumbles in time into the dust from which its limbs were perhaps originally molded. To me, however, two figures stand out in that history, towering above all others, both cast in hard metal that will be forever proof against the belittling efforts of all future detractors. One, General Lee, the great soldier. The other, Mr. Lincoln, the far-seeing statesman of iron will, of unflinching determination. Each is a good representative of the genius that characterized his country. As I study the history of the Secession War, there seem to me the two men who influenced it most, and who will be recognized as its greatest heroes when future generations of American historians record its stirring events with impartiality. General Lee came from the class of landed gentry that has furnished England at all times with her most able and distinguished leaders. The first of his family who went to America was Richard Lee, who in 1641 became colonial secretary to the governor of Virginia. The family settled in Westmoreland, one of the most lovely counties in that historic state, and members of it from time to time held high positions in the government. Several of the family distinguished themselves during the War of Independence, among whom was Henry, the father of General Robert E. Lee. He raised a mounted corps known as Lee's Legion, in command of which he obtained the reputation of being an able and gallant soldier. He was nicknamed by his comrades Light Horse Harry. He was three times governor of his native state. To him is attributed the authorship of the eulogy on General Washington, in which occurs the so often quoted sentence, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen praise that with equal truth might have been subsequently applied to his own distinguished son. The subject of this slight sketch, Robert Edmund Lee, was born January ninth, 1807, at the family place of Stratford in the county of Westmoreland, state of Virginia. When only a few years old, his parents moved to the small town of Alexandria, which is on the right bank of the Potomac River, nearly opposite Washington, but a little below it. He was but a boy of eleven when his father died, leaving his family in straitened circumstances. Like many other great commanders, he was in consequence brought up in comparative poverty, a condition which has been pronounced by the greatest of them as the best training for soldiers. During his early years, he attended a day school near his home in Alexandria. He was thus able, in his leisure hours, to help his invalid mother in all her household concerns, and to afford her that watchful care which, 
owing to her very delicate health, she so much needed. She was a clever, highly gifted woman, and by her fond care his character was formed and stamped with honest truthfulness. By her he was taught never to forget that he was well born, and that, as a gentleman, honor must be his guiding star through life. It was from her lips he learned his Bible. From her teaching he drank in the sincere belief in revealed religion which he never lost. It was she who imbued her great son with an ineradicable belief in the efficacy of prayer and in the reality of God's interposition in the everyday affairs of the true believer. No son ever returned a mother's love with more heartfelt intensity. She was his idol, and he worshipped her with the deep-seated inborn love which is known only to the son in whom filial affection is strengthened by respect and personal admiration for the woman who bore him. He was her all in all, or, as she described it, he was both son and daughter to her. He watched over her in weary hours of pain, and served her with all that soft tenderness which was such a marked trait in the character of this great, stern leader of men. He seems to have been throughout his boyhood and early youth perfect in disposition, in bearing, and in conduct, a model of all that was noble, honorable, and manly. Of the early life of very few great men can this be said. Many who have left behind the greatest reputation for usefulness, in whom middle age was a model of virtue and perhaps of noble self-denial, began their career in a whirlwind of wild excess. Often again we find that, like Nero, the virtuous youth develops into the middle-aged fiend, who leaves behind him a name to be execrated for all time. It would be difficult to find in history a great man, be he soldier or statesman, with a character so irreproachable throughout his whole life as that which in boyhood, youth, manhood, and to his death distinguished Robert Lee from all contemporaries. He entered the military academy of West Point at the age of 18, where he worked hard, became adjutant of the cadet corps, and finally graduated at the head of his class. There he mastered the theory of war and studied the campaigns of the great masters and that most ancient of all sciences. Whatever he did, even as a boy, he did thoroughly, with order and method. Even at this early age, he was the model Christian gentleman in thought, word, and deed. Careful and exact in the obedience he rendered his superiors, but remarkable for that dignity of deportment which all through his career struck strangers with admiring respect. He left West Point when twenty-two, having gained its highest honors, and at once obtained a commission in the engineers. Two years afterward, he married the granddaughter and heiress of Mrs. Custis, whose second husband had been General Washington but by whom she left no children. It was a great match for a poor subaltern officer, as his wife was heiress to a very extensive property and to a large number of slaves. She was clever, very well educated, and a general favorite. He was handsome, tall, well-made, with a graceful figure and a good writer. His manners were at once easy and captivating. These young people had long known one another, and each was the other's first love. She brought with her as part of her fortune General Washington's beautiful property of Arlington, situated on the picturesque wooded heights that overhang the Potomac River, 
opposite the capital to which the great Washington had given his name. In talking to me of the northern troops, whose conduct in Virginia was then denounced by every local paper, no bitter expression passed his lips, but tears filled his eyes as he referred to the destruction of his place that had been the cherished home of the Father of the United States. He could forgive their cutting down his trees, their wanton conversion of his pleasure grounds into a graveyard, but he could never forget their reckless plunder of all the camp equipment and other relics of General Washington that Arlington House had contained. Robert Lee first saw active service during the American War with Mexico in 1846, where he was wounded and evinced a remarkable talent for war that brought him prominently into notice. He was afterward engaged in operations against hostile Indians and obtained the reputation in the army of being an able officer of great promise. General Scott, then the general of greatest repute in the United States, was especially attracted by the zeal and soldierly instinct of the young captain of engineers and frequently employed him on distant expeditions that required cool nerve, confidence, and plenty of common sense. It is a curious fact that throughout the Mexican War, General Scott, in his dispatches and reports, made frequent mention of three officers, Lee, Beauregard, and McClellan, whose names became household words in America afterward during the great Southern struggle for independence. General Scott had the highest opinion of Lee's military genius, and did not hesitate to ascribe much of his success in Mexico as due to Lee's skill, valor, and undaunted energy. Indeed, subsequently, when the day came that these two men should part, each to take a different side in the horrible contest before them, General Scott is said to have urged Mr. Lincoln's government to secure Lee at any price alleging he would be worth 50,000 men to them. His valuable services were duly recognized at Washington by more than one step of brevet promotion. He obtained the rank of colonel and was given command of a cavalry regiment shortly afterward. I must now pass to the most important epoch of his life, when the southern states left the union and set up a government of their own mr lincoln was in eighteen sixty elected president of the united states in the abolitionist interest both parties were so angry that thoughtful men soon began to see that war alone could end this bitter dispute Shipwreck was before the vessel of state which General Washington had built and guided with so much care during his long and hard-fought contest. Civil war stared the American citizen in the face, and Lee's heart was well-nigh broken at the prospect. Early in 1861, the seven cotton states passed acts declaring their withdrawal from the Union and their establishment of an independent republic under the title of the Confederate States of America. This declaration of independence was in reality a revolution. War alone could ever bring all the states together. Lee viewed this secession with horror. Until the month of April, when Virginia, his own dearly cherished state, joined the Confederacy, he clung fondly to the hope that the gulf which separated the North from the South might yet be bridged over. He believed the dissolution of the Union to be a dire calamity not only for his own country, but for civilization and all mankind. Still, he said, 
a union that can only be maintained by swords and bayonets, and in which strife and civil war are to take the place of brotherly love and kindness, has no charm for me. In common with all Southerners, he firmly believed that each of the old states had a legal and indisputable right, by its individual constitution, and by its act of union, to leave at will the great union into which each had separately entered as a sovereign state. This was with him an article of faith, of which he was as sure as of any divine truths he found in the Bible. This fact must be kept always in mind by those who would rightly understand his character, or the course he pursued in 1861. He loved the Union, for which his father and family in the previous century had fought so hard and done so much but he loved his own state still more. She was the sovereign to whom in the first place he owed allegiance, and whose orders, as expressed through her legally constituted government, he was, he felt, bound in law, in honor, and in love to obey without doubt or hesitation. This belief was the mainspring that kept the Southern Confederacy going, as it was also the cornerstone of its constitution. In April 1861, at Fort Sumter, Charleston Harbor, the first shot was fired in a war that was only ended in April 1865 by the surrender of General Lee's army at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. In duration, it is the longest war waged since the great Napoleon's power was finally crushed at Waterloo. As the heroic struggle of a small population that was cut off from all outside help against a great, populous, and very rich republic, with every market in the world open to it, and to whom all Europe was a recruiting ground, this secession war stands out prominently in the history of the world. When the vast numbers of men put into the field by the northern states and the scale upon which their operations were carried on are duly considered, it must be regarded as a war fully equal in magnitude to the successful invasion of France by Germany in 1870. If the mind be allowed to speculate on the course that events will take in centuries to come, as they flow surely on with varying swiftness to the ocean of the unknown future, the influence which the result of this Confederate war is bound to exercise upon man's future history will seem very great. Think of what a power the reunited states will be in another century, of what it will be in the 21st century of the Christian era. If, as many believe, China is destined to absorb all Asia and then to overrun Europe, may it not be in the possible future that Armageddon, the final contest between heathendom and Christianity may be fought out between China and North America. Had secession been victorious, it is tolerably certain that the United States would have broken up still further, and instead of the present magnificent and English-speaking empire, we should now see in its place a number of small powers with separate interests. Most certainly it was the existence of slavery in the South that gave rise to the bitter antagonism of feeling which led to secession. But it was not to secure emancipation that the North took up arms, although during the progress of the war Mr. Lincoln proclaimed it for the purpose of striking his enemy a serious blow. Lee hated slavery, 
but as he explained to me, he thought it wicked to give freedom suddenly to some millions of people who were incapable of using it with profit to themselves or the state. He assured me he had long intended to gradually give his slaves their liberty. He believed the institution to be a moral and political evil, and more hurtful to the white than to the black man. He had a strong affection for the Negro, but he deprecated any sudden or violent interference on the part of the state between master and slave. Nothing would have induced him to fight for the continuance of slavery. Indeed, he declared that had he owned every slave in the South, he would willingly give them all up if by so doing he could preserve the Union. He was opposed to secession, and to prevent it he would willingly sacrifice everything except honor and duty, which forbade him to desert his state. When in April 1861 she formally and by an act of her legislature left the Union, he resigned his commission in the United States Army with the intention of retiring into private life. He endeavored to choose what was right. Every personal interest bade him throw in his lot with the Union. His property lay so close to Washington that it was certain to be destroyed and swept of every slave as belonging to a rebel. But the die was cast. He forsook everything for principle and the stern duty it entailed. Then came that final temptation which opened out before him a vista of power and importance greater than that which any man since Washington had held in America. General Long's book proves beyond all further doubt that he was offered the post of commander-in-chief of the Federal Army. General Scott, his great friend and leader, whom he loved and respected, then commanding that army, used all his influence to persuade him to throw in his lot with the North, but to no purpose. Nothing would induce him to have any part in the invasion of his own state, much as he abhorred the war into which he felt she was rushing. His love of country, his unselfish patriotism, caused him to relinquish home, fortune, a certain future, in fact everything, for her sake. He was not, however, to remain a spectator of the coming conflict. He was too well known to his countrymen in Virginia as the officer in whom the Federal Army had most confidence. The state of Virginia appointed him Major General and Commander-in-Chief of all her military forces. In open and crowded convention, he formally accepted this position, saying with all that dignity and grace of manner which distinguished him, that he did so trusting in Almighty God and approving conscience and the aid of my fellow citizens. The scene was most impressive. There were present all the leading men of Virginia and representatives of all the first families in a state where great store was attached to gentle birth and where society was very exclusive. General Lee's presence commanded respect, even from strangers, by a calm, self-possessed dignity the like of which I have never seen in other men. Naturally of strong passions, he kept them under perfect control by that iron and determined will of which his expression and his face gave evidence. As this tall, handsome soldier stood before his countrymen, he was the picture of the ideal patriot, unconscious and self-possessed in his strength. He indulged in no theatrical display of feeling. There was in his face and about him that placid resolve which bespoke great confidence in self, and which, in his case, one knows not how, quickly communicated its magnetic influence to others. 
He was then just fifty-four years old, the age of Marlborough when he destroyed the French army at Blenheim. In many ways, and on many points, these two great men much resembled each other. Both were of a dignified and commanding exterior, eminently handsome, with a figure tall, graceful, and erect, while a muscular, square-built frame bespoke great activity of body. The charm of manner, which I have mentioned as very winning in Lee, was possessed in the highest degree by Marlborough. Both, at the outset of their great career of victory, were regarded as essentially national commanders. Both had married young and were faithful husbands and devoted fathers. Both had in all their campaigns the same belief in an ever-watchful providence, in whose help they trusted implicitly, and for whose interposition they prayed at all times. They were gifted with the same military instinct, the same genius for war. The power of fascinating those with whom they were associated, the spell which they cast over their soldiers, who believed almost superstitiously in their certainty of victory, their contempt of danger, their daring courage, constitute a parallel that is difficult to equal between any other two great men of modern times. From the first Lee anticipated a long and bloody struggle, although from the bombastic oratory of self-elected politicians and patriots the people were led to believe that the whole business would be settled in a few weeks. This folly led to a serious evil namely, the enlistment of soldiers for only ninety days. Lee, who understood war, pleaded in favor of the engagement being for the term of war, but he pleaded in vain. To add to his military difficulties, the politicians insisted upon the officers being elected by their men. This was a point which, in describing to me the constitution of his army, Lee most deplored. The formation of an army with the means alone at his disposal was a colossal task. Everything had to be created by this extraordinary man. The South was an agricultural, not a manufacturing country, and the resources of foreign lands were denied it by the blockade of its ports maintained by the fleet of the United States. Lee was a thorough man of business, quick in decision, yet methodical in all he did. He knew what he wanted. He knew what an army should be and how it should be organized, both in a purely military as well as an administrative sense. In about two months, he had created a little army of 50,000 men, animated by a lofty patriotism and courage that made them unconquerable by any similarly constituted army. In another month, this army, at Bull Run, gained a complete victory over the northern invaders, who were driven back across the Potomac like herds of frightened sheep. The Confederates did not follow up their victory at Bull Run. A rapid and daring advance would have given them possession of Washington, their enemy's capital. Political considerations at Richmond were allowed to outweigh the very evident military expediency of reaping a solid advantage from this their first great success. Often afterward, when this attempt to allay the angry feelings of the North against the act of secession had entirely failed, was this action of their political rulers lamented by the Confederate commanders. In this article, to attempt even a sketch of the subsequent military operations is not to be thought of. Both sides fought well, 
and both have such true reason to be proud of their achievements that they can now afford to hear the professional criticisms of their English friends in the same spirit that we Britishers have learned to read of the many defeats inflicted upon our arms by General Washington. As a student of war, I would fain linger over the interesting lessons to be learned from Lee's campaigns. Of the same race as both belligerents, I could with the utmost pleasure dwell upon the many brilliant feats of arms on both sides, but I cannot do so here. The end came at last, when the well-supplied North rich enough to pay recruits, no matter where they came from, a bounty of over five hundred dollars a head, triumphed over an exhausted South, hemmed in on all sides, and even cut off from all communication with the outside world. The desperate, though drawn, battle of Gettysburg was the death knell of Southern independence and General Sherman's splendid but almost unopposed march to the sea showed the world that all further resistance on the part of the Confederate states could only be a profitless waste of blood. In the thirty-five days of fighting near Richmond, which ended the war in 1865, General Grant's army numbered 190,000, that of Lee, only 51,000 men. Every man lost by the former was easily replaced, but an exhausted South could find no more soldiers. The right of self-government, which Washington won and for which Lee fought, was no longer to be a watchword to stir men's blood in the United States. The South was humbled and beaten by its own flesh and blood in the North and it is difficult to know which to admire most, the good sense with which the result was accepted in the so-called Confederate states, or the wise magnanimity displayed by the victors. The wounds are now healed on both sides. Northerners and Southerners are now once more a united people, with a future before them to which no other nation can aspire. If the English-speaking people of the earth cannot all acknowledge the same sovereign, they can, and I am sure they will, at least combine to work in the interests of truth and of peace for the good of mankind. The wise men on both sides of the Atlantic will take care to chase away all passing clouds that may at any time throw even a shadow of dispute or discord between the two great families into which our race is divided. Like all men, Lee had his faults. Like all the greatest of generals, he sometimes made mistakes. His nature shrank with such horror from the dread of wounding the feelings of others that upon occasions he left men in positions of responsibility to which their abilities were not equal. This softness of heart, amiable as that quality may be, amounts to a crime in the man entrusted with the direction of public affairs at critical moments. Lee's devotion to duty and great respect for obedience seem at times to have made him too subservient to those charged with the civil government of his country. He carried out too literally the orders of those whom the Confederate Constitution made his superiors, although he must have known them to be entirely ignorant of the science of war. He appears to have forgotten that he was the great revolutionary chief engaged in a great revolutionary war, that he was no mere leader in a political struggle of parties carried on within the lines of an old, well-established form of government. It was very clear to many at the time, as it will be commonly acknowledged now, that the South could only hope to win under the rule of a military dictator. 
if General Washington had had a Mr. Davis over him, could he have accomplished what he did? It will, I am sure, be news to many that General Lee was given the command over all the Confederate armies a month or two only before the final collapse, and that the military policy of the South was all throughout the war dictated by Mr. Davis as President of the Confederate States. Lee had no power to reward soldiers or to promote officers. It was Mr. Davis who selected the men to command divisions and armies. Is it to be supposed that Cromwell, King William III, Washington, or Napoleon could have succeeded in the revolutions with which their names are identified had they submitted to the will and authority of a politician as Lee did to Mr. Davis? Lee was opposed to the final defense of Richmond that was urged upon him for political, not military reasons. It was a great strategic error. General Grant's large army of men was easily fed and its daily losses easily recruited from a near base, whereas if it had been drawn far into the interior after the little army with which Lee endeavored to protect Richmond, its fighting strength would have been largely reduced by the detachments required to guard a long line of communications through a hostile country. It is profitless, however, to speculate upon what might have been, and the military student must take these campaigns as they were carried out. No fair estimate of Lee as a general can be made by a simple comparison of what he achieved with that which Napoleon, Wellington, or von Moltke accomplished, unless due allowance is made for the difference in the nature of the American armies and of the armies commanded and encountered by those great leaders. They were at the head of perfectly organized, thoroughly trained, and well-disciplined troops, while Lee's soldiers, though gallant and daring to a fault, lacked the military cohesion and efficiency, the trained company leaders, and the educated staff which are only to be found in a regular army of long standing. A trial heat between two jockeys mounted on untrained horses may be interesting, but no one would ever quote the performance as an instance of great racing speed. Who shall ever fathom the depth of Lee's anguish when the bitter end came, and when, beaten down by sheer force of numbers and by absolutely nothing else, he found himself obliged to surrender? The handful of starving men remaining with him laid down their arms, and the proud confederacy ceased to be. Surely the crushing, maddening anguish of awful sorrow is only known to the leader who has so failed to accomplish some lofty, some noble aim for which he has long striven with might and main, with heart and soul, in the interests of king or of country. A smiling face a cheerful mien may conceal the sore place from the eyes, possibly even from the knowledge of his friends, but there is no healing for such a wound which eats into the very heart of him who has once received it. General Lee survived the destruction of the Confederacy for five years when, at the age of sixty-three, and surrounded by his family, life ebbed slowly from him. Where else in history is a great man to be found whose whole life was one such blameless record of duty nobly done? It was consistent in all its parts, complete in all its relations. The most perfect gentleman of a state, long celebrated for its chivalry, he was just, gentle, and generous, and childlike in the simplicity of his character. 
never elated with success, he bore reverse and at last complete overthrow with dignified resignation. Throughout this long and cruel struggle, his was all the responsibility, but not the power that should have accompanied it. The fierce light which beats upon the throne is as that of a rushlight in comparison with the electric glare which our newspapers now focus upon the public man in Lee's position. His character has been subjected to that ordeal, and who can point to any spot upon it? His clear sound judgment, personal courage, untiring activity, genius for war, and absolute devotion to his state mark him out as a public man, as a patriot to be forever remembered by all Americans. His amiability of disposition, deep sympathy with those in pain or sorrow, his love for children, nice sense of personal honor and genial courtesy endeared him to all his friends. I shall never forget his sweet winning smile, nor his clear, honest eyes that seemed to look into your brain. I have met many of the great men of my time, but Lee alone impressed me with the feeling that I was in the presence of a man who was cast in a grander mold and made of different and of finer metal than all other men. He is stamped upon my memory as being a part and superior to all others in every way, a man with whom none I ever knew, and very few of whom I have read, are worthy to be classed. I have met but two men who realize my ideas of what a true hero should be. My friend Charles Gordon was one, General Lee was the other. The following beautiful letter was written by Lee to his son in 1860. You must study to be frank with the world. Frankness is the child of honesty and courage. Say just what you mean to do on every occasion, and take it for granted you mean to do right. If a friend asks a favor, you should grant it, if it is reasonable. If not, Tell him plainly why you cannot. You will wrong him and wrong yourself by equivocation of any kind. Never do a wrong thing to make a friend or keep one. The man who requires you to do so is dearly purchased at a sacrifice. Deal kindly but firmly with all your classmates. You will find it the policy which wears best. Above all, do not appear to others what you are not. If you have any fault to find with anyone, tell him, not others, of what you complain. There is no more dangerous experiment than that of undertaking to be one thing before a man's face and another behind his back. We should live, act, and say nothing to the injury of anyone. It is not only best as a matter of principle, but it is the path to peace and honor. In regard to duty, let me, in conclusion of this hasty letter, inform you that nearly a hundred years ago there was a day of remarkable gloom and darkness, still known as the Dark Day a day when the light of the sun was slowly extinguished as if by an eclipse. The legislature of Connecticut was in session, and as its members saw the unexpected and unaccountable darkness coming on, they shared in the general awe and terror. It was supposed by many that the last day, the day of judgment, had come. Someone, in their consternation of the hour, moved an adjournment. Then there arose an old Puritan legislator, Davenport of Stamford, and said that, if the last day had come, 
he desired to be found at his place doing his duty, and therefore moved that candles be brought in so that the house could proceed with its duty. There was quietness in that man's mind, the quietness of heavenly wisdom and inflexible willingness to obey present duty. Duty, then, is the sublimest word in our language. Do your duty in all things like the old Puritan. You cannot do more. You should never wish to do less. Never let me and your mother wear one gray hair for any lack of duty on your part. End of section 26 Section 27 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Johnny Wong. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Thomas Jonathan Jackson by Marion Harland, 1826-1863 to In 1842, a young man from Lewis County, Virginia, dropped discouraged out of his class in West Point after a few weeks' trial of drill and curriculum and returned home. The story of his defeat was canvassed freely in the neighborhood smithy, the headquarters of provincial gossip, and was under discussion one May day, while Cummins Jackson, a planter and bachelor, waited to have a horse shod. "'There's a chance for Tom Jackson,' observed the blacksmith, with friendly officiousness. The early life of Cummins Jackson's nephew was well known to speaker and bystanders. Left an orphan at seven years of age, he, with his brother older than himself, and their little sister, were thrown upon the charity of uncles and aunts. Tom was accounted steady and industrious, yet there was a serious break in his record. The brothers had run away to seek their fortunes in company when Warren was fourteen, Tom but twelve years old, going down the Ohio to the Mississippi, and maintaining themselves by cutting wood for passing steamboats until disabled by malarial fever. Thomas took the lead in the juvenile prodigal's return to relatives and in respectability, and was kindly received by his bachelor uncle. Since then, he had worked in Cummins Jackson's mill and upon his farm as diligently as he sought to get an education in the Old Field School nearest to his home. His imagination took fire at his uncle's report of the blacksmith's suggestion. Armed with a letter of introduction signed by leading citizens of the county to the congressman from the district, he went in person to Washington and, through the kindness of the representative, obtained an interview with the Secretary of War. Gruff and heroic with the grit of old Hickory himself was the cabinet officer's opinion of the country lad. He commended him to the West Point Board of Examiners in terms that secured him admission to the military academy in spite of certain grave deficiencies in his early education. The story of the wrestle with these and other disabilities during the next four years is interesting and instructive. Three extracts from a list of rules for his personal conduct set down at this time in a private notebook sound the keynote of his subsequent career. Quote, Sacrifice your life rather than your word. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. You may be whatever you resolve to be. End quote. He was respected by all his classmates, known and liked by a few. He was too reserved by nature, too busy in practice to be a general favorite. His labors were unremitting, his recreations few and simple. With no prevision of the destinies awaiting them, Jackson, McClellan, A.T. Hill, Reno, Pickett, 
Foster, and Maury, as beardless boys, studied and were drilled side by side for four terms, and were graduated upon the same day. There were seventy in this remarkable class, and the name of Thomas Jonathan Jackson stood seventeenth upon the roll of merit. If we had to stay here one year more, old Jack would be at the head, the witnesses of the fierce ordeal of his West Point training used to say. The class of 46 was ordered forthwith to the seat of war in Mexico. Jackson's first engagement was the siege of Veracruz, his next the Battle of Churubusco. The official report of this last mentions him favorably. As second lieutenant, he was called upon early in the action to take the place of the next in rank above him, the first lieutenant having fallen in the charge. After the battle, Jackson was further promoted to the rank of brevet captain. His devotion, industry, talent, and gallantry were noted officially after Chapultepec, not only by his colonel, but by generals Pillow and Worth, and by the commander-in-chief, Winfield Scott. What he afterward confessed as the one willful lie he ever told is thus reported by a brother officer. Quote, Lieutenant Jackson's section of Magruder's battery was subjected to a plunging fire from the castle of Chapultepec. Horses were killed or disabled, and the men deserted the guns and sought shelter behind wall or embankment. Lieutenant Jackson remained at the guns, walking back and forth, and kept saying, See, there is no danger. I am not hit. While standing with his legs wide apart, a cannonball passed between them. No other officer in the army in Mexico was promoted so often for meritorious conduct or made so great a stride in rank, end quote. After peace was declared in 1848, he was stationed for two years at Fort Hamilton and six months at Fort Meade in Florida. In 1851, he was elected Professor of Natural and Environmental Philosophy and Artillery Tactics in the Virginia Military Institute, situated in Lexington, Virginia. In the decade succeeding this event, he was to the casual eye the least striking figure in the group of professors who taught the art of war in the beautiful mountain girt, West Point of the South. I should have said that he was the least likely of our family to make a noise in the world, said his sister-in-law in 1862, when the popular voice was ranking him with Bayard, Roland, Sidney, and Napoleon. I knew that what I willed to do, I could do, he had said of his recovery from physical weaknesses, which made his acceptance of the Lexington professorship of doubtful expediency in the judgment of friends. He never willed to be eloquent in the lecture room or brilliant in society in his life as teacher, church official, and neighbor. There was no evidence of the personal magnetism which was to make him the soul and genius of the Confederate Army. While carrying into every detail of daily existence the military law of system and fidelity, he was aggressive in nothing. The grave, quiet gentleman who was never late in class, never negligent of the minutest professional duty, who was always punctual at religious services, and never missed a meeting of the faculty of the BMI or of the deacons of the Presbyterian Church, was reckoned a good Christian and upright citizen, exemplary in domestic and social relations, perhaps a trifle ultra-conscientious in some particulars. But for the prevalency of orthodoxy in the valley, he would have been considered eccentric in his religious views and practice. He established a Sunday school for the Negroes and superintended it in person. He gave a tenth of his substance to the church. He weighed his lightest utterances in the balances of the sanctuary. He would not pick up an apple in a neighbor's orchard unless he had permission to take it. He never wrote or read letters on Sunday, or mailed one that must travel on that day to reach its destination, used neither tobacco, tea, nor coffee, and during the war was more afraid of a glass of wine 
than of federal bullets. His reverence for women was deep and unfeigned. He was gentleness itself to little children, bowed down before the oary head, and never sank the lover in the husband. All that he had and all he was belonged first to God, then to his wife. Quote, his person was tall, erect, and muscular. His bearing was peculiarly English, and in the somewhat free society of America was regarded as constrained. Every movement was quick and decisive. His articulation was rapid, but distinct and emphatic, and often made the impression of curtness. He practiced a military exactness in all the courtesies of society. His brow was fair and expansive, his eyes blue-gray, large and expressive, his nose Roman and well-chiseled, his cheeks were ruddy and sunburned, his mouth firm and full of meaning, his beard was brown, end quote is a pen picture drawn by a brother officer. On December 2, 1859, a corps of cadets was sent to Charlestown, Virginia, to secure law and order during the execution of John Brown. Major Jackson's graphic description of the scene in a letter to his wife contains this passage. Quote, I was much impressed with the thought that before me stood a man in the full vigor of health, who must in a few moments enter eternity. I sent up the petition that he might be saved. End quote. An officer upon duty, he saw the terrible spectacle with Cromwellian composure, but the man behind the impressive mask was upon his knees in prayer for the human soul. Under date of January 21, 1860, he writes, quote, Viewing things at Washington from human appearances, we have great reason for alarm, but my trust is in God. I cannot think that he will permit the madness of men to interfere so materially with the Christian labors of this country at home and abroad. End quote. She who, of all the world, knew him best, records, quote, He never was a secessionist and maintained that it was better for the South to fight for her rights in the Union than out of it. At this time, March 16, 1861, he was strongly for the Union, at the same time, he was a firm states' rights man. End quote. At dawn, April 21st, he received an order from the governor of Virginia to report to him immediately at Richmond, bringing the Corps of Cadets with him. At 1 o'clock p.m., he bade a final farewell to home and Lexington. On June 4th, he writes incidentally to his little one from Harper's Ferry, quote, The troops here have been divided into brigades, and the Virginia forces under General Johnston constitute the 1st Brigade, of which I am in command, end quote. This brigade was to share with the commanding officers the sobriquet by which he is known better than under his real name. In the battery attached to it were 49 graduates of colleges besides 19 divinity students. From the first victory of Manassas, June 21, 1861, when General B., turned the tide of battle by shouting to the wavering lines, Look at Jackson, standing like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. To the fatal blunder of May 2, 1863, Stonewall Jackson was the flashing star that guided the Confederate armies to glorious success. His faith in the God of armies was so blended with the conviction that he was a chosen instrument in the omnipotent hand to repel invasion and secure an honorable peace for his beloved state that his sublime confidence infused officers and men. A fragment of a camp ballad, popular in 1862, will give a faint idea of the enthusiasm excited by the praying fighter. Silence, ground arms, kneel all, caps off, old blue lights going to pray, strangle the fool that dares to scoff, attention, tis his way, Appealing from his native sod, in forma pauperis, to God. Lay bare thine arm, stretch forth thy rod. Amen. That's Stonewall's way. Love letters to his only sweetheart, written in camp, in the saddle, from smoking battlefields, red with the blood of the slain, 
reveal a heart as tender as it was stout, faith that never failed, the courage of a lion, the unspoiled simplicity of a child. Our last extract from War Papers is significant of what might have been but for the fall of the South's greatest chieftain at the most critical period of the struggle. Quote, Jackson alone stands forth the one advocate of ceaseless invasion as our safest hope, the first conviction of his mind and a policy in accord with Southern feeling, end quote. Mrs. Jackson joined her husband at his quarters near Fredericksburg, bringing with her the baby girl he had never seen until then, on April 20th, 1863. On the 23rd, the little one, held in the proud father's arms, was baptized by the regimental chaplain. Nine golden days followed the reunion of the loving family before Hooker crossed the Rappahannock in force. Wife and baby were hurried off to Richmond after a hasty tender adieu, and the Battle of Chancellorville began. From the opening of this campaign, says Jackson's biographer, it was observed that a wondrous change came over him. From the quiet, patient, but arduous laborer over his daily tasks, he seemed transformed into a thunderbolt of war. During the three awful days of Chancellorville, the thunderbolt seemed omnipresent to the Confederate soldiers, oftenest in the hottest of the fight, always where he was most sorely needed. On the afternoon of May 2nd, in making his way from one part of the field to another with his staff and couriers, they were mistaken for Federal cavalry, and a volley of musketry was poured in upon them, wounding General Jackson mortally. On the way to the rear, a second disaster overtook the doomed band. A Federal battery opened a fire across the road, and the devoted attendants, laying the wounded chief in a shallow ditch, covered him with their own bodies, while the tempest of shot tore up the earth on all sides of them. The danger was averted by a change in the range of the guns, and the mournful march was resumed. Meeting a North Carolina general who feared, in reply to Jackson's eager questions, that his troops could not maintain their position, the hero spoke out in the accustomed tone of command. You must hold your ground, General Pander. You must hold your ground, sir. It was his last military order. Some hours later, he lay in his tent, weak from pain and loss of blood, one arm gone and his other wounds dressed, when a messenger arrived in haste from General J.E.B. Stewart, relating that he was contending against fearful odds in the field and asking for counsel from the friend who would never more ride forth at his side. At the tidings of Stuart's extremity, General Jackson aroused himself to interrogate the bearer of the message, query succeeding query with characteristic impetuosity. Suddenly the martial fire faded ashily, his eyes dulled into mournfulness. I don't know, I can't tell, as if groping for thought or words. Tell General Stuart to do what he thinks best. The resolve he and others had thought invincible, the iron nerve that had not quivered in the shock of fifty engagements, failed him. Yet he rallied as the cannonading jarred his bed and insisted upon receiving reports from hour to hour. Good, good, he ejaculated when told how his own brigade was behaving. The men will some day be proud to say to their children, I was one of the Stonewall Brigade. The name belongs to them, not me. It was their steadfast heroism at first Manassas that earned it. They are a noble body of men. His wife and child were recalled in season to be with him for two days, immediately preceding his death. Although confident up to the dawn of his last day on earth that God still had work for him to do and would raise him up to do it, he received the news of his approaching disillusion with perfect calmness. He preferred the will of God to his own. He would be infinitely the gainer by the translation from earth to heaven. He gave his wife instructions as to his burial and her future home, smiled radiantly in murmuring, Little darling, sweet one, 
as the baby he had named for his mother was lifted for the father's last kiss. Jackson must recover, General Lee had exclaimed upon hearing of his condition. God will not take him from us now that we need him so much. Say to him that he has lost his left arm. I, my right, men who had not flinched when brought face to face with death that menaced themselves, bowed to the earth, weeping like women, as mortal weakness stole upon the strong right arm of the Confederacy. Without the tent, the whole army was praying for him, while incoherent sentences of command and inarticulate murmurings fell from his lips, fainter with each utterance. The watchers thought speech and consciousness gone forever, when the voice that had pealed like the blast of Roland in charge and rally sounded through the hushed chamber, sweet, distinct, and full of cheer, but in dreamy inflections. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Forced march and midnight raid and mad rush of battle were over. Victorious great heart slept upon the field. End of section 27. Read by Johnny Wong, San Bruno, California, May 17, 2021. Section 28 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Fascio. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. David Glasgow Farragut, by L. P. Brockett, A.M. 1801-1870. to 1870. Heroes have not been wanting in the history of maritime warfare, at any time in these last three hundred years. Holland points with pride to her gallant de Ruyter and Van Tromp, who made the little republic among the marshes and canals that yield tribute to the Zyder Zee, the famous the world over. England glories in her Blake, her Collingwood, and most of all in her Nelson, the model naval hero of all her history. And we cannot suppress our admiration of the daring of the reckless John Paul Jones, the matchless patriotism of Lawrence, and the gallant bearing and extraordinary success of Perry, Bainbridge, Decatur, and the Elder Porter, while in the War of the Rebellion the heroic Foote, DuPont, Winslow, D.D. Porter, and Rogers covered their names with glory. But among all these illustrious names there is none which so thoroughly awakens our enthusiasm, or so readily calls forth our applause, as that of Farragut. With all of Nelson's courage and daring, he had more than his executive ability and fertility of resource, a wider and more generous intellectual culture, and a more unblemished, naive, frank, and gentle character. He bore in his veins some traces of the best blood of Spain. His father, George Farragut, having been a native of Citadella, the capital of the island of Menorca, and a descendant of an ancient and honorable Catalonian family. The father came to this country in 1776, and united most heartily in our struggle for independence, attaining during the war the rank of major. After the conclusion of the war, Major Farragut married Miss Elizabeth Shine of North Carolina, a descendant of the old Scotch family of McEvan, and settled as a farmer at Campbell Station, near Knoxville, Tennessee. Here, on July 5, 1801, his illustrious son was born. The father seems to have been not altogether contented with the farmer's life in that mountainous region, for not long after we hear of him as a sailing master in the Navy, and an intimate friend of the father of Commodore David D. Porter, who then held a similar rank. Young Farragut inherited his father's love for the sea, and though brought up so far inland, among the Cumberland Mountains, he had hardly reached the age of nine and a half years, when the longing for a sailor's life possessed him so strongly that his father consented, and after some little delay, a midshipman's warrant was procured for him. His first cruise was under the command of Captain then Master Commandant Porter, who, in July 1812, was promoted to the rank of captain, and soon after sailed in the Essex for the South American coast and the Pacific. To this famous frigate the young midshipman was ordered before her departure, and he remained on her through the eventful two years that followed, when she drove the British commerce out of the Pacific. 
when, on March 28, 1814, the British frigate Phoebe, 36 guns, and sloop of war Cherub, 28 guns, without scruple attacked the Essex in the harbor of Valparaiso, in violation of the rights of a neutral nation. There ensued one of the fiercest naval battles on record. Though fighting against hopeless odds, the two British vessels having twice the number of guns and men of the Essex, Commodore Porter, with the reckless daring which so marked a trait of his character, refused to strike his colors till his ship had been three or four times on fire, and was in a sinking condition, with her rigging shot away, the flames threatening her magazine, and 152 out of her crew of 255 killed, wounded, or missing. The battle had lasted two and a half years. On his surrender, the Essex Jr., a whaling ship which he had converted into a sloop of war, but which had been unable to take any part in the battle, was sent home with the prisoners on parole. The young midshipman, then a boy under 13, was in the hottest of the fight and was slightly wounded during the action. Before the loss of the Essex, he had served as acting lieutenant on board the Atlantic, an armed prize. On his return to the United States, Commodore Porter placed him at school at Chester, Pennsylvania, where he was taught, among other studies, the elements of military and naval tactics. But in 1816, he was again afloat and on board the flagship of the Mediterranean Squadron, where he had the good fortune to meet in the chaplain, Reverend Charles Folsom, an instructor to whom he became ardently attached, and to whose teachings he attributed much of his subsequent usefulness and success. This pleasant period of instruction passed all too quickly, and the boy, now grown to a man's estate, after some further service in the Mediterranean, was, on January 1st, 1821, at the age of nineteen and a half years, promoted to the rank of lieutenant, and ordered to duty on the West India Station. In 1824, he was assigned to duty at the Norfolk Navy Yard, and with the exception of a two years' cruise in the Vandalia, on the Brazil Station, remained in Norfolk till 1833. There he married a lady of highly respectable family, and during the long years of suffering through which she was called to pass, from a hopeless physical malady, he proved one of the most tender and affectionate of husbands, never wearying of administering all the relief and comfort to the sufferer in his power. When death at last terminated her protracted distress, he mourned her tenderly and long. He subsequently married another lady of Norfolk, Miss Virginia Loyal, the daughter of one of the most eminent citizens of that city. In 1860, he had spent nearly 19 years afloat, 18 years and 4 months on shore duty, and 10 years and 10 months either waiting orders or on leave of absence. 48 of his 58 years had been spent in the naval service. In April 1861 came the rebellion. Captain Farragut was at his home in Norfolk, surrounded by those who were sympathizers with the rebellion, and who were already maturing plans for the seizure of the government property and its conversion to rebel uses. No more loyal heart ever beat than his, and in frank and manly terms he denounced the whole proceedings of the traitors, and gave expression to his abhorrence of them. This roused all the hatred of the plotters of treason, and they told him at once, in tones of menace, that he could not be permitted to live there if he held such sentiments. Very well, was his prompt reply. Then I will go where I can live and hold such sentiments. Returning to his home, he informed his family that they must leave Norfolk for New York in a few hours. They immediately made their preparations, and the next morning, April 18, 1861, bid adieu to Norfolk. The Navy Department was, however, anxious to give him employment, and in default of anything else, he served for a time as a member of the Naval Retiring Board, which shelved the incompetent officers of the Navy and promoted the active, loyal, and deserving. Meantime, the government had resolved on the capture of New Orleans and entered with zeal upon the work of fitting out a squadron, as well as an army, for its reduction. The squadron was to consist of a fleet of armed steamers and 20 bomb schooners, each carrying gigantic mortars, 15-inch shells. The bomb fleet was to be under the command of Commander David D. Porter, but he was to report to Flag Officer Farragut, who was to have charge of the entire squadron. Selecting the Hartford as his flagship, and having made all possible preparations for his expedition, Flag Officer Farragut received his orders on January 20, 1862, and on February 3rd sailed from Hampton Roads. 
Arriving at Ship Island on February 20th, he organized the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, and in spite of difficulties of all sorts, the delay in forwarding coal, naval stores, hospital stores, ammunition, etc., the labor of getting vessels drawing 22 feet over the bars at Pass de Loutre and Southwest Pass, where the depth was but 12 and 15 feet, the ignorance and stupidity of some of the officers, and every other obstacle he had to encounter, made steady progress. The difficulties were not all surmounted until April 18th, when the bombardment of Fort Jackson, the lowermost of the two forts defending the passage of the Mississippi, was commenced. These forts were 75 miles below New Orleans and possessed great strength. A continuous bombardment was maintained for six days, by which the forts were considerably damaged, but they still held out stoutly. A heavy iron chain had been stretched across the river, supported by large logs, to obstruct the passage of vessels, and was placed at a point where the fire of the two forts could be most effectively concentrated. Above this chain lay the rebel fleet of sixteen gunboats and two ironclad rams. Along the banks of the river were land batteries, mounting several guns each. Finding that the forts were not likely to yield to the bombardment, Flag Officer Farragut called a council of war, and after hearing their opinions, which were somewhat discordant, issued his general order of April 20th, in which the spirit of the hero gleams out. This was his language. Quote, the flag officer, having heard all the opinions expressed by the different commanders, is of the opinion that whatever is to be done will have to be done quickly. When, in the opinion of the flag officer, the propitious time has arrived, the signal will be made to weigh and advance to the conflict. He will make the signal for close action and abide the result. Conquer or be conquered. Unquote. After further and severe bombardment of the forts, the flag officer gave notice to the steam vessels of the squadron of his determination to break the chain and run past the forts, engage the rebel fleet, and having defeated it, ascend the river to New Orleans and capture that city. It was a most daring movement. The chain had previously been broken, and the mortar vessels moved up and anchored ready to pour in their fire as soon as the forts could open. The steam fleet moved up in two columns, one led by Flag Officer Farragut in person in the Hartford, the other by Captain Theodorus Bailey as second in command in the Cayuga. The left column, Farragut's, was composed of the Hartford, Brooklyn, Richmond, Sciota, Iroquois, Kennebec, Pinola, Itasca, and Winona. The right, Bailey's, of the Cayuga, Pensacola, Mississippi, Oneida, Varuna, Katandin, Kineo, and Wissahickon. The right column was to engage Fort St. Philip, the left Fort Jackson. The fleet were fairly abreast of the forts before they were discovered, and fire opened upon them. But from that moment the firing was terrible, and the smoke, setting down like a pall upon the river, produced intense darkness, and the ships could only aim at the flash from the forts. The forts at the flash from the ships. A fire raft, pushed by the ram Manassas against the flagship, the Hartford, set it on fire, and at the same instant it ran aground. But by the prompt and disciplined exertions of the men, the flame was extinguished in a few minutes, and the ship got afloat, never ceasing its fire upon the enemy. At times the gunboats passed so near the forts as to be able to throw their broadsides of shrapnel, grape, and canister with most destructive force into their interior, and the forts, in the endeavor to depress their guns sufficiently to strike the vessels, lost their shot, which rolled into the ditches. They were nearly past the forts when the rebel fleet came down upon them, the ironclad ram Manassas among them. Several of these gunboats were ironclad about the bow and had iron beaks or spurs. The Cayuga, Captain Bailey's flagship, was the first to encounter these, and soon after the Varuna, commanded by Captain Boggs, found itself in a nest of rebel steamers, and moved forward, delivering its broadsides, port and starboard, with fearful precision into its antagonists, four of which were speedily disabled and sunk by its fire. The Varuna was finally attacked by the Morgan and another rebel gunboat, both ironclad at the bow, which crushed in her sides. But crowding her steam, she drew them on, while still fast, and poured broadsides into both which drove them ashore crippled and in flames. 
running his own steamer on shore as speedily as possible, the gallant Boggs fought her as long as his guns were out of water, and then brought off his men, who were taken on board the Oneida and other gunboats of the fleet. Several of the gunboats were considerably injured, but none of them lost except the Veruna. The Itasca, Winona, and Kennebec were disabled and obliged to fall back. Thirteen of the seventeen vessels composing Flag Officer Farragut's squadron were able to pass in safety these forts, and had defeated a rebel fleet, destroying thirteen of their gunboats and rams, and the ironclad Manassas, and compelling the remainder to shelter themselves under the guns of the forts. The entire loss of the Union squadron was but thirty-six killed and one hundred and thirty-five wounded. The gallant flag officer now ascended the river, encountering slight opposition from the Chalmette batteries, and about three miles below New Orleans. But they were silenced in twenty minutes, and at noon of April 25th he lay in front of the city and demanded its surrender. Four days later the forts were surrendered to Captain Porter, and General Butler came up the river to arrange for landing his troops and taking possession of the conquered city. Meantime, Farragut had ascended the river above the city to Carrollton, where had been erected some strong works to oppose the progress of Flag Officer Foote, should he descend the river. These, on the approach of the gunboats, were abandoned, and their guns spiked. They were destroyed. New Orleans being safely in the possession of Union forces, Flag Officer Farragut ascended the Mississippi, and on June 27th ran his vessels safely past the rebel batteries at Vicksburg, and communicated with Flag Officer Davis, then commanding the Mississippi Squadron, and arranged for a joint attack upon Vicksburg. The attack failed because the bluffs at Vicksburg were too high to be effectively bombarded by the gunboats, and the capture of the city required the cooperation of a land force. He therefore repassed the batteries in safety on July 15th, and descending the river, made Pensacola the headquarters of his squadron. On July 11th, the rank of Rear Admiral having been created in accordance with the recommendation of a committee of Congress, Captain Farragut was advanced to that rank, and placed first on the list for his meritorious conduct in the capture of New Orleans. He also received the thanks of both houses of Congress. In autumn of 1862, he directed the naval attacks on Corpus Christi, Sabine Pass, and Galveston, which resulted in the capture of those points. In his duties as the commander of a blockading and guarding squadron, there was much of detail. Attacks of guerrillas along the river shores to be parried and punished. Surprises of the weaker vessels of the squadron to be chastised and revenged. Expeditions against rebel towns on or near the coast to be aided and sustained. And careful lookout to be kept for blockade runners who sought their opportunities to slip into the ports of Mobile, Galveston, and Aransas. These occupied much of his time during the autumn and winter of 1862-1863. The Admiral had long desired to attack the defenses of Mobile, and thus effectually check the blockade running, which it was impossible wholly to prevent while that port was left unmolested. But it was not until August 5, 1864, that the assault was finally made. The fleet, which was to take part in the attack, consisted of 14 sloops of war and gunboats and four ironclad monitors. The Admiral arranged them for the attack as follows. The Brooklyn and Octoria were lashed together, the Brooklyn being on the starboard side, nearest Fort Morgan, the Brooklyn being, much against the Admiral's wishes, allowed the lead. Next, the Hartford and Metacomet, followed by the Richmond and Port Royal, the Lackawanna and Seminole the Monongahela and Kennebec, the Ossipee and Itasca, and the Oneida and Galena. The four monitors were arranged in the following order, to the right or starboard of the gunboats. The Tecumseh, Commander T.R.M. Craven, taking the lead, and followed by the Manhattan, Commander Nicholson, the Winnebago, Commander Stevens, and the Chickasaw, Lieutenant Commander Perkins. The rebels, in addition to three forts, all manned with large garrisons, had a squadron consisting of the ironclad Ram Tennessee, regarded by them as the most formidable armed vessel ever constructed, and three powerful gunboats, the Selma, Morgan, and Gaines. The fleet steamed steadily up the channel, the Tecumseh firing the first shot at 6.47 a.m. The rebels opened upon them from Fort Morgan at six minutes past seven, and the Brooklyn replied, after which the action became general. 
The Brooklyn now paused, and for good reason. The Tecumseh, near her, careened suddenly and sank almost instantly, having struck and exploded a torpedo, and her gallant commander and nearly all her crew sank with her. Directing the commander of the Metacomet to send a boat instantly to rescue her crew, Admiral Farragut determined to take the lead in his own flagship, the Hartford, and putting on all steam, led off through a track which had been lined with torpedoes by the rebels. But he says, quote, Believing that, from their having been some time in the water, they were probably innocuous, I determined to take the chance of their explosion. Unquote. Turning to the northwestward, to the clear of the middle ground, the fleet were enabled to keep such a broadside fire on the batteries of Fort Morgan as to prevent them from doing much injury. After they had passed the fort, about ten minutes before eight o'clock, the ram Tennessee dashed out at the Hartford, but the Admiral took no further notice of her than to return her fire. The rebel gunboats were ahead, and annoyed the fleet by a raking fire, and the Admiral detached his consort, the Metacomet, ordering her commander, Lieutenant Commander Jewett, to go in pursuit of the Selma, and the Octoria was detached to pursue one of the others. Lieutenant Commander Jewett captured the Selma, but the other two escaped under the protection of the guns of Fort Morgan though the gains was much injured that she was run ashore and destroyed. The combat which followed between the Tennessee and the Union fleet, and resulted in the surrender of that formidable ironclad vessel, is best described in the Admiral's own words. Quote, Having passed the forts and dispersed the enemy's gunboats, I had ordered most of the vessels to anchor, when I perceived the ram Tennessee standing up for this ship. This was at 45 minutes past 8. I was not long in comprehending his intentions to be the destruction of the flagship. The monitors and such of the wooden vessels, as I thought best adapted for the purpose, were immediately ordered to attack the ram, not only with their guns, but bows on at full speed, and then began one of the fiercest naval combats on record. The Monongahela, Commander Strong, was the first vessel that struck her, and in doing so carried away her own iron prow, together with the cutwater, without apparently doing her adversary much inquiry. The Lackawanna, Captain Marchand, was the next vessel to strike her, which she did at full speed, but though her stem was cut and crushed to the plank ends for the distance of three feet above the water's edge to five feet below, the only perceptible effect on the ram was to give her a heavy list. The Hartford was the third vessel that struck her, but as the Tennessee quickly shifted her helm, the blow was a glancing one, and, as she rasped along our side, we poured our whole port broadside of nine-inch solid shot within ten feet of her casement. The monitors worked slowly, but delivered their fire as opportunity offered. The Chickasaw succeeded in getting under her stern, and a fifteen-inch shot from the Manhattan broke through her iron plating and heavy wooden backing, though the missile itself did not enter the vessel. Immediately after the collision with the flagship, I directed Captain Drayton to bear down for the ram again. He was doing so at full speed, when unfortunately the Lackawanna ran into the Hartford just forward of the mizzenmast, cutting her down to within two feet of the water's edge. We soon got clear again, however, and were fast approaching our adversary when she struck her colors and ran up the white flag. She was at this time sore beset. The Chickasaw was pounding away at her stern, the Ossipee was approaching her at full speed, and the Monongahela, Lackawanna, and this ship were bearing down upon her, determined upon her destruction. Her smokestack had been shot away, her steering chains were gone, compelling a resort to her relieving tackles, and several of her port shutters were jammed. Indeed, from the time the Hartford struck her, until her surrender, she never fired a gun. As the Ossipee, Commander Leroy, was about to strike her, she hoisted the white flag, and that vessel immediately stopped her engine, though not in time to avoid a glancing blow. During this contest with the rebel gunboats and the ram Tennessee, which terminated by her surrender at ten o'clock, we lost many more men than from the fire of the batteries of Fort Morgan. Unquote. The rebel Admiral Buchanan was severely wounded, and subsequently lost a leg by amputation. Admiral Farragut, as humane in his feelings toward a wounded foe as he was gallant and daring in action, immediately addressed a note to Brigadier General Page, the commander of Fort Morgan, 
asking permission to send the rebel admiral and the other wounded rebel officers by ship, under a flag of truce, to the Union hospitals at Pensacola, where they could be tenderly cared for. This request was granted, and the Metacomet dispatched with them. The admiral had stationed himself, quote, in an elevated position in the main rigging near the top, unquote, a place of great peril, but one which enabled him to see much better than if he had been on deck, the progress of the battle, and from thence he witnessed and testified with great gratification to the admirable conduct of the men at their runs throughout the fleet, and in this connection gives utterance to a sentiment which shows most conclusively his sympathy and tenderness. Quote, Although, unquote, he says, quote, No doubt their hearts sickened, as mine did, when their shipmates were struck down beside them, yet there was not a moment's hesitation to lay their comrades aside and spring again to their deadly work. Unquote. It is said that at the moment of the collision between the Hartford and Lackawanna, when the men called to each other to save the admiral, Farragut, finding the ship would float at least long enough to serve his purpose, and thinking of that only, called out to his fleet captain, quote, Go on with speed. Ram her again. Unquote. The results of this victory were the destruction of the rebel fleet, the capture of the armored ship Tennessee, and of 230 rebel officers and men, the abandonment on the next day of Fort Powell with 18 guns, the surrender on the 8th of Fort Gaines with 56 officers, 818 men, and 26 guns, and on August 23rd, after a further bombardment of 24 hours, of Fort Morgan, with 60 guns and 600 prisoners. By these captures, the port of Mobile was hermetically sealed against blockade runners, and a serious blow given to the rebel cause. Rear Admiral Farragut remained in command of the West Gulf Squadron till November 1864, when he requested leave of absence, and was called to Washington for the consultation in regard to future naval operations. Soon after the opening of Congress, a resolution of thanks to him for his brilliant victory of Mobile was passed, and the rank of Vice Admiral, corresponding to that of Lieutenant General in the Army, was created, and on January 1, 1865, David Glasgow Farragut promoted to it. This appointment made him the virtual chief commander of the naval forces of the United States. The West Gulf Blockading Squadron, during all the time Admiral Farragut was in command of it, had had more fighting and less prizes than any other blockading squadron on the coast, and while Admirals Dupont, Lee, Porter, and Dahlgren had accumulated immense fortunes by their shares of prize money, Admiral Farragut had received little beyond his regular pay. The merchants of New York, understanding this and recognizing the great services he had rendered to commence and to the nation, subscribed the sum of $50,000, which was presented to him in United States 7.30 Treasury Notes in January 1865 in testimony of their appreciation of his ability and success as a naval commander. Until 1866, the rank of Vice Admiral was the highest known in the Navy. In July of that year, the Office of Admiral was specially created and bestowed on Farragut. He saw no further important service, but died quietly at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, August 14, 1870. Even the English Army and Navy Gazette speaks of Admiral Farragut as, quote, the doughty admiral whose feats of arms place him at the head of his profession and certainly constitute him the first naval officer of the day as far as actual reputation won by skill, courage, and hard fighting goes, unquote. End of section 28. Section 29 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Johnny Wong. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. David Dixon Porter. David Dixon Porter. 1814 to 1891. Among the coincidences of naval and military command in the War for the Union, the association of the names of Farragut and Porter 
in the important series of operations on the Mississippi has not escaped attention. The former, as the reader has seen in the previous sketch, was introduced to the service in his childhood under the care and protection of Commodore David Porter, and boy as he was, fully shared the adventures and perils of his famous cruise in the Pacific. Nearly 50 years after that event, Captain Farragut, in command of the Department of the Gulf, entered the Mississippi in concert with the son of his old commander of the Essex to vindicate the national honor by the restoration of New Orleans to the Union, a service which was to prove the ability of both officers and lead them to the highest rank known to the naval service of the United States. Looking into the future, Commodore Porter, the hero of the War of 1812, would hardly have dreamt that the, quote, boy midshipman who had been introduced to him at New Orleans would, with two of his own sons, at the end of half a century, receive the highest honors of their country, the reward of the most arduous and perilous services against a domestic foe on the Mississippi, end of quote. Of these sons of Commodore Porter, thus distinguished in this field of duty, William D. Porter, the elder, on more than one occasion in command of the gunboat Essex, recalled not merely the name of his father's vessel, but the courage and patriotism, the spirit and success which had given the old ship her reputation. The younger, David D. Porter, the subject of this notice, born in Philadelphia, entered the Navy as midshipman in the year 1829. His first cruise was in the Mediterranean under Commodore Biddle till 1831. After a year's leave of absence, he returned to that station, which has ever proved in its liberal intercourse with the men of other nations and its undying associations of nature and art, a most important school in the education of the young naval officers of the United States. Having passed his examination in 1835, Young Porter was attached to the Coast Survey Service from 1836 to 1841, when he was promoted to a lieutenancy and was ordered to the Frigate Congress, in which he sailed for four years on the Mediterranean and South American stations. In 1845, we find him attached to the National Observatory at Washington in special service. During the Mexican War which succeeded, he was in charge of the Naval Rendezvous at New Orleans, was subsequently again employed on the Coast Survey, and from 1849 to 1853 was, by permission of the Department, in command of the California mail steamers Panama and Georgia, running from New York to Aspinwall, a rising commercial service of national importance, to which his experience and personal character were of great value. After this, he was in various home services till 1861, when he was promoted to the rank of commander and placed in command of the steam sloop Powhatan, in which he joined the Gulf Blockading Squadron off Pensacola. He had thus, at the outbreak of the rebellion, been 32 years in the service, over 19 of which had been spent at sea and 9 on shore duty. A special service of great importance was presently entrusted to him, when in the beginning of 1862 an expedition was set on foot to open the Mississippi River to New Orleans, he was assigned to the command of a fleet of bomb vessels to cooperate with the squadron of Captain Farragut in that enterprise, a service which he carried out with distinguished ability. After the capture of New Orleans, Commander Porter continued to cooperate with Captain Farragut on the Mississippi, being engaged in the movement on Vicksburg in May. In the following October, he was placed in command of the Mississippi Squadron with the rank of Acting Rear Admiral, and when in the ensuing year operations were actively resumed for the capture of Vicksburg, his squadron, in concert with the victorious army of General Grant, was constantly employed in the most hazardous and honorable service. It was he who forwarded to the Secretary of the Navy at Washington the brief and authoritative announcement, quote, Sir, I have the honor to inform you 
that Vicksburg surrendered to the United States forces on July 4th. End of quote. This was the first bulletin to the country and to the world of this memorable event. Simultaneously with the victory of General Meade over Lee at Gettysburg, it was hailed as the crowning disaster to the rebellion. As a reward for his services on the Mississippi, Porter was promoted to the full rank of Rear Admiral. In December 1864, he commanded the fleet which bombarded Fort Fisher. After a terrific assault, the fort was captured January 13, 1865, and Wilmington, the last Confederate port, was closed. Porter received another, his fourth, vote of thanks from Congress, and in 1866 was made Vice Admiral. On Farragut's death in 1870, he was immediately appointed to succeed him as Admiral, and held the rank until his death on February 13, 1891. End of Section 29 Read by Johnny Wong, San Bruno, California, April 19, 2021. Section 30 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Giuseppe Garibaldi, 1807-1882 Garibaldi has not left the world without some account of his birth, parentage, and early life. Not a little of his great, naive, and enthusiastic character may be studied in those memoirs, of which his eccentric friend, Alexander Dumas, published a free translation. He was born July the 22nd, 1807. He was a native of Nice, a city inhabited by a mongrel race, but himself sprung from a purely Italian family. The name of Garibaldi, common enough throughout North Italy, betokens old Lombard descent. He first saw light, as he states, in the very house and room where, 49 years before, Massena was born. His father, Domenico, had come from Chiavari in the Riviera di Levant. He gives his mother's name Rosa Raguindo. Garibaldi's father and grandfather were seamen, and he took to the sea as his native element, developing great strength and skill as a swimmer, an accomplishment which enabled him to save drowning men on several memorable occasions. For what book learning he had, he seems to have been indebted to the desultory lesson correction. For what book learning he had, he seems to have been indebted to the desultory lessons of priestly schoolmasters under the direction of his mother. Of this latter, he always spoke with great tenderness, acknowledging that to her inspiration he owed his patriotic feelings, and stating that in his greatest dangers by land and sea, his imagination always conjured up the picture of the pious woman prostrated at the feet of the Most High, interceding for the safety of her beloved. In early life he embarked in his father's merchant vessel, a brig, and in that and other craft he made frequent voyages to Odessa, Rome and Constantinople. Soon after the revolutionary movements of 1831, he was at Marseille, where he fell in with Mazzini, busy at that time with the organisation of Young Italy and with the preparations for an invasion of Italy by sea, which, upon Mazzini's expulsion from Marseille, was attempted at Geneva and directed against the Savoy frontier. The Savoy expedition turned out an egregious failure, the blame of which Garibaldi, on Mazzini's statement, throws on the Polish General Ramorino's treachery. Garibaldi himself, who had embarked on board the royal frigate Eurydice to gain possession of that vessel by a mutiny of the crew, being off Genoa, and hearing of a plot to storm the barracks of the Carabinieri, landed in the town to join it. But the attack upon the barracks miscarried, and he, not daring to go back to his ship, 
saw himself irreparably compromised, fled to Nice, and thence crossed the Var and found himself an exile at Marseille. Here he betook himself again to his sea life, sailed for the Black Sea and for Tunis, and at last on board the Nagur of Nantes for Rio de Janeiro. In the commentaries before alluded to, Garibaldi gives the fullest particulars of the exploits by which he rose to distinction beyond the Atlantic during the twelve years elapsing from his leaving Europe in 1836 to his return to Italy in 1848. It is the romance of his career and will some day be wrought into an epic, blending the charms of the Odyssey with those of the Iliad, a battle and a march being the theme of the eventful tale almost from beginning to end. Garibaldi took service with the Republic of Rio Grande do Sul, a vast territory belonging to Brazil, then in open rebellion and war against that empire. He took the command of a privateer's boat with a crew of twelve men, to which he gave the name of Mazzini, and by the aid of which he soon helped himself to a larger and better armed vessel, a prize taken from the enemy. In his many encounters with the imperial or Brazilian party, the hero bought experience both of wonderfully propitious and terribly adverse fortune, and had every imaginable variety of romantic adventure and hair-breadth escapes. He was severely wounded, taken prisoner, and in one instance at Gualigai in the Argentine territory, he found himself in the power of one Leonardo Milan, a type of Spanish Southern American brutality, by whom he was savagely struck in the face with a horsewhip, submitted to several hours rack and torture, and thrown into a dungeon in which his sufferings were soothed by the ministration of that angel of charity, a woman by name Madame Allemand. Escaping from his tormentor by the intervention of the governor of Gualagai, Paolo Equage, Garibaldi crossed from the territory of the Plate into those of the Rio Grande, and faithful to the cause of that republic, he fought with better success, winning battles, storming fortresses, standing his ground with a handful of men, or even single-handed against incredible odds, beating strong squadrons with a few small vessels, giving through all proofs of the rarest disinterestedness, humanity and generosity, disobeying orders to sack and ravage vanquished cities, and exercising that mixture of authority and glamour over his followers, which almost enabled him to dispense with the ties of stern rule and discipline. At last, after losing a flotilla in a hurricane on the coast of Santa Catarina, where he landed wrecked and forlorn, having seen his bravest and most cherished Italian friends shot down or drowned, he fell in with his Anita, not apparently the first fair one for whom he had a passing fancy, with whom he united his destinies, for better for worse, in life until death, in some off-hand manner about which he is reticent and mysterious. Anita turned out almost as great and daring and long-enduring a being as her heroic mate, and was by his side in all fights by land and sea, till the fortunes of the Republic of Rio Grande declined, when, after giving birth to her firstborn, Menotti Garibaldi, September the 16th, 1840, she went with that infant and his father through unheard-of hardships and dangers in the disastrous retreat of La Santas. When, at last, Garibaldi, beginning to feel the responsibilities of a growing family and despairing of the issues of an ill-conducted war, took leave of his Republican friends at Rio Grande and went for a short respite in his adventurous career to Montevideo. After trying on the journey to find employment as a cattle driver, Garibaldi settled at Montevideo in the capacity of a general broker and teacher of mathematics. But war having broken out between the Republic of the Uruguay and Buenos Aires, the condottieri was solicited to draw his sword for the former state, which afforded him hospitality, and was trusted with the command of a little squadron destined to operate on the Parana River 
against a largely superior Argentine force. This expedition was contrived by enemies high in power in the Montevidean government, who, jealous of the reputation won by Garibaldi at Rio Grande, vainly plotted to have him assassinated with his friend Anzani, and hoped to rid themselves of him by exposing him to dangers from which it seemed impossible that he could extricate himself. Garibaldi, however, made the best of his desperate position, and escaped not only with his life, but also with honour, the only thing that was not lost. Presently, danger pressing sorely on the Republic, he organised his Italian legion, which behaved well through a new series of land and sea combats, its band of only 400 combatants often beating the enemy's corps 600 men strong, at the close of which exploits its soldiers refused grants of land offered to them by a grateful state. The stimulus of their exertions, as their commander said, being only the triumph of the Republican cause. The Legion was afterward, as a mark of honour, allowed precedence over all the other troops of the Republic. The war continued, and under the auspices of their commander, the soldiers of the Italian Legion rose to such distinction that at the affairs of the Boyada and of Salto Sant'Antonio, February 1846, Garibaldi was empowered to write to the government of the Republic that the brilliant successes of those deeds of arms were entirely due to their gallantry. Meanwhile, however, news from Europe came to turn the attention of Italian patriots to the momentous events which were rapidly changing the conditions of the peninsula. Years had passed. Pius IX was Pope. Sicily had risen in open and successful revolt. A republic had been proclaimed in France. Constitutions were being wrested from the reluctant hands of most European despots. Austria was convulsed with insurrectionary attempts. The Milanese drove Radetzky from their city after five days' fighting, and Charles Albert unfurled the national standard and crossed the Ticino. The theatre of the exploits of the hero of Montevideo was soon changed. All who had a heart and soul in Italy were up and doing, and could Italy's greatest heart and soul remain beyond the seas? Garibaldi, on the first reports of the Pope's liberal leanings, wrote to the Nuncio Bedini at Montevideo, October the 17th, 1847, offering the services of the Italian Legion to His Holiness, who was now almost on the eve of a war with Austria. Although, the letter said, the writer was well aware that St. Peter's throne rests on a solid basis, proof against all human attacks and needing no mortal defenders. The nuncio returned thanks and praises and referred Garibaldi's tender to the pontifical government at Rome. But Garibaldi, never well disposed to losing time, after vainly waiting for further communication from Pope or nuncio, brooked no longer delay. With incredible difficulty, he scraped together money and means and embarked with his brave friend Anzani, who died at Genoa soon after landing, having with him only 85 men and two cannon, and leaving the remainder of his legion to follow when and how it could. He crossed the ocean, landed at Nice, proceeded to Genoa and Milan, and when Charles Albert, defeated at Castozza, withdrew from the Lombard city and accepted an armistice, which saved Piedmont from invasion, August 1848, Garibaldi passed over to Mazzini, and at the head of a volunteer force, of which Mazzini was the standard bearer, issued a manifesto in which he proclaimed the Sardinian king a traitor, and declared that the royal war was at an end and that of the people was now to begin. That proclamation was, however, only an idle bravado. Mazzini, even if he had the spirit, lacked the physical strength of a fighting man. The Garibaldians, on hearing the news of the fall of Milan, lost heart, and many crossed over the frontier to Switzerland. With thinned and dispirited bands, Garibaldi, aided by his friend Medici, 
ventured on a few desultory fights near Luino on Lake Maggiore, but soon fell back and withdrew to Lugano in the canton Ticino, his health, it is said, breaking down, and his immediate followers being reduced to some three hundred. A few months later, Pius the Ninth, fallen from his popularity and pressed hard by his disaffected subjects, who murdered his minister and almost stormed him in his palace at the Quirinal, ran away to Gaeta, and a Roman Republic was proclaimed, of which Mazzini, in a triumvirate with two others, mere men of straw, became the head. Attacked by the French in flagrant violation of all rights of nations, Rome undertook to defend itself, and whatever Italy could boast of generous hearts, regardless of party differences, rallied round Garibaldi, who drove back the French from Porta Pancrazia, April the 29th and 30th, 1849, defeated the Neapolitans in that campaign of Bellitri, which was like the farce, contrasting with the tragic drama soon to be acted at Rome, and withstood a three-month siege, in which many of the noblest champions of the Italian cause lavished their lives in a hopeless, yet, as it proved, not a fruitless struggle. The French, having gained possession of the city July the 13th, 1849, Garibaldi left it with a band of devoted volunteers, retired via Terni and Orvieto, gathering together about 2,000 men in his progress, crossed the Apennines, and pressed by the Austrians with overwhelming forces, sought a refuge at San Marino, gave the enemy the slip in the night, embarked at Cesenantico for Venice, which was still withstanding the Austrian siege, was met by four Austrian men of war, which compelled him to put back and land on the coast near Ravenna, and wandered ashore in the woods, where Anita, his inseparable companion in this disastrous march, succumbed to the fatigues of the journey and expired in the hero's arms. Garibaldi's devoted friends, Ugo Bassi and Cicciarracchio, falling into the hands of the Austrians, were shot by them without any forms of trial and by an act of barbarism which no human or divine law could justify. The heartbroken hero, with a few trusty men, made his way from the Adriatic to the Mediterranean, was arrested by the Sardinian Carabinieri at Chiaveri, conveyed to Genoa, where La Marmora was in command, and thence embarked for Tunis. Hence, finding nowhere a refuge, he proceeded to the island of La Maddalena, off the shore of Sardinia, and hence again to Gibraltar and Tangier. La Marmora received the heartbroken fugitive as a brother, supplied him with ample means for his journey to Tunis, and obtained from him from the Turin government the assignment of an honourable pension, which Garibaldi did not in his straits disdain to accept. But, in his opinion, all seemed now over for Italy. Charles Albert's son, Victor Emmanuel, after the defeat of Navarra, had made his peace with Austria in March 1849. Venice had succumbed after heroic sufferings in August, and Garibaldi, again crossing the ocean, settled at New York as a tallow chandler and only came back to Europe in 1855. When Garibaldi returned from America, he did not look out for Mazzini or his Republicans in England or Switzerland, but sought a home in Piedmont, a constitutional state, which allowed him an obscure but peaceful retreat in his hermitage at Caprera, an island rock on the Sardinian coast near the Maddalena, and conveyed to him a hint that the time might soon come in which his country's cause would summon him from retirement. And, truly, four years later, 1859, the destinies of Italy were nearing their fulfilment. France and Piedmont took the field against Austria. Garibaldi, leaving his island home, was met and highly welcomed by Victor Emmanuel, to whom he swore fealty as the only hope of Italy. He now took the command of the Chasseur des Alpes, aided the royal army in its defence of the territory previous to the arrival of its great French auxiliary, and, 
following in the upper region a line parallel to that kept in the plain by the conquest of Palestro, Magenta and Solferino, beat the Austrians at Varese and San Fermo, bewildered his adversary Urban by the rashness of his movements on the mountains above Como, advanced upon Bergamo and Brescia, and pushed on to the Valtellina up to the very summit of the Stelvia Pass. Here the peace of Villafranca put an end to the struggle, and Garibaldi, afflicted by the arthritic pains to which he was a martyr all his life, travelled for a few days' rest to Tuscany and Genoa. At Genoa, during the autumn and winter, Garibaldi, hospitably entertained by his friend Augusto Vecchi, outside the city, busied himself with that expedition of the Thousand, which made one state of the south and north of Italy. He embarked on May the 11th, 1860, at Genoa, landed in Sicily at Marsala, beat the Neapolitans at Catalata Fimi, followed up his success to Palermo, and, aided by the insurgent city, compelled the garrison to surrender. He again routed the Bourbon troops at Milazzo, and had soon the whole island at his discretion, with the exception of the citadel of Messina. He then crossed over into Calabria, and, almost without firing a shot, drove the Neapolitan king's troops before him all over the mainland, compelled the king to abandon the strong pass of La Cava, and to withdraw his forces from his capital, where Garibaldi, with only a few of his staff, made his triumphal entry on September the 7th, 1860. After a few days' rest, Garibaldi followed the disheartened king to Capua, obtained new signal successes on the Volturno, at Santa Maria and Caserta, but would probably have been unable to accomplish the enterprise had not the Piedmontese, whose government had aided Garibaldi's expedition while pretending to oppose it, overrun the marches, beaten La Moricieri and the papal forces at Castel Fidardo, and, crossing the frontier and the Apennines, besieged and reduced the strong places of Capua and Gaeta. Garibaldi, who, as a dictator, had with doubtful success endeavoured to establish something like rule in the two Sicilies, aware of the arduousness of a task which would have exceeded many wiser men's powers, met Victor Emmanuel at Naples, delivered the two kingdoms into his hands, and, declining all the proffered honours and emoluments for himself, took leave of his sovereign and embarked for the solitude of his rock farm at Caprera. Rome alone now remained outside of the United Italian Kingdom, and Garibaldi, raising bands of adventurers, made two or three attempts to capture it, but was repulsed by its French garrison, and it was not until 1870 that, the French troops being recalled to their own sorely distressed country, the Union of Italy under Victor Emmanuel became an accomplished fact, though in the great liberator's absence. Garibaldi once more was seen in Rome, April 1879. He was supposed to be proposing great purchases of arms, to be enlisting hosts of volunteers, to be planning thorough reforms and preparing formidable expeditions against Austria. But Garibaldi, away from Caprera, could not fail to have his good as well as his evil angels about him. He saw the king, he listened to General Medici, his own right arm in so many campaigns, and now first aide-de-camp to King Humbert, as he had been before to King Victor Emmanuel. He listened while they showed him the folly of further war, and, though not convinced, he was silenced. Although too proud to acknowledge the absurdity of his schemes in words, he was too wise not to give them up in deeds. He withdrew from the vain popular acclamation, shut his door against the crowd of his visitors, and although he announced his intention to take up his domicile in Rome, he pleaded indisposition as an excuse for inaction and retirement. Unfortunately, there was only too much ground in the plea. The arthritic pains, of which symptoms had manifested themselves 
as early as during the Lombard campaign of 1849, had been seriously aggravated by his toils, and the sight of his helplessness in Rome as he hobbled up the steps of Monte Cittorio in 1874 was saddening to all beholders, and prepared his friends for that end which, however, was to be put off for several years. The fatigue of the voyage from Caprera in 1879, and still more the excitement of incessant calls, objectless conferences, and endless exhibitions, soon entirely prostrated the hero, and before the backward spring had fully set in, it became evident that Garibaldi's life could only be a lingering agony. His life, if life it may be called, and at all events his sufferings, were prolonged yet a few years. He left home in the spring of 1881 on a mad scheme of liberating, by force if necessary, his son-in-law, Canzio, who had been arrested as a plotter for the Republic. But having obtained the man's release from the king's government as a favour, he once more sought the peace of his hermitage, where he died, June 2nd, 1882. End of section 30「Section 31 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Field Marshal Count von Moltke. Suddenly, but quietly and painlessly, on the evening of April 24th, 1891, passed away one of the most remarkable men of the present century, Helmuth Karl Bernhard von Moltke was born, October 26, 1800, at Parsham in Mecklenburg, where his father, previously a captain in the Prussian army, had retired, impoverished in circumstances, to an estate which he inherited. When little Helmuth was three years old, his father, Baron Moltke, settled at the free town of Lübeck, once famous head of the Hanseatic League. Here, in 1806, on the retreat from the disastrous Battle of Jena, Marshal Blücher, who, like von Moltke, was of Mecklenburg origin, sought refuge with his shattered troops, and little Moltke was a witness of the sack and plunder of the town by the troops of Napoleon, his father's house being one of those that suffered most severely. It is said that the incidents of this event made a lasting impression on the mind of the boy. At the age of nine, with his elder brother Fritz, young Helmuth was placed under the care of Pastor Nick Bain at Hohenfeld, near Horst, a scholarly man of a kindly and genial disposition, for whom he always retained a deep regard. His sense of indebtedness appears in the inscription which he wrote on the title page when forwarding to him a copy of his first work, his letters from Turkey. To my dear teacher and fatherly friend to whom I owe so much, I send this, my first work, as a slight testimony of respect. The favorite recreation of the two brothers while here at school was playing at war, as perhaps was natural at such a period. They were accustomed to collect the peasant boys of the village and divide them into two rival armies, Fritz commanding the one and Helmuth the other. Once, when the mimic warfare was at its height, the weaker force of Helmuth was routed, and some were taken prisoners. Called upon to surrender, Helmuth cried out, All is not lost, and hastily rallying his men, he marched them straight to a pond in Pastor Nick Bain's garden, and hurried them to a little island which the boy himself had constructed with great labor, and accessible only by a single plank. Facing the enemy with a few of his strongest men, he kept them at bay until all his troops had passed into the fortress, he himself being the last to enter. Then the drawbridge was raised and the victory won. The island, preserved by the good pastor, long since gone to his rest, still exists, and is pointed out with great pride by the villagers to curious visitors as the scene of one of the early exploits of Germany's greatest strategist. His experiences at the Royal Academy at Copenhagen, to which he was sent at the age of twelve, were not of the happiest. Relating his reminiscences of that period, in reply to the question, Do you retain pleasant recollections of cadet life? He remarked, I have little reason to do so. Without relations or acquaintances in a strange city, we spent a joyless youth. The discipline was strict, even hard. And now, when my judgment of it is unprejudiced, I must say that it was too strict, too hard. The only benefit we received from this treatment was that we became accustomed to deprivations. Passing over the period of his service in the Danish army, and his entrance into that of Prussia, we find him, after making heroic efforts on his scanty pay to acquire foreign languages, in which he attained in after life so remarkable a proficiency, 
attached to a commission for topographical surveys in Silesia and the Grand Duchy of Posen. Consolidating and extending his knowledge of military science and of foreign peoples, as in the case of his visits to the East, Russia, Rome, and elsewhere, Moltke rose steadily in his profession. In 1845, he became aide-de-camp to the invalid Prince Henry of Prussia, uncle of the king, and subsequently, after holding commands of increasing importance, he was made first aide-de-camp to the Crown Prince Frederick. Ultimately, in 1859, he was appointed permanent chief of the staff. His later military career and brilliant successes against the Danes, Austrians, and the French, and the various honors accorded him, are so well known and have been so often and so recently narrated that any further reference to them in this present sketch is unnecessary, the purpose of our notice being to briefly indicate some of the leading points of the great field marshal's character. One fact is memorable, that he had passed the age when men frequently retire from the public service before the time of his greater achievements. His splendid career began to the eye of the world at 65. The guiding principle of his life is well illustrated by the ancient motto of his family, Cote et Candide, warily and gently, and by his own favorite maxim, Erswagen dan wagen, first way, then venture. He was slow, cautious, and careful in laying his plans, but having formed his design, he was bold, daring even to the verge of apparent recklessness in its execution. The same calm, immovable spirit characterized him even in moments when most ordinary mortals, he was a man sui generi, might, with some show of reason, be perturbed or excited. Even in the most critical period of the Franco-German War, his unruffled quietness remained the same, sterner perhaps in look, more silent than ever. Though the warrior king, amidst the carnage of the battlefield, might feel depressed, Though Bismarck, man of iron and blood, might be anxious at the progress of events, Moltke, seated on his great black horse, calmly surveyed, telescope in hand, the movements of the troops, or later, resting quietly in his room at Versailles, awaited the result undismayed. When war was declared, a friend met him with the remark, You must indeed be overworked at present. No, replied the general. The work was done beforehand. All orders are gone out. I really have nothing to do. Married in 1842, shortly after his return home from the East, to Miss Burt, an English lady, he lived with her in the bonds of a rare union of happiness, concord, and mutual sympathy. On the occasion of her death, which took place Christmas Eve, 1868, he withdrew still more from public life, and found in quiet, studious, and laborious life some slight relief for his grief. Very touching was his devotion to the memory of his wife. Upon his estate at Crisau, he built a little mausoleum, situated on a beautiful eminence, embowered in foliage. This little chapel, constructed of red brick and sandstone, was lined inside with black and white marble, and in front of the altar was placed the simple oak coffin in which the remains of his wife reposed, covered at all seasons of the year with wreaths. Sculptured in the apse was a finely carved figure of our Lord in an attitude of blessing, copied from Thorwaldsen. Above were inscribed the words of St. Paul, Love is the fulfillment of the law. When at his country seat, the aged warrior visited the tomb morning and evening. Now at her side slumbers the veteran, awaiting with her the signal of the resurrection. Of this bearing in this time of his bereavement, the following incident was related by the late Mr. George Bancroft, the distinguished historian, at that period United States Minister at Berlin. Mr. Bancroft was one of the favored few who were accustomed to accompany von Moltke in his daily rides in the Thiergarten or to the Grunwald. Seeing the general on horseback, my first impulse, said Mr. Bancroft, was to trot into another lane. On second thoughts, however, I turned my horse alongside his, remembering that it was for him to talk or be silent. To my surprise, he forthwith began a lively conversation, describing the happiness with which Miss Bird had blessed her husband, and expatiating upon her manifold virtues as one crushed by an overwhelming, irreparable loss. Then, of a sudden, he grew silent, as if a new current of thought had carried him sheer away. Do you know, he said, when his lips were again opened, it has just been brought home to me that, after all, perhaps it was better that this happened now than at another time. You see, I am convinced that a French invasion is impending. It will burst upon us sooner or later, whatever the plea may eventually be. Now think if the fortune of war was to be adverse to our arms. Why, her grief over the country's adversities must have cut her life short. No, no, that would have been worse." Von Moltke was a passionate lover of children, and is said to have been quite the slave to the caprices of his little grandnephew, the son of Major Helmuth von Moltke, the aide-de-camp of the Count, whom the Emperor, as a special mark of his royal favor, immediately after the funeral of his chief, made one of his own aides-de-camp. As far as Count von Moltke's religious views could be ascertained, they were of a simple type, and characterized by a strict adherence to the path of duty and virtue. Daily was he accustomed to read the Bible, 
one of ancient date, its well-marked pages indicating how frequently its owner was in the habit of consulting its inspired pages. An extract from a letter the aged field marshal wrote on the eve of his 80th birthday is peculiarly interesting. I stand, said he, close upon the end of my life, but how different from that here will be the measure in a future world according to which our earthly actions will be judged? Not the brilliancy of success, but the purity of our endeavors and faithful perseverance in duty, even when the result was scarcely visible, will decide as to the value of a man's life. What a wonderful displacement of high and low will be witnessed at that great review. We do not even know ourselves what we have to ascribe to ourselves, to others, or to higher will. It will be well not to set too great a value on externals. In a passage in one of his books, referring to our Lord's life here upon earth, he remarks, His life was humble. He was the descendant of a people in bondage, and he had not a place where to lay his head. To the fishermen he talked in parables about God. He healed the sick and died the death of an evildoer. And yet, there has never been anything on this earth that could be purer, more elevated, and also, even seen from the worldly point of view, more successful than his conduct, his teaching, and his death. The old soldier's habits of life were, like the majority of really great men, extremely simple and singularly free from ostentation of any kind. Very characteristic of the late field marshal are the following data of his life, written by himself on the occasion of his 90th birthday an Austrian association for the promotion of popular knowledge addressed a number of interrogatories to various European celebrities of great age, which were to explain the circumstances and conditions under which an exceptionally long life might be attained. The answers received were collected in a book and subsequently published. Field Marshal von Moltke answered the questions submitted to him in his own peculiarly laconic manner as follows. In which year of your life and on which date did you begin to learn and for how many hours a day? 1808 in my eighth year with four, and 1810 with ten hours a day. Was your health in your youth delicate or robust? Tough nature. Did you grow up in the country or in town? Up to my tenth year in the country. How many hours did you spend in the open air? Regularly? Irregularly and but few hours. Did you cultivate hardening games and other exercises? Not methodically. How many hours did you sleep in childhood? Ten hours. Special remarks? Joyless youth, scanty nourishment, absence from the paternal home. Where do you complete your studies? In town or in the country? In town. How many hours a day do you devote to mental work? Very different. Do you attribute to any particular habit of your life a favorable influence upon your health? Moderation in all habits of life. In all weathers, exercise in the open air. No day altogether at home. How long did you sleep at a mature age? from eight to nine hours on an average. What alterations have you made at an advanced age in your mode of life? None. How long did you work daily in your 50th, 60th, 70th, 80th years? Quite as circumstances required it, often, therefore, very long. What were your recreations? Riding on horseback up to my 86th year. How many hours do you spend in the open air? Now in summer on my estate, half the day. How long do you sleep at present? Always eight hours still. What are your habits with regard to eating, etc.? I eat very little and take concentrated food. To what circumstances do you particularly attribute your stalwart old age, which may God long preserve? To God's grace and temperate habits. An interesting anecdote is related, apropos of his dislike to display, on the occasion of the opening of new barracks at Frankfurt on the Oder, to which, as the oldest and most distinguished officer of the regiment in which he first served, he was invited. His acceptance of the invitation was accompanied by the stipulation that no ceremony should be made, but the officers, desiring to do honor to their illustrious guest, had provided the best carriage that the town afforded to meet him at the station. On his arrival, the field marshal thanked the officer in waiting, took a common cab, and with his nephew, who was with him as aide-de-camp, drove off to the barracks, to the astonishment of the honest burghers. His favorite recreations were chess, in which he excelled, music, especially that of the school of Schubert and Mozart, he entertained very decided opinions about the music of the future, and whist, which he rarely missed after playing dinner, even when at the seat of war. The Count was an authority on the culture of roses, and at Crisau, where he spent most of his time after his retirement from more active service, he possessed one of the finest and most unique collections of roses in Germany a fact which leads an additional grace to the tribute of respect paid to the field marshal's memory, when, the day after his death, the empress visited the headquarters of the general staff and placed a magnificent wreath of his favorite flower upon the bed of the departed hero. Had not his reputation as a military strategist overshadowed his other gifts, 
the Count would have gained distinction in the world of letters. In his twenties, while engaged in the topographical department, he wrote a pamphlet published at Berlin entitled Holland and Belgium by H. von Moltke, in which he calls the attention of Europe to the Belgian Revolution. This was followed in 1845 by a critical military work of great merit, the Russo-Turkish Campaign of 1828-29 in European Turkey, which created a deep impression in military circles and proved of considerable service in the Russo-Turkish Campaign of 1877-78. Moltke's pithy and laconic style was founded on the model of his chief, General von Mufling, his instructor in practical and theoretical tactics, in which the members of the German general staff are required to excel. He was a graphic writer and shrewd observer of men and things, as his charming letters from Russia, France, Turkey, and other places show. Especially sagacious were his observations on the Turks, made to his sister, married to Mr. John Burt, an Englishman settled at Holstein, in which he affirms that the kingdom is rotten, that Turkey had fallen under a ban, and that ban the Quran, which teaches so warped a doctrine that its laws and decrees must of necessity oppose all social progress. His views on Russia, as indicated in his letters written in the form of a diary to his wife on the occasion of his visit in 1856, when accompanying Prince Frederick William at the coronation of the Tsar Alexander II at Moscow, show the same keen powers of observation. He considered that Russia had a great future before her, but this could only be realized when her officials became more honest. Honesty among Russian officials, he thinks, can only be brought about by many years of iron severity. Of the difficulty of governing the French nation, he wrote when visiting the court of Napoleon III, it would be as impossible to allow the liberty of the press in France as to admit discussion of the orders given by generals to their armies when in the field. We have not the advantage of knowing his views on England and the English. On the three occasions, in 1856, 1858, and 1861, when he visited the country in company with the crown prince, to be present at his betrothal and marriage to the Princess Royal, and again the funeral of the Prince Consort. How highly his opinion as an authority was esteemed as early as 1867, as seen by an incident which occurred during the Universal Exhibition, when Count Moltke, in company with King William of Prussia and Count Bismarck, dined with Napoleon III at Saint Cloud. Subsequently, the Emperor and Moltke engaged in an animated conversation apart from the rest. At this moment, Marshal Randon, Minister of War, walked across the room, and the emperor, noticing him, raised his voice, saying, Come here, Marshal. General Moltke says that with the needle gun he would be strong enough to fight even the French army. Marshal Rendon drew near, and, turning toward Moltke, said in a tone loud enough to be heard by all in the room, Pardon me, General, but in spite of the high opinion I have of your judgment, I cannot share your belief. I venture to affirm that even with the needle gun, the French army would not suffer the fate of the Austrian army and the conversation continued without the bystanders being able to follow it. But after the departure of the King of Prussia and his suite, Napoleon III, struck by these words, energetically busied himself in overhauling the equipment of the French army. He examined various models of guns that were submitted to him, and among these the Martini rifle, which he found excellent, but which was after all rejected for the Chassepot. The making of this gun was pushed forward so actively that the French army was provided with it by 1870. In respect of his literary efforts, as of his military achievements, Moltke was singularly modest. Herr G. von Bunsen tells us how, meeting the general one day at a dinner party, I expressed my regret at his having neglected to write some letterpress to accompany his well-known map of the environs of ancient Rome. But a companion book for it was written, he replied. Or rather, correcting himself, he had begun writing one at Rome and was prevented from finishing the MS when the government ordered him to convey Prince Henry's body to Berlin, and there set him engrossing tasks to do. Hereupon I ventured to ask him for a loan of this fragment. Of course, he believed it to be lost, but as a matter of course likewise, it was brought to my door by an orderly at an early hour next morning. When returning the MS, I advised the publication of parts of it, which would be found acceptable independently of his being the author. And if my humble advice should be followed, would he accept my humble services as editor? His reply, adds Herr von Bunsen, has been carefully preserved. Its purport was that he must lay down three conditions. First, I must omit what I pleased. Secondly, transpose at my pleasure. And thirdly, alter the text wherever it seemed desirable. Will any editor in the world, Herr von Bunsen pithily remarks, hesitate to confirm my belief that no MS of the last unfledged stripling of an author was ever offered on similar conditions? Fitting tributes of respect and admiration were paid to the aged field marshal on the occasion of his celebrating his 90th birthday, on October 26, 1890. 
Telegrams from all sorts and conditions of men poured in upon him, including, among the princes and sovereigns of Europe, one from Queen Victoria, who held Count von Moltke in high esteem. The 26th falling upon Sunday, the schools throughout the length and breadth of Germany were closed on the previous Saturday to enable the scholars to add their quota to the general rejoicing. In Berlin, a torchlight procession of vast extent, composed of 20,000 students, artists, members of trades and guilds, marched with banners and groups of historically dressed personages and impersonifications, from the old Grey Schloss down the Linden, through the Brandenburg Gate to the Konigsplatz, where are situated the buildings of the general staff. Here, addresses were presented to von Moltke. On the following day, in the conference hall of the general staff, the emperor, surrounded by the military magnates of the Reichsrath, the generals of the 20 Army Corps specially summoned to be present, the officers of the general staff, Chancellor von Caprivi, successor to Prince Bismarck, the King of Saxony, the Grand Dukes, and the Duke of Connaught, addressed the marshal in the following terms. I thank you in the name of those who have fought together with you, and whose most faithful and devoted servant you have been. I thank you for all you have done for my house and for the great list of the fatherland. We greet in you not only a Prussian leader who has won for the army the reputation of being invincible, but one of the founders of the German Empire. The presence of the King of Saxony, who has made a point of personally congratulating you, recalls the time when he and you fought for Germany's greatness. The distinctions conferred upon you by my grandfather leave nothing in which I can personally show my thanks to you. I call upon those present to express their feelings of gratitude that Field Marshal von Moltke has known how not to stand alone in his greatness, but to form a school of leaders of the army for time to come, and for all future generations, by giving cheers for his excellency. This, the last occasion on which public honors were accorded to the field marshal during his life, appropriately emphasized the universal esteem in which Father Moltke, as he was affectionately designated by the army, was held as one of the founders of the German Empire. End of chapter 31. Section 32 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. George Dewey by Major General Joseph Wheeler, born 1837. Every occasion finds a man to meet the exigencies of the hour, every conflict brings forth its hero, and every war educates soldiers for a war to come. War begets the warrior. Washington came out of the French and Indian Wars, Jackson from the Creek Wars, Scott and Taylor both emerged from Chippewa and Lundy's Lane, Grant and Lee from Mexico. So George Dewey came out of the fierce internecine strife of our Civil War. He came, too, from one of the great sources of the best elements of our American population. The Puritans of New England and the Cavaliers of Virginia, sprung from the same soil and a common ancestry, worked side by side in a widely different manner but to the same end. And from these two classes have sprung nearly all our great soldiers, statesmen, and authors. From the former came the great naval hero of the Spanish-American War. George Dewey was born in Montpelier, Vermont, on December 26, 1837, of direct descent in the ninth generation from Thomas Dewey, who came from Sandwich, England, New Dorchester, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1633. His father, Dr. Julius Dewey, was a physician, eminent in his profession, and loved and respected not only for his ability, but for his innate nobility of character. And his mother was Mary Perrin. His ancestors on both sides were patriots in the days that tried men's souls the hard and bitter days of the colonial and revolutionary wars. He was the third of four children, and even in his boyhood he was a leader among his fellows. His breaches of discipline culminated in his heading an insurrection against the village schoolmaster. But the pedagogue came off victorious and administered a severe flogging to the young rebel, 
which punishment his father is said to have reinforced with some home-brewed medicine. The lesson was well learned, for we hear of no more insurrections. George Dewey entered the Naval Academy September 23, 1854, and was graduated fifth in a class of fourteen. He was attached to the frigate Wabash of the Mediterranean Squadron, and after his two years' cruise as a midshipman, passed his final examination, in which he stood number one, gaining a final rating of three in his class. War was already imminent, and rapidly passing through the next grades, he was on April 19th attached as lieutenant to the Mississippi, belonging to the West Gulf Squadron. Early in 1862, Commodores Farragut and Porter prepared to capture New Orleans. Throughout this campaign, Lieutenant Dewey distinguished himself by his cool courage, quick perception, and ready skill, winning the praise of Commodore Farragut. In running by the forts, he stood upon the bridge of the Mississippi, unmoved amid a storm of shot and shell, and unerringly guided her up the river although he knew not a foot of the channel. The next year he was attached to one of Farragut's gunboats, and later to the Monongahela, which he commanded temporarily. In 1864, attached to the Colorado, he again distinguished himself in the attack on Fort Fisher, by a display not only of great courage, but of marked tactical skill, and by the fighting of his ship, which, though a junior, he really directed, and won the enthusiastic congratulations of his superior officers. Made lieutenant commander March 3, 1865, Dewey emerged from the Civil War a matured naval officer at the age of 27, ripe in experience and ready for any service or sacrifice for the welfare of his country. His career from this time until the close of the year 1897 although important in his development and replete with valuable services in all directions, must be summed up in a few words. For two years subsequent to the war, he served with the European squadron, first on the Kearsarge and later on the Colorado. 1867 found him at the Naval Academy, promoted commander April 13, 1872, who was assigned to the Narragansett until 1875. After seven years of bureau duty in the Navy Department, October 18, 1882, he commanded the Juniata of the Asiatic Squadron, and then learned the topography of Manila Bay, where he gave his first lesson to the Spaniard in the person of the port captain of Manila, who impudently proposed that he parade his crew so that some sailors accused of riot might be identified, Dewey's reply being, the deck of this vessel is United States territory, and I'll parade my men for no foreigner that ever drew breath. Dewey's health broke down, and in 1884 he was at the Navy Department, but September 27th was commissioned captain and took command of the Dolphin, one of the White Squadron, the beginning of our new Navy. He reached the rank of Commodore February 28, 1896, on shore, he has served as a member of the Lighthouse Board, Chief of the Bureau of Equipment, and Chief of the Board of Inspection and Survey. Late in the year 1897, it became necessary to select the commander of the Asiatic Station. War with Spain was a possibility. It was therefore essential that the Asiatic Station be in command of an able and experienced officer. It has been said that Commodore Dewey, as also the other Commodores, sought the North Atlantic and European stations, believing that the Atlantic would be the theater of the war, and that he was averse to service in the Asiatic. It has also been said that the appointment of Dewey was a mere chance, a matter of routine. I think that these statements are not correct. I believe that Commodore Dewey was too old a sailor, too good a sailor, and too experienced a sailor to attempt to dictate his own orders. Furthermore, in a conversation with the President, this subject being mentioned, the President told me that he had carefully considered the appointment of an officer to command the Asiatic Station, and had finally determined upon Dewey, that he wrote upon a card which he sent to the Secretary of the Navy, 
appoint Dewey to Asiatic Squadron. In pursuance to the President's action, Commodore George Dewey was detached on November 30th from bureau work and ordered to the Asiatic Station, of which he took command on January 3rd, 1898. The opportunity came, and the right man was in the right place. Commodore Dewey's squadron was composed of four protected cruisers, two gunboats, and a dispatch boat, as follows. The Olympia, flagship, a protected cruiser of 5,870 tons, mounting 14 guns. Captain Gridley and Flag Officer Captain Benjamin P. Lamberton. The Baltimore, a protected cruiser of 4,413 tons and 10 guns. Captain Nehemiah M. Dyer. The Raleigh, a protected cruiser of 3,213 tons and 11 guns. Captain Joseph P. Coughlin. The Boston, a protected cruiser of 3,000 tons and 8 guns. Captain Frank Wilds. The Concord, a gunboat of 1,710 tons and six guns, Commander Asa Walker, and the Petro, a gunboat of 892 tons and four guns, Commander Wood, and the Revenue Cutter McCulloch, dispatch boat. Also the transports Zafiro and Nanshan, with provisions and coal. There was no armored vessel in the squadron. From the day Commander Dewey took command of the Asiatic Squadron until April 24th, active preparations for war were going forward. The ships were kept stored to their full capacity with provisions, coal, and ammunition, and there was a continuous round of drill, target practice, maneuvers, and evolutions. Dewey would be ready when action should become necessary. On April 24th, the British authorities notified the American commander that he must quit Hong Kong within 24 hours. Dewey moved his squadron to Mears Bay immediately. At 6 o'clock in the evening of April 25th, he received the following dispatch. Washington, April 24th, 1898. Dewey, Hong Kong. War has commenced between the United States and Spain. Proceed at once to the Philippine Islands. Commence operations at once, particularly against the Spanish fleet. You must capture vessels or destroy. Use utmost endeavors. Long. These orders were all sufficient for Dewey. Even without them, he had no alternative. Obliged to leave British, he would soon be debarred from Chinese waters. He was nearly 8,000 miles from a home port, and Honolulu, his nearest coaling station, was 6,000 miles away. The following day was spent in consultation with his commanders, in final preparation for his campaign, and waiting for the arrival from Manila of Williams, the American consul, until the evening of the 27th, when at two o'clock he sailed out of Mears Bay to find the fleet of Spain. Proceeding across the China Sea, the squadron sighted Cape Bolinas, 150 miles north of the entrance to Manila Bay, at 3.30 a.m. on Saturday, April 30th. About 30 miles north of the entrance, a conference of commanders was held. Dewey announced his plans. Rumors of mines and torpedoes had no terrors for Dewey, and, steaming slowly into Manila Bay, his squadron passed between Corregidor and Caballos about midnight. They arrived opposite Cavite about five o'clock, and, as daylight increased, the Spanish fleet could be seen in the harbor. This fleet, under Admiral Montejo, comprised ten vessels, that is, the Reina Maria Cristina, a protected cruiser of 3,520 tons, the Castilla, a wooden cruiser of 3,340 tons, the Don Antonio de Uoa, Don Juan de Austria, and Velasco, steel cruisers of 1,152 tons each, the Isla de Luzon, and Isla de Cuba, gunboats of 1,040 tons each, the General Leso and El Correo, gun vessels of 524 tons each, and the Marquis del Duero, dispatch boat of 500 tons, besides tugs, transports, and launches, the latter used as torpedo boats. There was no armed vessel in this fleet. Though counting more fighting vessels, the Spanish fleet was inferior to the American squadron in size and armament. 
The Spanish vessels mounted 116 guns, the American 135. But the Spanish fleet was protected by land batteries and forts armed with modern guns. The Spaniards were, therefore, much superior to the Americans in force and armament. At ten minutes past five, the battle began. The Spaniards opening fire from ships and forts at a distance of more than four miles. Two great mines were exploded in the path of the Olympia, but too far away to cause damage. At twenty-three minutes past five, Dewey said to Captain Gridley, You may fire when ready. Almost instantly, an eight-inch gun roared out American defiance. As with one voice, the blue jackets of the squadron came forth the American war cry, Remember the Maine! And the battle was on. The Castilla lay moored head and stern under the protection of the guns, and surrounded by barges which made it impossible to strike her below the water line. The Reina Cristina, Admiral Montejo's flagship, and the other vessels of his fleet moved out to the battle protected by forts and batteries. The Olympia in the lead, followed by the other vessels of the American squadron, headed straight for the center of the Spanish line. Then, changing course, ran parallel to the Spanish line at a distance of 4,000 yards. After passing the Spanish position, the American squadron turned and again passed the Spanish line, decreasing the distance. The Spaniards were in strong position and fighting with consummate courage, but it soon became apparent that nothing could withstand the effects of American guttery. Still, the Spaniards, knowing the exact distance of our vessels, were doing some damage. Early in the battle, a shot struck and passed clean through the Baltimore, and another disabled a six-inch gun and exploded a box of ammunition, wounding eight men but killing no one. The Olympia was struck by a shell which, exploding outside, did little damage, and the signal's halyards were cut out of the flag officer's hands. The lines were immediately replaced by a blue jacket. The Boston was struck by three shells, one starting a fire in a stateroom and another in the hammock netting, while a third passed through the foremast near Captain Wiles. The squadron passed four times before the enemy, slightly decreasing the distance on each run, and on the fifth, believing that the depth of water was greater than he had supposed, Dewey took the Olympia closer, until on his last run he was within 2,000 yards of the enemy. The Spaniards were suffering terribly and fought with courage and desperation. Admiral Montejo and Reina Cristina sallied forth alone and made straight for the Olympia at full speed, but the concentrated fire of the whole American squadron drove him back to the protection of the breakwater, and as the flagship spread away, a shell from the Olympia struck her, passed through her entire length, and set her on fire. Captain Cadarso was mortally wounded. Admiral Montejo, in an open boat, transferred his flag to the gunboat Isa de Cuba. The Castilla was repeatedly hit and was soon burning fiercely. The Don Juan de Austria was blown up by a shell entering the magazine. The other Spanish vessels and all the forts and batteries maintained a terrific firing. The heavy guns of Manila took part in the fight until Dewey sent a message to Governor General Agusti that unless they were immediately silenced, he would shell the city. The message had its effect. Two small launches or torpedo boats started out from the Castilla, headed for the Olympia. But the danger to her was averted by the concentrated fire of the squadron, and they hastened in their backward flight. A shell struck and sank one, the other was disabled. A Spanish gunboat slipping out of line made for the McCulloch, lying off the transports, but nothing escaped the eagle eye on the bridge of the Olympia, and the hail of shells sent the adventurer scurrying back to cover. It was half-past seven. The battle had raged incessantly for two hours, during which Commodore Dewey, with his flag officer, had remained exposed on the bridge of the Olympia. The men had been undergoing a constant strain for twenty-four hours, and had been served only with coffee, so at a quarter before eight, the Olympia ceased firing, and the Commodore ordered the squadron to retire. It was time for Dewey's breakfast. When the marvelous news was signaled from ship to ship, no damage, not a man killed, 
the joy and enthusiasm was unbounded. The Spanish admiral, not comprehending the meaning of the American withdrawal, wired to Madrid a report of a wonderful victory. The minister of marine replied with fulsome compliments. This was the last news sent out of Manila by cable, and for a week the American people were in painful suspense. In the meantime, a sumptuous breakfast was served aboard the American squadron, and a conference of commanders held. The two functions consumed more than three hours, and at a quarter after eleven, the battle was renewed. The big guns at Cavite were hard at work, and the Baltimore was ordered to silence them. This she speedily accomplished, destroying the entire battery. The Olympia and other ships soon took part, and in an hour nothing was left of the Spanish fleet except sunken and burning hulks. More than a thousand of the enemy were killed and drowned, and six hundred wounded. At half-past twelve the Americans ceased to fire, and at twelve-forty the Spanish flag was lowered, and the white flag of surrender took its place. Commodore Dewey immediately requested Governor General Auguste to allow him to cable to Washington. On the Governor General's refusal, the Commodore promptly cut the cable to Hong Kong. The only means of communication left to him was by dispatch boat to Hong Kong, but he was unable to start the McCulloch for several days, when he sent two dispatches, one penned on the day of the battle, the other on May 4th. These two telegrams, announcing what Captain Mahan had characterized as the greatest naval victory recorded in history, reached Hong Kong on the 8th of May, one week after the battle, and were received in Washington on the same evening. The intense anxiety which had pervaded America and the whole English-speaking world from the day Dewey sailed from Mirrors Bay was changed to enthusiasm and gratification. These two dispatches, which will go down in history alongside Perry's from Lake Erie, form the clearest and most concise account of the Battle of Manila and its immediate results. First Dispatch, May 1st. Squadron arrived at Manila at daybreak this morning. Immediately engaged the enemy and destroyed the following vessels. Reina Cristina, Castilla, Don Antonio de Uao, Isla de Luzon, Isla de Cuba, General Leso, Marques del Duero, Carreo, Velasco, Isla de Mindanao, a transport and a water battery. The squadron is uninjured and only a few men are slightly wounded. Only means of telegraphing is to American consul at Hong Kong. Shall communicate with him. Dewey. Second Dispatch. Cavite, May 4th. I have taken possession of naval station at Cavite on Philippine Islands. Have destroyed the fortifications at Bay Entrance, paroling garrison. I control Bay completely and can take city at any time. The squadron is in excellent health and spirits. The Spanish loss, not fully known, but very heavy. One hundred and fifty killed, including Captain Vereina Cristina. Am assisting in protecting Spanish sick and wounded. Two hundred and fifty sick and wounded in hospitals within our lines. Much excitement at Manila. Will protect foreign residents. Dewey. Cavite in his possession. Dewey now entered upon the most difficult part of his enterprise. Although to take possession of Manila would be comparatively easy, to hold it with his force would be another matter. He had to cope with Spanish deceit and Malay craft, and with ill-concealed antagonism of the German and the unexpressed jealousy of Japan. Not knowing when to expect another Spanish fleet, he was obliged to force the representative of Germany to observe the decorum and etiquette demanded by the situation. Hence the friction with Van Dietrich when Dewey demanded to know whether his country and ours were at war, for if so, he was ready to do his part of the fighting. By July 31st, troops in sufficient numbers under General Merritt had arrived, and on August 13th the city was assaulted and surrendered. The grade of Admiral has been revived by Congress, and bestowed upon Dewey. Never was enacted a more dramatic scene in the House of Representatives than that when Mr. Moody of Massachusetts 
fearing that in the hurry of the latter days of the fifty-fifth congress the bill passed by the senate might be overlooked offered it as a new section to the naval appropriations bill then under consideration the suggestion was received with bursts of applause and acted upon immediately a few days afterward the senate bill was passed by the house only twice before has the grade of admiral been conferred on an officer of the united states navy farragut and porter earned it by their work in the civil war numerous as are the heroes of our naval history none surpass dewey and the country is grateful to the president and congress that his worth has been recognized the fighting in the philippines is not over and dewey remains to secure the territory won by his fearless entry in manila bay and the magnificent plan of battle that made him victorious on that first may morning of eighteen ninety eight signed major general joseph wheeler end of section thirty two and of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn.